I want to start by congratulating everyone involved in last week's sessions. It was truly insightful and all presenters were excellent. It is a fact that not all of us attending are having the geological expertise, but it opened up a whole new world to me in person and underlined the fact that, and this is also a little bit tongue in cheek, as smaller operators who think we are Hura geologists or for the sake of the international audience, layman geologists knows very little and have lots to learn. South African Diamond Producers Organization is a non-profit national organization representing almost 80% of the smaller diamond producers of South Africa mostly alluvial miners, aiming to streamline our part of the industry. In doing so, amongst others, equipping ourselves with knowledge is contributing to this vision. It is also a fact that alluvial mining in South Africa is a very high risk business and almost without exception, financially marginal and knowledge and understanding the geology is of vital importance. SATPO is therefore humbly proud to have been afforded the opportunity to contribute, albeit in a small way, towards making this short course possible. We are of the opinion that the contribution and the importance of our side of the industry are not always recognized by industry at large, nor governments uh, in SA, at least I would say, and a position we want to rectify. In all humbleness, again, we feel that we have made huge steps in the right direction, but have certainly not arrived yet. All the more reason for our gratitude in getting the exposure through this event. Lastly, and with all due respect again, and lightheartedly, when looking at the presenters of the last week, I saw that the vast majority looked like nearing their sell-by date, or even worse, as in my case, certainly exceeded that date. This is something I urge the students and younger ones amongst us to take note of and come to the fore. At the same time, I also recognize the wealth of experience and knowledge that is on offer from these seniors and without which our industry would not have been where we are today. And for that, I salute you all. With that in mind, I would like to hand over to my young CEO, Yamkela Makopula to conclude this introduction. I very much look forward to the session. Over to you, Yamkela. Thank you so much, Gert, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you to John uh, and Tanya and everyone and all the speakers from last week. It's really been eye-opening. So from a SATPO perspective, as Gert is saying that uh, most of our producers, which is uh, plus minus 80% of alluvial producers, you know, they, they are based in South Africa. And you will see this week as Lyndon and the rest of the geologists and everyone is presenting to you that, you know, alluvial diamond in South Africa is very niche. It's still quite small, but we still have a potential of the next hundred years. And you know, most of these diamonds are also quite unique. I'm talking from a global perspective. Actually, what you find in the Northern Cape and the Northwest, you're not going to be able to mine it anywhere else in the world, which is good for South African geologists. Uh, I've also noticed uh, on the course, you know, the whole week last week that we have young geologists that are looking to enter the market into the future that are in university. And I can tell you that one of the biggest issues that we have been facing from an industry perspective is the issues of, you know, blanketed regulations. And 
last week actually helped me to understand from a Kimberlite perspective and how you mine it, you know, uh, that, you know, we cannot afford as alluvial miners to actually be put on that blanketed approach. And it has made even my statement even richer from that perspective. And as geologists, I'm talking now, the younger ones, the ones that are younger than me, that will be entering the market, you know, one day and, you know, going into the mines. One of the things that you want are regulations that are giving you the ability to do what you do best, get those diamonds, but also not just for them to come out, but we also want an opportunity to sell it them into the global market. Hence, SATPO has also been in discussions with the state diamond trader among other key stakeholders. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, this week from an alluvial perspective, you know, you, you, you will find a lot of appreciation with regards to the fact that, you know, Northwest, Northern Cape, we have some of the best, but I think now what we need to understand are the best practices. And that's what this training is giving us. I'm a CEO of SATPO, but I can tell you, I'm learning from scratch every time I see, I meet with John uh, or Gert, uh, any of the old timers, as Gert has said, I absorb each and everything. And what I appreciate about this training, which I hope you also appreciate, is also the case studies that are so live, you know, people speaking from about their minds and their own perspectives, uh, which you'll find someone like Lyndon, who is uh, with Satpo as our vice uh, chairman, who also is mining day to day basis as a CEO and a geologist in one of our minds. And it's really, really going to be great for you to hear from people like those. So I'm going to hand over from Gert. I just wanted to greet you, welcome you, and say thank you so much to John, to Tanya, to all the speakers. It's a really such an honor, especially for the young ones like myself that are looking to continue growing in the industry. Thank you. It's only a pleasure to me to uh, introduce Pierre de Jager. Uh, Pierre obtained a BC honors in, at, uh, from the Nelson Mandela University in Quebec and has pursued a career which includes diamond exploration with the Beers Consolidated Mines, geophysics with KCI, mine geologist at Clue of Gold Mines and GFSA, group geologist for multi-gold holdings and exploration geologist with Rand Mines. He has been self-employed since 1989. He owned and operated alluvial diamond mining project in the Northern Cape and has subsequently become a highly knowledgeable consultant alluvial diamond a uh, geologist with over 20 years experience in the Middle Orange River, Northwest Province, the Diamond Triangle of the Northwest Province, the DRC, uh, Angola, Sierra Leone and Cameroon and other areas of Southern Africa. I had the privilege to drive with Pierre about 30 years ago from Douglas to Vintuk and um, and it was such a pleasure to have the knowledge next to me because <coughs> our trip felt like two hours to me. But Pia, over to you. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to present this article. If you look at this map here, it's uh, contained most of the alluvial deposits in uh, South Africa. And the purple triangle is the area that I'm going to be talking about. So why is it in a bloom of the Volman of Stad? Uh, it's the southern northwest province, also known as the Diamond Triangle. Uh, diamonds were discovered in this area in uh, 1912. Small time diamond miners have produced more than 5 million carats since 1912. It's a well sorted, rounded population, average size about one carat per stone. Exceptional good quality, 
and these famous four color stones that is orange and blues average price is eight hundred dollars to a thousand two hundred dollars per carat and then uh, the famous geologist the two a in 1910 already recognized the dry heart as a glacial valley and he also realized the island between the hearts and the Val rivers is the fleet uh, white topography nowadays known as the Gargonian Island. And then one of the uh, very interesting people that was involved in this area is uh, exploration uh, diamond geologist of uh, uh, Anglo-American von Godberg in 1970. And then he noticed widespread opposition and occurrence of uh, Dwyka sediment in the area. Here's just a couple of photographs of some of the parcels you get there. 85% uh, uh, gemstone. Uh, this is uh, four diamonds from the late Mr. Dick Barker. Here's some of the colored stones, the famous one with a, a blue three carat, 7.5 vivid orange, 26 uh, D type. Um, this is just a geological picture uh, of the area, of the old geological map. Uh, the red contour line represents the Cargonian Island as we know it today. And the important is this uh, Archean granite with uh, Amalia greenstone belt in this portion. We've got quite a lot of uh, Federsdorf lava, Federsdorf sediments in this area towards Oud Volop. And then you get quite a lot of uh, echo sediments on the Cargonian Island. And I'm saying this already, this is we looking at this area as a glacial outwash plain. A real, a summary of the geology of alluvial deposits, uh, Archean granites and greenstones of Amalia belt and Proterozoic Venderstorf supergroup lavas and sediments form the three Dwyker topography. These uh, Archean and Proterozoic rocks represent the southeastern margin of the Gargonian Island, as you see here. And the area is flanked to the northwest by the Arts River. You can look at it as a glacial valley and towards the south by a glacial outwash plain uh, that contains glacial uh, streams uh, that is represented by so called diamond runs, like the London run, the Zevenfontein run, Ulsons Kral, the Bamboos run, the Zoutpan run, the Quasi Spray. And uh, in between these uh, glacial outlet strain, uh, streams, you get uh, the plains with a lot of glacial debris on. And the glacial debris, and, uh, we're looking at Lodzman Toll, reworked moraine, and kettle structure. And then close to the Cargonian Island, we got uh, the Permian Eka sediments overlying the Dwyka. And then this middle Eka beach deposit on and against the flanks of the Cargonian Island uh, occur almost entirely as a secondary regular feature between the 1350 MASL contour, which is this one. And the 1400 MASL contour. And uh, this regular gravel for, uh, covers almost the entire uh, Cargonian Island from Schweizer Reneke to Volmer of Stadt and beyond. Now, first of all, I'm going to look at the Dwyka and then I'm going to uh, talk about the Eka. So, in general, the Karoo and the Kalahari basins will remain the positional areas of the Dwyka sedimentation. And the Cargonian Islands uh, separate these two basins. This uh, purple triangle is the area I'm going to talk about. It's partially lying on the Cargonian Island and partially lying in the Main Karua Basin. The Zimbabwe Craton and the Carbal Craton were the main source areas for the sediment in, the, in these uh, areas. Just note the, the amount of pre Dwyka kimberlite on this car, Val and Zimbabwean Kratons, things as a Premier, Venetia, Marnets, Pipe Bridge, Martin's Drift, in the Mongolian Asia. And uh, if we look at this uh, table over here, the pre Dwyka Kinderlites, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the Eka and the Dwyka group, and there's all the post uh, Dwyka Kinderlites. This is a digital elevation model of a southern northwest province. 
with a vertical exaggeration uh, equal to 30 times. And this gives you quite a good idea of the, the uh, Pergonian Island in this area here. The blue dots represent a uh, production of zero to 10,000 carats for each of these dots. And you can see it, it covers quite a bit of this Cargonian Island. And even up all the way towards uh, Otto's Dal, you, you every now and again find some production. And this represents the glacial outwards plain. So you see the higher dots, the, the green and the yellow, and sometimes the red, is situated in the glacial streams and very rarely on the plains between the glacial streams. Uh, just for, this is the Harsa River coming down here, and this is the Wall River coming down this way. I just want to say that the two in 1910 already noticed this highland between the Harsa and the Wall River as being older than the uh, surrounding the Ru Rocks. And from Gottberg again in 1970, noticed the widespread deposition of the Zdwika sediments uh, over the entire South Norway's province. And an area of typical landscape features such as Rousse Moutonese and uh, glacial striations. Uh, this diagram represents a terrestrial glacier uh, deposition model with uh, typical glacial streams, uh, ground moraines, outwash plains, recessional moraines, and uh, end moraines. And if we superimpose that uh, model onto the area we're talking about today. We interpret it as all these uh, so-called diamond runs, the Makwasi spray, the Bambus uh, run, the Zevenfontein run, the London run, all as glacial streams with the uh, glacial debris but of the deposits in between. Um, in this diagram, we superimpose the terrestrial Laura, yeah, this uh, one is just have a discussion. The so-called diamond runs represent rework glacial streams, and the areas between the glacial rivers represent the lotsment and rework moraine deposits. So we look at the, the glacial rivers, they normally represent a braided river system with a poorly sorted gravels and mud layers with large braided sandbars. Now these glacial rivers are uh, between 40 and 60 kilometers long. But they're 400, uh, up to 400 meters wide, so with eight, eight meters thick, and they don't have any fall width. If you look at a modern day Oros River, where the average width is approximately 400 to 500 meters wide, similar to these uh, uh, very short rivers, then it's hard to justify a fluvial uh, braided system over this short distance and the width of these trails, except if you look at a glacial river on a glacial outwash plain. And these glacial river gravels consist of matrix supported small table to small cobble gravel with angular to sub-rounded to well-rounded class in a sandy matrix. Now, first of all, I'm gonna talk about the, the farm Oerson's Kraal, that's on the bamboo spray. I'm gonna look at some of those gravels. Then we're going to look at a farm London on a London run. And lastly, on a farm Hanspan on a Zevenfontein run. So this is on the Oerson's Kraal, Bamboo Spray. You see, in the sump, uh, there's your Dwyker Glacial River gravel. And just on top of that is a reworked Dwyker Glacial gravel. And normally the big companies would mine right up to the Dwyker Glacier uh, River gravel. And unfortunately, there's a close up, not so good, but there's a, the glacial mud deposits, and then you find quite a bit of, of uh, pebbles in between the mud, and then a reworked glacial gravel. We go to a London deposit, reworked glacial gravel, large center to boulder, Dwyker bedrock again. Uh, after they mined the, the top rework gravel. Glacial River Zevenfontein uh, run on uh, farm Gaspan. Very uh, typical, the four meter calcrete layer on top, then rework Dwyka, and then into a Dwyka. 
here you can see with Graysol, uh, a dry car containing all the, the pedals. And it's a small cobble to a, with angular to sub rounded to well rounded class in a very sandy matrix. Very typical of, 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 of a dry car. We all know the class shapes range from angular to well rounded, poorly sorted. The gravel class consists of uh, Fendersdorf lava, Fendersdorf quartzite, Transvaal brown quartzite, agate, jasper, buff, and church class. And the gravel normally has a, well, we've seen the three meter hard concrete layer. Simon Baird, 1964, described similar gravel, similar uh, stratified wiker deposits close to the Eka in the Bwitavil heavy mineral deposit. And uh, you can see the cobbles, cobble class, and in between there's some very rounded pebbles. And it's a, it's a wide range of shapes. So you have areas in between the glacial rivers represent glacial plains with lots of till, the blazing till, rework or rain deposits. And these uh, large angular blocks of Fendersdorf lava lies in a coarse sand. And occasional sub rounded cobbles and very rarely any pebbles, which is very odd again if you look at uh, alluvial diamond deposits. You know, the only way to explain this is in a, in a glacial environment. And you can see here as well the angular class in the sand matrix. Uh, this is on the farm grass pond between, again, between the London run and the Zevenfontein run. And we interpret at the moment all the pans as kettle oil structures. Uh, just a slight definition of what a kettle oil structure is. So we have numerous pans on this uh, uh, glacial outwash plane. If we go to the Eka, the Eka uh, lying on the and against the flanks of a Cargonian island. Here I just got a contour of a 1360, actually starts in a 1350. And again, the uh, blue dots, sorry. And again, a vertical exaggeration 30 times. Go on to a Gargonian island. I try to emphasize the echo on this, uh, after, uh, yeah, the echo deposits on this Gargonian island. Uh, for now, we're going to look at the first of all, the farm Duranuk. Then we're going to go look at Pontfontein Mamboza. And then out follow up, which is next to out follow up. Um, the areas with uh, the uh, Eka sediments occur as a regular gravel over almost the entire Cargonian island as a ferruginous small to large pebble gravel with uh, pisolithic laterites and saprolites. And on the farm Dorenu, the secondary gravel grades from a half a meter thick lateritic gravel into eight meter thick primary quartz reed sand with thin gravel parting. So this is actually the primary middle echo marine deposit. It's a quartz reed pebbly sand and a pebbly gravel and a quartz reed sandy matrix. Uh, a little close up and you can see matrix supported gravel. There is a gravel parting again in the sand. And uh, if one just look to emphasize the sand, the quartz reed sands, the typical marine deposit, these quartz sands again here as well. Now this is very, is very, is not, uh, you don't see this very often, this primary middle echo deposit. Predominantly you'll see the regular gravels, uh, which represent mostly uh, reworked or chemically uh, reworked uh, primary echo deposit. So this regular gravel consists of half a meter to one and a half meter thick large pebble gravel to a small cobble gravel covered by red, red sand up to three meters thick. The gravel, gravel class consists of Fendersdorf lava, quartzite, agate, jasper, buff, church, and very similar to the Dwyka Braidwood stream class and probably reworked the, the light in the marine environment. These regular gravel occur on the lava bedrock, you can see here, and uh, it seems to follow the bedrock contours and seem to be draped over this lava contour. 
where we go onto the court sites, the fingers do a court sites, it occur as a marine stone line, which is, it looks exactly or very similar to the Western Cape shore lines where you've got the Table Mountain sandstone or port sites. And it's also sort of, also these angular blocks in between the marine gravels. If you look at the, the famous water uh, table mini fields in the area, this is my farm Zitland, it's on top of a Cargonian island. These uh, fields are very valuable. And it's actually extensive uh, regolith gravels, which form aquifers and uh, ideal maize fields. Uh, growing conditions and it's the chemically weathered eco marine gravel. Everyone, this eco uh, sediments occur. Uh, it corresponds very well to the Botaville heavy mineral B sands of the middle eco. Uh, this has been described by Simon Bear in 1965 and Hobday in 1978. And it contains appreciable concentrations of heavy minerals such as ilmenite, garnet, chromite, phenol. Zircon, rutile, and uh, we know that garnets, ilmites, and chromites are fairly common in the heavy minerals obtained from the diggings on the regular gravels. Obde described this middle echo as a quartzo sandstone with beach and nearshore characteristics. Um, if you look at the farm during the uh, primary deposit again, scattered pebbles in a medium to coarse sandstone represent the upper shore phase deposit. That's the description of, of Hobday. So to my mind, this is exactly the same. Uh, the echo beach deposit originated in a non-tidal to a micro-tidal storm-dominated coast. If we look at the diamonds in the area, it occurs as follows. It occurs in the Carboniferous Glacial Outwash Plains on the rework glacial rivers and the rework glacial debris. The perm it also secondly occurs in the Permian Middle Echo the beach deposits on the Cargonian Islands in the primary Middle Echo beach gravel, and on the regular gravel it represents the chemically weathered Middle Echo beach gravel. Here's some production figures on some of the farms, and um, the first four London Uzaskral Kamielko Farm Spine uh, is from a reworked glacial streams, carrot to stone. Very similar, except for Uzon's Kral, uh, which is a, the one furthest away from the uh, Pergonian Island. The grades range from 0.49, the lowest grade on the, on the glacial debris, and then the highest grade is nearly one carat a minute down. Um, it seems that the average stone size for the glacial debris deposits are slightly, slightly higher than the rest. And then unfortunately, we only got figures for one farm on a regular uh, gravel, the Eka Marine shoreline. And that's got a character's average size of 0.76 and a grade of 0.67. Here's some of the problems that they have. And uh, this is diamond lockup. Uh, this is after screening some of the uh, uh, Dwyka blocks. Here you can see it's a Dwyka gravel, very hard, and maybe in the future we'll come to some kind of crashing, especially with, uh, now that you know exactly what the average stone size is. If we want to discuss the whole thing again, I just want to go through the evidence of diamonds in the Carboniferous glacial sediments and the Permian Ecomarine sediments. Suggest diamonds were transported from the interior to the south southwest by pre karoo fluvial systems and Waika glaciers. The 2A54 note a correlation between alluvial diamonds uh, in the Carboniferous glacial sediments in western Brazil and Bolivia. Tompkins Gonzaza, 1989 1994, described uh, diamonds from glacial outcrops in Brazil. On Gutberg, 1970-2006, are convinced that the deposition of the Dwyka rocks in the western, in the southwestern part of the northwest province, are the source of the alluvial mm -hmm. diamonds in the area. More and more, 2006 suggests that it's from a bula diamond bearing basal gravel, gravels, upper curve fluvial sediments, and associated heavy mineral suite represent the winnowed and concentrated lag products 
of a former Permian toe with a distal provenance. Um, so was during the Carboniferous period when Gondwana land drifted over the South Pole, Dwight Knight glaciers played an important role in liberating, transporting, and deposition of the diamonds from the pre perial kimberlites to the north and the northeast of the study area. For example, again, uh, the Premier, the Marnus, the Venetia, the Bright Pipe Bridge, and Martin Drift in the light. Uh, glaciers move in a southwesterly direction, and just from this geological map, and then locally between Schweizerreinecke and Wolmerastad, this glacier was probably deflected in a southerly direction uh, due to this granitic inlier in this way. Reworking of a glacial uh, Sediments during echo regression and the minor transgression phases produce considerable amount of heavy minerals, such as diamonds, garnets, ilmenites, spinel, and so forth, that was deposited in a beach environment with no or very small intertidal zones, bare and hot day. And the famous Buitha Delmas Carolina echo heavy mineral deposits coincide with the middle echo. The Cargonian Island remnant represent the Arctic uh, the African surface, as described by Partridge and Moore, 1987. But the Karoo sediments were subjected to a, a long period of chemical surface wavering, that uh, since the uh, Cretaceous, and that caused the regular gravel. And so, as the primary echo deposits are hidden in the a uh, regular remnant on the Proterozoic and Archean rocks of the Cargonian Island. Uh, and just a little bit of conclusions. The uh, Northwest Province uh, deposits are unrelated to adjacent Val and other uh, land based alluvial deposits. The diamond population is predominantly gem quality, well sorted, and consistent in average size. Similar to other reworked shallow marine diamonds, is, uh, in, for example, the uh, West Coast Marine, Namibia, even the Marangi, initially deposited by Carboniferous Dwyka glaciers uh, with concentrations, uh, concentrations along glacial outdoor streams, and then reworked and redistributed distributed in the Permian uh, shallow marine shoreline setting and then reworked by modern weathering. And just out of interest, you know, I've seen similar looking Cretaceous gravels in all over Africa, DRC, Sierra Leone, Angola, and just a couple of question marks. Acknowledgements, thanks, that's about it. Um, I'd just like to thank the farming and alluvial uh, fraternity of the Northwest province for all their help and things during the past many years. I mean, a special thanks to geologist John Ward for co positive conversations and support in establishing the middle echo shoreline as well as the excellent photographs. And then also geologist John Bristol and Mike DeWitt for sharing their views and experiences. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, you well ahead of time. So uh, I think there's more opportunity to ask questions. If I'm. Uh, <laughs> my side uh, something uh, that i was privileged to attend was uh, a presentation by dr assi van der westhuizen uh, where he said the following he said the orange river was identified as a likely conduit for the transportation of diamonds from the hinterland of the southern africa to the Atlantic. However, the presence of marine and coastal diamond deposits as far south as Olifant's Refier estuary showed that the Val Orange drainage in its current form could not comprise a form, uh, could not account for all the diamonds transported to the coast. And researchers proposed the so called two river hypothesis comprising of a former Kalahari River in the north, and which is more or less the area that you're talking about now. Uh, here, uh, uh, to me, it looks like uh, looking at the map more or less 
uh, almost in the range where the current Molopur River is. Uh, and then he's also talking about the Karua River in the south, uh, but noting that it's a hypothesis. So um, all I'm asking is uh, that he says more recent research results showed support for the former Kalahari River, but not the Karoo River. Have you got any comments on that? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> uh, I think this is a little bit different. I think the, the, I'm looking at something a little bit older, probably, and uh, I'm looking more at glaciers and this. Yeah, I think a lot of guys will nowadays know that the glaciers played a very important role. But to say that even the, the, the pre Karoo uh, fluvial systems as well, which were probably pre, pre uh, Dwyka. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very similar, I would say. I would say it's, it's, uh, the Dwyka is just a different uh, ice, uh, ice deposits, why the pre, the pre Karoo uh, rivers were sort of pre Karoo, pre, pre, pre glaciers. You know? Pierre, just um, page back to your summary diagram and your presentation, which is still up and we can talk to it and, and you make a valuable point. Yeah, that one, you've gone past it. Now you've gone past it. Okay. Yes. Now that, I mean, that's that's the critical one. And that's, mm. you know, exact, exactly what we're saying, Gert, is the, you know, whether it's the Kalahari, which, you know, mm. effectively would have gone from from you know Botswana, which also produces lots of diamonds in the hinterland, and we know we know again in Botswana, um, you know that they're old kimberlites. The um, kimberlites the same age as as Premier at Martin's Drift, um, you know. So there were Dwyker, there were there were glaciers back in the in the Carboniferous, um, you know, effectively scraping off the landscape and transporting diamonds to to the southwest um, in in before the breakup, and and we had the same thing, you know, down into the Karoo Basin. So, so I think um, Asi's discussion on you know the rivers, the rivers then came along, you know, much big rivers, the Vaal and the Orange and the and the fish and their proto rivers all came along later, and and so so you know very simply put put um, I think the glaciers were were critical for for massive rock disaggregation or breaking up rock and transporting rock um, and 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 diamonds, and then you know in this case in the Northwest Province Diamond Triangle we had a concentration process go on in the Eka. But um, you know, we then also had um, concentration in in the younger big rivers, um, and then of course in the marine setting. So so there's really you know multiple processes going on here, and I think Lyndon Lyndon and his talk shortly will also show you know the role that that the Dwyker or the Carboniferous glaciers and um, rock disaggregation and rock and diamond movement will play. Uh, yeah, John, just a comment uh, on the diamond populations. To me, it's, it's always been a bit of an enigma in that, uh, you know, we, we, we transported the, the stones, say, from uh, Lesotho down to the Middle Orange River, and we still find these big, what Keith Whitebuck used to call the, the, the fragile whites. We still find them there. And then suddenly they, they disappear, and the next 500 kilometers later, the sea, they're not there anymore. I mean, we've got a significant population of large stones in the Middle Orange River. Uh, and and the, the population in the sea uh, is is a lot more like the population that that Pierre described, and and we know there's been a lot of shedding from the from the Kimberlites, uh, obviously to the sea. But I think there was quite a big contribution from from the glacial uh, transport uh, and and the dams that that Pierre is talking about down to the coast. Yeah, absolutely, Lynn. And then, I mean, you know, the companies don't normally talk about it, um, but there are, you know, there are records of some very few, but, you know, some biggish, or big diamonds, 240 carats on the West Coast as well. Yeah, but, but, but too you know, few in, in yeah, compared too, to what we are from. Yeah, yeah no, I agree they, with they you. Seems, they seem to be, a, they, they, somewhere there's a couple of them missing out. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you know, in my bias, the whole model fits together, you know, rather well. I mean, and and the one thing, if you go and drive around Scotland and other glacial areas, 
you know, we, we forget the role that glaciers play just in fragmenting and breaking up and moving massive volumes of rock. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, that's why you guys, Lyndon, use, you know, top of the range 120 ton bulldozers to actually break up your gravel. It's the same principle on a much smaller scale. Sure. Okay. And other questions? We've still got a bit of time. Sorry, sorry, Kat, I've jumped in there. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and and Ammo, Ammo had a, a question in the chat box. Um, um, I actually uh, um, I posted my two questions on the chat, but it's fine. I can just um, okay. So yeah. So, uh, okay, the, the geophysics uh, is always you know uh, I'm a bit probably outdated with the, the, when it comes to geophysics and the, the, the recent geophysics, but. We always found that uh, electromagnetics is the most uh, is the easiest to find river uh, river channels, especially where you get uh, a Dwyka Dwyka bedrock. Because the top of the Dwyka bedrock is normally slightly moist, which is a good conductor for electricity, and that just gives you a, uh, quite a good reading. Even on the, on the Val River as well, we found that it's, it's probably better than uh, 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 S seismic. But again, I I don't know what new what's the new things uh, resistivity and all that. I mean, geophysics is a field that's growing. But I know in our, when I was young, electromagnetics seemed to work the best because of that. But you have to have a a, a Dwyka football. Yeah, yeah, and to Emma, you know, one of the one of the important um, pieces of outcomes from this work of peers and and others um, has been the fact that we've now, or they have identified, you know, extensive shallow diamond deposits and what previously we called the interflue. So, if you look, if you if you looked at those runs, and Pierre can you know explain it better than me. Typically in the past, everyone concentrated on the Busman Sprite and the London Run and those, you know, basic river systems. Um, you know, what the work of Pierre and, and a lot of these, um, you know, small miners has shown is that there's a considerable resource um, of diamonds either up on the Cargonian Highlands and those weathered um, Eco sediments and sort of on the on the Cargonian Islands. Also, in the of South Africa, the Cargonian Island part, mm -hmm. Okay, and then and then yeah, there's also there, there are also extensive deposits now that can be mined, you know, out on the outwash out flats between between those runs. Pierre, you might want to comment, and you, you know, many mm -hmm. of the. When, many of the when you go there these days, it's quite hard to find many of these small operators because they sort of away from the traditional areas. So I, I, I just first want to look at the, the second the second question here. Uh, worth considering development of the brownfields or repurposing of uh, tailing dumps in areas like Lichtenberg, Fenter, Dorf, Thank you, Um You've got to think all of these areas is slightly different. The, the, the average value of a stone. So, Lichtenberg Della Rival is not so valuable as uh, the Blue Wolf area. Baker was not as valuable. Pendersdorp and Klaersdorp is more valuable. But the, the southern northwest, you've got a higher average value than in the Lichtenberg uh, Bakerwell area. You've got to be very careful when you want to do tailing dumps in, in this area. You know, uh, but you can you can also reprocess them with new technology, and then you're probably going to find some more diamonds that previous people would have missed. And and I think Pierre's other important point is the lockup. Um, and I, but, but I don't know if these deposits would be economical enough to actually go and use big bulldozers to rip and trap like you do in the Middle Orange River, London. Um, well, take a look at Bill McCartney's questions. Uh, are you recovering diamonds from a Dwyka? Yes, we've definitely been diamonds recovered from a Dwyka. Uh, unfortunately, if you talk about what are, uh, if you're looking at kimberlitic minerals, uh, the modern day plants 
you not really, uh, you cannot really see the, the cumulative minerals, the garnets and things in the old days with the old pans and things, it was possible. And, mm. uh, but if you look at kimberlite itself, we've never seen any kimberlite in the, in the uh, Northwest mountains. Nothing. That is, I don't know. We've worked there for a long time. And I think one of the interesting guys told to me is was uh, from Gottberg, and he he could never he could never uh, uh, find a kimberlite. Uh, and the Dwyka, yes, definitely the Dwyka. You find diamonds in the Dwyka for sure. Well, thank you, sir. Well, I, I think I mean I must confess. Um, I'm I'm a non-technical individual, and unlike the the more informed students in attendance. Um, I'm basically looking at it from a layman's perspective. Um, but that's the thing that makes mining such a special business, I suppose. It requires a collaboration of individuals from um, different backgrounds with different agendas and interests. But I, I guess that the lesson is we have to wait for the technology to catch up and then maybe the low grades will be a, a, a viable business in, in the future. Just a comment about uh, Kim's in the in the Dwyker. Um, there was a paper, I can't remember the exact year, but I think it was the 1970s, by Marie, who was one of the very early people um, pushing the, the Dwyker as a source of diamonds. And he, he was very strongly criticized and um, in his response to the criticism, he actually re reported having treated uh, Dwyker and getting uh, prolytic diamonds, out, uh, garnets out of it. So uh, th that's a, um, it, the papers in Afrikaans, so um, a lot of people probably found it inaccessible and it would be really great to um, perhaps persuade the geological society to republish it with a, with a translation. I see there's an hand from Andy. Yeah, that, sorry, that was me speaking ahead ah. of, 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 of my hand. I beg your pardon. Uh, do you know the locality, Andy? Uh, um, he, he, it's a long time since I've read the papers, John, and I don't think he mentioned that, but... Uh, he, he was obviously a little bit stung by the criticism and he, he just mentioned that he, you know, recovered pyro garnets. Uh, but it, 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 it was um, a very thoughtful paper, um, really worth getting that translated for people who, who don't speak Afrikaans. Yeah, good idea. We've, we've also got to go to some of these localities and take some big bulk samples, you know, in a modern scientific method. <laughs> and. Uh... You know, see what comes out of them. Okay, here's a question from uh, Jean Simonis uh, about a, a aquifer. Uh, you find them basically all over the, the uh, Cargonian Island in that area. And they're very, very valuable, and the farmers know it. They're very pricey with this land. And you're not going to get to mine in these aquifers very easily. But, but, but interestingly, Pierre and, and Lyndon, you might want to add, I mean, we did some work years ago for an Aussie company called Moonstone, um, just south of Zotpan, where Mike Rook and Smith made his fortune. And, and um, you know, we, we, we always found that those farmers, you know, when, when there was a drought, they took that red sand or, or weathered, you know, material off the top and they mined the underlying gravel. And then when they had a wet year, you know, they, well, and then they rehab, they put it all back very nicely. And in the wet years, they, they grew meaty. So they got a, a double bonus or, you know, a, a double profit out of those, those deposits. I see another hand there, Hendrik. Uh, yes, uh, in the seventies, when I was a field assistant for the beers, we did bulk sampling of the tillites north of Newadville and found diamonds in. Fantastic, Annie. So you're going to give us a presentation if you still got the samples and pictures. <laughs> yeah. I'm being serious. Oh, I mean, it's back in the 70s. We've got to ask the beers for their, for their, 
for their data? Purely from uh, 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 someone interested in prospecting still. Uh, do you guys, with all the knowledge around the table here, uh, foresee that there are any areas that's been untouched? Uh, I'm, I'm talking, uh, you know, the, the Mulapur, uh, the, the uh, Rimfas mark, uh, those areas, do you think uh, there's still a possibility? Are you talking alluvial, Skert, or Kimberlites? You presumably mean alluvials. I, I obviously alluvials. Well, Lyndon, another expert? <laughs> yeah, I had. I think there are. I think as soon as, as you move north, you get going to the Kalahari, and a lot of things like it gets covered by the sand. Uh, I think there's definitely in, in Botswana probably areas that, that would be worthwhile looking at uh, if you can see through the sand, and, and the sand is a problem. And I think as uh, geophysical techniques improve, we're probably going to start finding things. Uh, I remember when I was with the beers, uh, there were some drills in the Kalahari that intersected old riverbeds, and I can't remember exactly where it was, but there were some indicators coming out of that as well. So I think uh, not only alluvials, but also kimberlites. I think there's still a couple of things to be found. Uh, and as soon as, whenever we can look through the Karoo cover uh, and see what's underneath, there, there might still be a few surprises. But I think it's going to be technology dependent on finding them. I think the easy ones have been found. Lyndon, uh, um, yeah, Lyndon has 30 years of experience in diamonds. He has a MSc in geology, oceanography, and started his career at the Beers as an exploration geologist. During the next 15 years, he was operations manager uh, or COO of various public and private companies mining alluvial diamonds, mainly along the Middle Orange River. About 10 years ago, he started up his own alluvial mining venture and is currently co-owner and CEO of three prime private diamond mining operations on the lower Orange River, uh, on the lower Ball and Middle Orange River. I also want to say that Lyndon uh, is also part of my organization and uh, being who I am, uh, past my sell-by date, he's one of my crutches, uh, having uh, to move forward from time to time. Uh, then secondly, uh, also in the session, uh, my dear friend, Dr. John Bristow, BSc Honours, MSc Geology, PhD, Geometry, uh, Geochemistry, Postdoctorate, uh, University of New Mexico, Tourism Diploma, John has 40 years in geological research, minerals exploration, project development, mining, manufacturing, and marketing, primarily in the diamond sector, with extensive local, African, and international experience. He has successfully created and operated private and listed junior exploration and mining ventures with related executive and direction, uh, directorship roles. Um, the only way I can compete with John is in terms of uh, the years of experience. I think I'm standing on 44 years now. So <laughs> be that as it may, our, our third participant presenter here is also a lady that I came to know over a number of years, uh, uh, Sanazo. Lakavu. Sanazo completed a BSc Geology at Rhodes and an embassy at Nelson Mandela University, African Earth Observatory Network, uh, Institute studying groundwater samples extracted from boreholes in the southern Peru as part of a regional shale gas research program. And she undertook and completed a detailed field investigation and comprehensive report uh, on the small and junior diamond sector from late 2000 
2018 till early 2021. And that is also during that period that I got to know her personally and we traveled extensively over in the country. So welcome to all of you and with much further, not much further ado, over to Lyndon. Thank you, Gert. Uh, I'm going to start off with, for the benefit of the students, just a short overview of uh, South African diamond production. Uh, South Africa produced about 8 million carats per year, uh, worth around 20 billion rand, uh, of which the local production is about 350,000 carats, about 4.5%, four, worth approximately 5 billion rand. And there you can already see the value of our uh, uh, alluvial production, our specialties, about 25% of, of the total value of diamonds produced. Uh, there's still large volumes of alluvial deposits in Africa available, as I'm going to try and show you today. And most of these are mined by small private companies. I think, I'm not talking on the correction, but I think there's only one small alluvial listed company left. Uh, I think they're mining Kruna and Indora near Venetia. Uh, but these, these, uh, Mining companies are very crucial to the economies of the small towns in the Northern Cape and the Northwest where they uh, provide crucial jobs. Uh, but uh, because of the low grades that we are mining, uh, this industry is very susceptible to overregulation, uh, And it is the highest risk commodity in the world to mine as I'm gonna show you today. Uh, in terms of production uh, over the years, you see we had a height of production in 2005, about 15.6 million carats. Uh, and then after the financial crash in 2007-2008, it dropped significantly. Uh, and it also shows you how difficult it is to start up again once you had to close some operations down. Uh, it's many of them aren't worth starting up again or too costly to start up again. In terms of value per carat, where do we sit in South Africa? You can see at the top, Lesotho. Uh, and we heard last week, uh, let's sing city sitting at around about $1,900 a carat, very, very special for Kimberlite. But then on average, Lesotho about $540 a carat. Uh, South Africa average about 113 And this is 2020 data. And John and I, John mentioned uh, this morning that he had statistics that shows that the average value in 2020 was about $86. Uh, be it as it may, but it, it, it is still very low compared to the next slide, which I'm going to show, which is the average price per carat of the alluvial production in South Africa. And there you can see uh, Fentestorp, the area, north northwest province that Pierre was talking about, about $900 a carat to 1200 probably. And then the, the, the Orange River, the Middle Orange River and the Vaal River, uh, up to $6,000 a carat. I mean, that's very special. Uh, it's, it's nearly double anything else in the world that you can compare it with. Uh, so we really have a very unique deposit on the Middle Orange River uh, that, that uh, is being mined by, I think, quite unusual group of operators. The world average, like I said, is about $150. Now, this, this uh, graph shows uh, what has happened to the small operators, the juniors in the alluvial sector over the years, uh, and mainly due to uh, overregulation and the cost of compliance to regulations. Uh, the first study was done by Farrell in 2012 which shows that the number of operators, operating companies decreased from around 2000 to around 170 in 2012. Now, Sonazo's uh, study that she completed last year showed that there's about 20, 220 companies left, but her study also includes the, the small operators on the West Coast, which uh, the study did not include. Uh, so the, the, the situation is not improving. Okay, let's start setting the scene for what happened in our alluvial uh, setup. Uh, now, for the Middle Orange River and the Lower Vol, the scene was actually set more than 300 million years ago, as, as Pierre also explained about the, the Dwyka glaciers and the Gargonian Highlands where the glaciers moved down. This uh, figure shows, you can see the outline of, of the two continents, of, of the country South America and, and South Africa at that time. Uh, and you had glaciers moving uh, across and picking up a whole lot, lot of material. Uh, and eventually dumping it in, into what uh, you call the Karoo Sea, and that led to the, also to the deposition of the Karoo uh, sediments on top of that. Uh, but we're seeing more and more that, that the, the scene was actually set before then uh, by the pre karoo topography. And as we are exhuming the pre karoo topography, those features actually had a significant impact on the, the gravels that we are mining today. If you look at about 130 years ago, when 130 million years ago, when Gondwana land started to break up, it of course also coincided with a, a major period of uh, kimberlite emplacement. 
Uh, and when the, when the continent started to split up, Southern Africa suddenly had a coastline. Uh, and you started to strip this Karoo sediments, this hundreds of meters of Karoo sediments that you had deposited are being started to be stripped away. Uh, and if you just look at this as a cross section, at that time, you, you had the Karoo sediments at the top uh, and the Dwika at the bottom. And, and then underneath this, you had the Fendertrop lava uh, uh, floor that probably uh, had, a, had a significant uh, drainage pattern developed on top of it. Uh, that we are starting to see being exhumed today. And then, of course, you had the cumulites coming up and, and the erosion afterwards. So just looking at what the cumulites, uh, ages of cumulites, and, and Peter has also shown that, uh, you, have, you had a significant number around 80 to 120 million years. And then you had a couple of the older ones that Peter indicated. So today, this is what the cross section by, uh, through the country basically looks like. You've got the Sutu Islands. Uh, you still have hundreds of meters of, of crew sediments. And then through erosion, you're now starting to, to get pieces of the Dwika starting to stick out on the edges. And if you look uh, uh, as a plan view of the country, you can see this is where the, the, the Dwika is starting to stick, stick out. And most of our alluvial deposits today actually occur on top of Dwika bedrock. And this is quite significant. Now, if you look at uh, when the uh, Gondwana land broke up and, and at the lower Cretaceous stages, what Kat was referring to earlier, you probably had one drainage coming from the top, the Kalahari River that entered the coast, probably roughly where the, the current Orange River mouth is. And you had a, a second river draining the hinterland, going, uh, entering the sea roughly where the Olifants River mouth is today. And through uplift in the north, this river eventually captured the Kalahari River to establish the drainage uh, patterns that we have today. Uh, most of the alluvials that we find today are associated with uh, the current river, rivers, you don't really have uh, much left of the older uh, gravel deposits. They've all been eroded away. So if you look at what's required to trap and concentrate diamonds in a fluvial system, well, first of all, you need class. Before you eroded the Dwika, uh, most of the rivers were flowing mainly on, on Karoo sediments, and you were just flushing everything down to the coast. There was nothing to trap the diamonds on, 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 the, uh, on the land. Uh, what you need is bedrock features, you need scours and irregularities uh, and resistant bedrock types to keep the diamonds back. Uh, diamonds are concentrated when you have turbulence and changes in fluvial energy, uh, changes in the bed load density, examples of which I'm going to show you a bit later. Uh, but to keep them there, you need, you need to concentrate them in very specific areas because the whole system is a continuous flushing of sediments down to the coast. So you need very special and strong bedrock features to keep your, bed, your, your diamonds back. Just looking quickly at the ages of, of deposits, uh, we know there's diamonds in the bits gold. Uh, Maura Mutha is probably the oldest other deposit that we know of, between 70 and 80 million years. And then you have the Northwest gravels that we have talk, talked about between 70 and recent. And then the Orange and Vol River terraces that I'm going to talk about today, probably range, range in age from about 35 million years uh, to present. And these are left behind uh, as terrace remnants. Uh, as the river cuts down, uh, it leaves, leaves pieces of itself behind. And these are the terraces that we mine. This is the typical ranges of elevations that we, uh, that we are mining at present. Uh, just a bit of classification and general description so that you know what I talk about uh, when I mention it, right? There's, there's three main gravel types that we talk about when we mine. They're mainly called Roy gravels, middlings, and basal gravel. Now, if you look at a photograph of what, what I'm talking about, uh, here you can see the, the basal gravel layer. This is where most of your diamonds would be sitting. This is what our main, main focus would be when, we, when we're mining uh, basils. In the middlings, is uh, the sort of the channel full, or as the channel migrates, it leaves the, uh, sections of it, of it behind in this area. And then you have the red copy gravels at the top, which is mainly a deflation layer that forms due to the calculatization process of this whole sequence. So the calcrete uh, will destroy your softer, your less siliceous glass. And when the calcrete starts to weather, it will leave this uh, deflated layer on top. Now, this layer often represents three or four, maybe even more meters of, of basal or middlings uh, that gets concentrated into that, this thin layer. Now, this is what it would look at at surface. Now, this was mined by the old people many years ago, 50, 60 years ago. They all thought that these uh, solution cavities or macondos in the calcrete was, was pothole features, so they, they targeted them. 
Uh, but it was easy mining for them because there was no stripping. And there you can see the class are mainly banded ironstone, uh, quartz, and of course diamonds. Uh, and that's all that's left when the, the, the carpet starts to wear them. Now, this is a photograph of typical basal gravel that we would mine. On the eye, it probably looks very poorly sorted, but it's, uh, hydrodynamically, it's actually very well sorted because you get your large uh, framework class and then every pore space gets filled by smaller and smaller little pebbles as, get, as the sand gets washed out. So they, when we see some gravel like this, we get very excited because we know we'll find diamonds. In it. We see something like this, this is what we try to avoid because we know it, it, it's something that, that's moving, that hasn't settled, that hasn't been trapped or stuck behind a, a bedrock obstacle. Uh, and it, 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 it will have a very low grade if, if any. Now, just a quick note on, on Dragonsburg basalt. Uh, this is the last out, this is set on top of the, of the, of the Karoo, of course. Now, we know that Dragonsburg was quite extensive at one stage. We know it covered Kimberley because we found there's, there's some piece of Dragonsburg that was found in the Kimberley pipe. Uh, today, in the Orange River gravels, this is about the biggest class that I've ever seen. Uh, but if you go to Lesotho, uh, this photograph was taken in the in the mountains in the city. This is the class of the size of the class still in the rivers up there. So it eroded as it go, as it went down the river. Uh, but it, in, in the in the Roy copy, this is this gets destroyed. So you don't see this at all. But so we're quite an imp important indicator for us if we see it in the basal gravel because we know then that we're looking at an orange river source. That's a quick note on processing. Uh, when you look at the figures that I present, uh, we process only minus 38 to plus six, six millimeter. Now, obviously the, the six millimeter is not very effective because when it's, when it's wet, uh, we can't really descend. We call it descending. Uh, so you'll see some of the photographs will show smaller diamonds than six millimeters. It's because they, they incident that, 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 that goes through. But in general, we try to remove the minus six millimeter fraction. We found that by removing the minus six millimeter fraction, we lose about probably 60 to 70% of our stones but only about 5% of our value, but it's about 30 to 35% of our plant feed. So by replacing that with, of course, a plant feed uh, and, and by removing this fraction in the field, uh, you actually increase the value of the feed that you feed into your plant. <laughs> okay, coming to the, the, the alluvial deposits. Uh, this is a map showing the Orange River, the Vol River, the Reach River, down to Prisca. And all the Kimberlites that occur in this area. Now, if you look at this map it, 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 and, and you would think about the, the alluvial deposits, you think that it will be quite nicely mixed, uh, that, that uh, the, the values within these uh, rivers would, should be very similar, uh, but it's not. And the reason being that you have these high ground separating the, the different river systems. And it also separated the, the sources of the, of the diamonds uh, between these different rivers as I'm going to show you. Okay, let's look at the Val River. Okay, this is a DTM of the Val River. Blue is obviously the deepest parts. The, the yellows and the brown goes higher and higher. And there you can see the Val River exits a gorge and it comes from Warrington. And you have the big uh, river view splay here at Winterton. It moves down and you have another big splay here at Waldex Plant. And you can see the, 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 the neat point here as it exits this gorge at Gongo and opens up here and there's a big deposit that formed here. Uh, we're going to look at uh, some of our mining operations on the farm called Grapewood in this area over here. That's the Hals River coming in from the top. The Val River uh, has a couple of high terraces. Uh, Grapewood is one of them at about between 80 and 130 meters above the current river. The well-known Noitgedach deposit sits over here. The, the largest alluvial diamond that was recovered in South Africa came from Noitgedach, 515, I think it was called the Penta Diamond. And then Orpan over here at about uh, 60 meters, and then the adult bench sitting over here also at about 60 meters. Okay, looking at Ripwood, uh, this area became famous around about the turn of the previous century when the old diggers found a couple of channels or sluts that they called them that were very rich. Now, in that time, up to about 1920, they recovered about 490,000 carats from these, these sluts or old channels that they called them from what they called the Bantam layer that was at the bottom of these channels. Now, when I was in the beers in 1995, we started to look at these things again on Redwood. Uh, what's interesting here is these big fractures that crosses the river everywhere. And you can see that where they cross the current river, 
uh, there are sections that the current river also follow these fractures. There's another big one coming down here. And we always thought that this would have had a, probably had a big influence on the, on the Paleo Val River. But at that stage, everything here is it's still covered by sand and it's difficult to see what goes underneath the sand. So when I was with the beers, uh, the beers became under pressure on the farm Redwood because uh, people knew that these channels were running into Redwood and everybody wanted to go and mine there. So uh, they decided that, that we should go and have a look and, and probably mine them out uh, to take the pressure off. So this is what it looked at, at like at surface. You can see the thick sand cover. There's no evidence of anything underneath. But if you open it up, this was uh, the Drogefeld Stuart number one uh, extension onto Redwood. Uh, this is about a, a 20, 30 meter wide channel, 15 meters deep, going onto Redwood. Quite nice features in the bottom. There were nice potholes and like the waterfall feature. Uh, and typical, the beers, we, the geologists, wouldn't even tell exactly told what, what came out of here. I heard afterwards uh, it came about four carats per hundred tons. I'm not sure if it's true. Uh, but this thing only extended for about 150 meters onto the Redwood, uh, and then it, it climbed out the surface and, and it was eroded away. So a couple of years ago, uh, the beers sold the, the, the prospecting of the mining right on uh, Redwood to uh, another company. Uh, that two years ago, we were offered to, to go and mine a, a section there, or get a concession there to go and mine. So uh, we put up a plant there and we started mining. Uh, our concession was fortunate that it, 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 these long sections that it actually cut across this, what we call the dip force fracture. Uh, one of these features that we always wondered what, what it meant. And when we opened it up, we found this. We found some gravel. And this to me is, is actually the only primary gravel or basal gravel that, that, that is done rape with. Uh, you can see it, there are a lot of fender top and, and uh, dolerite class, uh, and, and no real what the old people would describe a bantam layer, a proper, a proper basal gravel. Uh, the biggest stone that came out here was a 22 crack. And unfortunately, we only had a little piece of that in our concession. So we took that out and uh, currently we're mining on this section of here. Here we're about 60 meters above the current river. Uh, and this is, this is what it looks like. It's uh, this weathered frot finter dorp with infills of, of pebbles uh, into the cracks in the finter dorp. No real channel features or anything like you saw in the, on the, on the Drogefeld Stuart. Uh, and there's another one. You can see these very angular weathered blocks of finter dorp. And, and here and there, you get these small channel like features filled with. with but it's essentially a gravel. It's gravel. It's not a primary gravel anymore, it's a derived gravel. Uh, which makes it very difficult to mine. And every now and again, you open one of these features. Uh, now you can see the, the, the nice glacial striations on the side of this and, and the shapes here, you can see it's, it's, a, it's a glacial uh, channel that was uh, either used by the glacier or grabbed out by the, by the glacier. Uh, and when we found this, we thought, yeah, we, we've really hit it big now because you can see the steps, look at the steps coming down into this feature here. Uh, you can see it's polished, it's, it's well rounded. It looks like the river, river flowed there and, and actually uh, smoothed it out. Uh, but this, this area was actually a very low grade area for us and, and we couldn't really understand it. Uh, look at this, look at this pothole feature in here. This is on a concession next to us. And the guys actually went in there with picks and shovels and dug all of this out and they didn't find a single diamond in it. So what's happening on Redwood? Uh, I think uh, we had a primary deposit probably close to the deposit fracture. Uh, a lot of that became reef copy and, and, and weathered over time and became a sort of a deflation uh, product. And this deflation deflated gravels weathered down slope towards the current river over time and filled these features that, that, that was probably caused by the Dwyker glaciers. Uh, and even these bottles, I mean, uh, it, we, I'm not an expert on, on the Dwyker, but with the streams in the Dwyker, be able to cut these bottles into the floor. Uh, and I doubt it. I, I suspect what we're looking at here is probably a, a, a pre karoo uh, feature or, or bedrock that the Dwyker used. Uh, and then eventually was filled by the, the, the screed coming from the top. We do find that as we go uh, 
closer to the river, the grades seem to drop and the, the bigger stones uh, tend to decrease. Uh, and this is just a, a photograph of, of some of the stones we found there. Each one of these pages, except the last one, is, a, is about a week's production. So we produce about 200 carats a month on Ripwood. And with these occasional nice bigger, bigger stones, that one there is a, was a decolored stone. Uh, and obviously the source from most of this would probably be, be uh, Kimberley Kimberlites. And then you can see the occasional small stones also coming through that we don't, uh, that we shouldn't find if, if our descending was, was proper, which is not. Uh, average value around about $2,000 a carat. So difficult mining and, and not a high grade deposit, probably running about 0 0.25, 0 0.3 at best carats per 100 tons. But if you do go into those sluts, uh, I mean, obviously that, that was an area that, that uh, not concentrated maybe diamonds, but I think it was a big trap site for, for volume of material to collect in. If you look at the uh, Wall River going from Smith Drift, now uh, Redwood would be just about run about in this area over here, what we looked at now, and then you go through the Bushman's Kloof, go down to the confluence over here. Uh, not many terraces, there's a adult bench, and there's a couple of lower terraces sitting in these bends between 20 and 30 meters above the river. Uh, gradient of this river, of the, this section of the river, and you'll see I'll refer to gradients quite a few times in, in the presentation. The gradient is quite flat. The river drops about one meter every 3.3 kilometers, which is quite flat. If you look at the Ridge River, this is the Ridge River. This is a, a diagram of the Helgren. Uh, you can see you already identified the three crew the pre dweiker hearts and the pre dweiker ball along all these, these uh, lines and fracture lines that, that comes across here. Uh, now, the, the Ridge River is famous for uh, the Skitsakama diamond deposit. It sits around about over here. You've got the Model River and the Ridge River coming together uh, at the town called Modder And just after that, the river, river goes into a gorge and it exits over here and it forms a, a big splay that uh, concentrated diamonds over time. Just once again, the DTM, there you can see the river coming out, and there you can see the splay right uh, at this neck point here, with this gorge, where the river comes out of this gorge. Now, I flew over it uh, about two weeks ago, and I took this photograph just for interest's sake. Uh, you can see this is, this is Motor River over here, and the confluence is over, it's over, somewhere over there, and there you can see the gorge, but it's not a straight gorge as you would expect. If you think that it was a, a, a Karoo cut or another Karoo, a, a Dwyker cut valley. Uh, now, I'm not sure if, it, if the Dwyker would cut a, a feature like this that looks like a, the curves of a river. So I presume, or I suspect that this might also have been a pre Karoo feature that the, the, the glaciers just, just utilized and filled up with, with the tillite. And we, we know that because we we can see the glacial striation right next to the river, the, the river, current river uh, elevation, uh, which tells you that the river, today's river, don't really, haven't really cut in. It's just eroded the, the dwyker out of it. And just a quick graph to show you the elevation change uh, between Modder River and uh, Skitsakama. The gradient's about one, one meter in 500 meters with the river drops. And then immediately after this point, point it's, it's, uh, the, the river flattens to about half that but one in a thousand meters. This is just a, a, a video of the DTM going down the river from uh, Modera Fier. There you can see you're in the steep side of gorge. There's no place to exit for the river or to dump its deposit. It, it's a bed load, so it carries it all out. And there it starts to flatten out. And now you'll see starting the, the, the deposits. There you can see the mining activities. Uh, and there you can see it's about a 10 kilometer long by two kilometer wide a gravel plume sitting here. It has been continuously reworked. And today's river actually flows uh, in its own alluvium. That's some of the gravels at, uh, on the Ridge River. The Ridge River today is a very, very small river. Uh, if it's dry, you can nearly jump over it. It's so small. But uh, in those days, it must have been quite a significant river pumping uh, a lot of water down here to create that and, and to concentrate these, these big boulders. This typical scour feature. Uh, these are the things that we're looking for when we're mining. There's some of the stones that come out of this feature. The biggest there is about 81 character. Some of the diamonds from the, from the Ridge River. Uh, on the right is, is the biggest stone that I found there. It's 172 character yellow stone. 
that's a 52 at, at, the, at the front end. Incidentally, these two came out of my concentrate tailings after we had a problem with our, with our X-ray recovery. So it shows you must never be confident, comfortable with, with your technology. But uh, the, the, these stones were cut from that uh, 172, I think they're 236 characters. As you can see, it had a bit of a brown green tint to it. I think the, sold was, the stone was sold for about $5,000 a carat at that time, a couple of years ago. Now this, a while ago, I was fortunate enough to have a look at the Coffee Fontaine production. And the Coffee Fontaine, of course, lying in the, in the Ridge River drainage, right next to the Ridge River. Uh, Coffee Fontaine now, average value is probably around about $700 a carat after the increase of the, of the past two years. Uh, where the Ridge River, where the, the Skitsukama value is about $2,200 a carat. So you've, you've increased the, the value of, of the production uh, from $500 or $700 a carat to $2,200 a carat over a distance of about 70 kilometers. And that's what the alluvial the river system does. It, it takes out the poor quality stones and destroys them, grounds them up, what breaks them up. Uh, and what you get at the end is, is just your better quality. Uh, diamonds. Okay, now let's look at the Middle Orange River. Uh, first of all, before the confluence, the source of, of most of the diamonds in the, in the Middle Orange River before the confluence is the Kimulites in Lesotho. There you can see them. Let's see Kao, and we had, we had a talk about Kao uh, last week, and we saw the, the, the special diamonds that come from there. Uh, in Lesotho, this is what the river looks like, deeply incised, fast flowing, not a lot of the place for deposits, so it get, it's, it's flushing all the time. And now, if you come to the Middle Orange River, now this first section is between the Fanakluov Dam and Hope Town. Now you can see the river has these small gorges and opens up and it closes up and it, and, and it opens up again. And the, all of this, and I'm trying to show it to you on, on this left-hand map, we have got the geology uh, underneath the, uh, the, the DTMs. I've cut out some of the elevations on the DTM to show to you what causes these. Now you can see the, the dolorites, the dolorites in red. As soon as the river hits the dolorite, it narrows uh, until it cuts through and then it starts to meander again uh, in this area. What you, what you do see here, what you, what you don't see here is a lot of structural activity. There's a couple of lineaments, uh, but no big faults or anything in here. And what this river basically did in this section it just continuously reworked itself. So there's no real gravel deposits here, except for the one right at the exit of the Panakluf Dam, uh, which I'm gonna show you now. Uh, and then a couple of low elevation deposits between 20 and, th and 30 meters, uh, and they're all covered by uh, agricultural activity, unfortunately. So there's not a lot of things to see or gravel to inspect. Uh, but what I have seen is that it's many small class that able to cobble size. Uh, none of the bigger stuff that we see that we see lower down in the river, except here yeah, at the exit of the of the funnel of dam. There you see these massive boulders. Most of these boulders are, are dolerite, uh, with occasional uh, uh, dogs with basalt in between. Uh, but it, it's massive, and uh, we prospected it about fifteen years ago, uh, and then uh, thought that the deposit was too small. Uh, somebody else went in there and mined it, uh, and I spoke to them the other day, and, and they also eventually gave up because the gravel was too coarse. They couldn't mine it. They didn't have the equipment to mine it. And also, it got too hard, and they had to drill and blast, and they weren't allowed to blast so close to the, the Fanakluf Dam. Uh, but they, uh, apparently, the biggest stone that came out of here was about a 12 character. Uh, grade wasn't too bad, but eventually, they, they just gave up. They couldn't mine it. Okay, if you look further downstream from Hopetown to the confluence, there you can see the, the river again enters this gorge. Uh, and then when it starts to open up, you start finding, you start to find some deposits. There at Camille Drift, there's a deposit, then it goes into another small gorge, and then it opens up completely. Now, looking at the gradients from Funnel Cliff to Hopetown, it's about uh, one meter, drops one meter in about 1,700 meters. Uh, and in this first section of uh, downstream of Hopetown, it drops one meter even in every 720 meters into this, this gorge feature. And then once it exits the gorge, it goes very flat, very, very similar to the, uh, the gradient between uh, Smith Strip and, and the confluence on the Val River, which is quite interesting. Uh, and then of course it starts to meander and you get these big deposits from it. 
uh, over there. Yeah, I'm just trying to show you the, the size of the deposits, uh, the alluvial deposits that formed after the gorge. Here's the gorge. You can clearly see the gorge. There's two small deposits coming out of the Etrix thing over here. Goes into another gorge, a little bit of a deposit there. And then as it opens up, the river starts to meander and it, and it deposits all, uh, over quite a wide area. If you look at the geology map again, and if you look at some of the structural features, we see suddenly now we are starting faults and fault patterns coming through. And it's, it's becoming quite an interesting feature about this section is that as soon as you start getting on Venter's drop, and there, just after Hopetown, you start to start find the first bit of Dwyka sticking out as well. So these faults, and especially the ones crossing, that have probably had some impact on the gradient change that we have here between Hopetown and uh, at Clip Fontaine, halfway to Douglas. Just a quick uh, photograph there. On top of this, this gorge, there's two deposits called Wicklow and, and Diamant Copy. You can see the Wicklow pothole, small feature like this. It produced about 4,700 4, carats. Uh, I think it was mine roughly in the, in the, in the, probably in the 60s. Uh, but this is the only one that sits outside of the gorge. There you can see this, this is uh, Diamant Copy and, and there's the current river at the moment. Uh, yeah, we're going to look at a, a deposit called the Colt. The Colt, of course, is famous because the first diamond in South Africa was picked up on the Colt. Uh, just a bit of history. It was it belonged to a company called BRC Diamond Corps Corps about twenty years ago. They drilled it. This is their drill all, all that they drilled. Uh, they then put up a small plant and tested it and, and found it to be uneconomical. We acquired it in twenty about 2015, 2014. Uh, we took their data and remodeled it, and we saw the following. Uh, once again, this is the uh, DTM of the bedrock. The browns are highs, and, and the blues and the greens are the lows. You can see the channels coming through here. See, there's a nice scour feature, and this is one of the first areas that we decided to mine the scour. Scour contained mainly sand, but the push slope out of the scour had uh, actually a very nice gravel on it. Uh, and here you can see this is the, the diamonds that plotted back that we found in these scours, the pushes out of these scours. And you can see there when you're in the, on the push slope, the nice grade, but as soon as you move away from it and out of it, uh, the grades dropped uh, dramatically. And eventually we, I think the drilled resource was about eight or nine million tons. We mined about 1.2 million tons of this. Uh, and at 0.28 and 0.3 at CPHT at about Five and a half, so five and a half thousand dollars a carat. Uh, it was quite economical to mine, but the rest of it is, is very difficult to mine profitably. Just a quick photograph of, of, of the deposit. You can see it. You need big equipment, you need big big bulldozers, uh, and you need to open up big quarries. And you mine, you need to mine it at, at, at big volumes to make it worthwhile. Just on the diamonds from this section of the river between Oakdown and Douglas. Is were taken out by Manhattan in from 2006 till about 2010. These are the typical clipper diamonds that we heard about last week. These big whites. Uh, John Ward mentioned last week that uh, Manhattan also got the the, 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 big, the biggest big pink stone, which was an 87 character uh, intense pink, amazing stone, sold for I think 140 million rand uh, in 2010 somewhere there. Now, this is a photograph of an operation that I had at, uh, at the, on a farm called March Drift, just upstream from the confluence. Uh, just to give you an indication, this comes from about 80,000 tons of gravel processed, mined and processed, it's about 130 carats. And that's, that's what this, this, these deposits are about. It's about these, these big stones. If you don't find them, that's a 44 carat uh, intense yellow stone. Uh, if you don't find these stones, the rest of them don't, don't pay, your, pay your bills. You, you've got to find them and you've got to push the tons to get to them. Uh, so it's, it's like I said in the beginning, it's high risk uh, mining. And you've got to know what you're doing. You've got to know what, you, what you're targeting. Okay, let's look at the Orange River Post Conference. Uh, now what we, okay, this is uh, a conference over there. Uh, you see these big meanders now suddenly starting to be to, to develop, which we didn't have uh, as consistently on the Val River and on the, on the Orange River pre pre confluence. We also have here where the X is. We suddenly have an influx of banded ironstone up upstream of this X. No banded ironstone in the gravels downstream of of this X. 
the river is flooded with banded ironstone. Now, obviously, this, this must have had some effect on the river. Now, if we just look at the, the, the number of occurrences and the elevations of occurrences on the different sections of the river that I've spoken about so far, you see at Van der Kloof to Hopetown, there's, there's only these low terraces that has developed. Uh, Hopetown to Douglas, there's a couple of more that's developed as you go through that gorge. And now suddenly between Douglas and Prisca, you have, you have terraces at basically every, every single elevation. And every couple of months, we find another one that we had, but we didn't think what uh, existed. And then the Var River between Spitzer, only, only a couple and many of them uh, on the lower elevations. Now, why is this? Why, what, why the sudden change uh, in the number of terraces? Now, if you look at the historical data uh, between Smith's trip and the confluence, carrots produced uh, after Sharp 1976, you can again see that the Orange River after the confluence uh, stands out significantly. So something must have happened that, that caused this constant concentration of diamonds. Yes, you had the confluence of the two rivers, but even if you add the, all of this together, you don't come close to, to the carrots that you produce after the confluence. Uh, there's, there's, there's two things that stand out. First of all, obviously, there's this influx of banded ironstone. Uh, and I think uh, McCarthy uh, postulated that this was a big river system equivalent to the orange river that came in here. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, but, but there's definitely a big influx coming from this point. But as the river moves closer to the, the asbestos hills in this area, there must have been a lot of input from this side. And we see there's an there's a operation just downstream of Prisca. We, uh, the gravel is, is basically flooded with, with banded ironstone and, and angular stuff. You don't, if you don't look carefully, you, you don't actually see the rounded stuff in there. So this must have had a significant impact. This probably uh, increased the bed load uh, density of the river, and it probably started to force it to, to meander more. But that alone is not, is not a reason why you suddenly would find terraces. What I also think you have happening is a, there's a big fault zone over there, and we see a lot of faulting in this area. And if we go to the next slide, there you can see this big fault right across. And I suspect that you had some reactivation on these fault zones, well, not specifically this, uh, this one alone, but probably all over the system, uh, that increased the, the, the gradient of the river from time to time, and that forced it to cut down and then probably cut off some of these, uh, these meanders and left them behind. This is a photograph on a farm called Livia's Kroll, uh, about halfway to, to Prisca. And there you can see this, this faulting in the gravel. Now I've seen this faulting like this in the gravel. I've seen gravel going over faults. I've seen gravel cutting through faults, which tells me that the, the faulting was active as the rivers were, were depositing and, and flowing. So I think that's the main reason why we have this sudden uh, increase in the number of terraces on this section of the river. Okay, let's look at a deposit here. This is a deposit called Quartz Fund that we've been mining for about three, four years, since about 2018. It's a Roy Copy deposit. It's, it sits at an elevation of about 115 meters above the current river. Uh, most of the deposit has been uh, made Roy Copy. It has deflated completely. Only the deeper sections here and there is left. Now, if we... Okay, well, what you're looking at here is, a, is, a, is the topography, it's, it's the surface elevation with different colors. Obviously, brown again is high, then going into a low, and, and these are highs. And in this section here, I've superimposed a drilling program done by TransX many years ago that shows a bedrock topography. And we put the, when we put the two together, we realized that the bedrock is actually following the lows of the current surface topography. And what we also figured out was that the higher grade sits in these probably old channel features and it's mimicked by the, the surface topography. Now, although the grade was, was fairly low, by mining these higher grade areas, we could in the end basically mine out the old deposit by just blending uh, on a monthly basis. So this was done by just flying it with, with a drone. Uh, and then with this, that data, we got quite accurate uh, surface topography. And there you can see the channels coming through, and, and that's what we focus on. And on these deeper features, this is also what the, the Roy Copy or the Macondos look like. Now, these are all solution cavities in the, in the, in the, in the calcrete that was filled in over time with this, uh, 
deflated gravel and it consists mainly of banded ironstone and silicates. There you can see how it falls into these, these solution cavities. And you try and dig them out as best you can, but obviously there's no concentration mechanism. So there's this doesn't mean that the diamonds would be sitting right at the bottom. Diamonds are distributed all over. <clears throat> and what we generally found that was like uh, we got better grades by uh, just dosing everything together and then selectively taking out the pockets where we have high grade in, in, in the upper layers uh, of the record bin. Uh, but the spun is a deposit that we acquired about six months ago. Uh, it, it's quite a well known deposit. It's been mined for about 20 years already by various operators. Uh, it's got a grade of about 0.2 CPHT. It's a 20 to 20 meter, 20 to 30 meter terrace. So it's a low terrace in this area. Uh, but it's still got a lot of tons left. Now, if we look at the at the bedrock topography, this got once again a DEM showing the, the bedrock of the old river. Uh, brown high, and then these pinks are the lows. So you can see there's a channel coming in over here. There's another channel coming in here, and there's another channel at the bottom here. Uh, we only have half of this, this meander. This, this, this part here was mined in 2005, 2006, I think, by another operator, and eventually they gave up. They, they couldn't make it yet. Uh, if you look at the next uh, image, this is magnetics that was flown. Now, we got this data when we, when we bought this property, uh, and we were told that, that it, it doesn't make sense and, and the, the magnetics doesn't help. But what we did was when we superimposed the two, you could see this, this magnetic high over here and this magnetic high over here. And if you look at the bedrock, you see that they actually split around this island. There's a, there's a bedrock high or a small island sitting here. And the one magnetic high goes this way and the other one goes over here. So this island must have had an effect in, in concentrating. Uh, and there you can see a small gorge feature, but it was scoured before the gorge. And then as you go out the gorge, Typical, what you find out on a larger scale, uh, there's a bit of a splay and it looks like it concentrated some of the heavies. And of course, the, the heavies here would be the banded ironstone and, and uh, it, it should also run with it with the diamond. So we're busy testing this at the moment to see if our theory is correct. And at this stage, because it's also covered by ray copy, we're not sure it does the, uh, does the magnetic actually mimic the ray copy. Is there more magnetic theory in the ray copy or does it actually go down all the way into the basin? But these are the things that, that, that you pick up, but you, you've got to look at, at everything and you've got to superimpose everything. And, and if, you, if you look carefully, everything makes sense. Uh, as I said before, the diamond, diamond is not, doesn't occur accidentally in certain places. Diamond is there because it wants to be there. Or it's not there also because it doesn't want to be there. Uh, just another example. This is another pro pro uh, project that we're uh, mining at the moment. It's called a Drive. It's close to Prisca. Prisca sitting over here. You see the tight bend in the river over here. Uh, there's the a dry deposit and the river actually flowed where it's sort of flowing uh, south-north at the moment. At this stage, it was flowing from, directly from north to south. Now, it was a prospecting right uh, that we also acquired a while ago. Uh, and we had to drill and blast uh, three areas on this in quick succession because uh, under, under, under prospecting right, you only allowed three blocks to test this. Now, this block over here was put out uh, in error on the high uh, of the bedrock. Now, when we started processing this, we, we, we started on this corner over here and we found a nice 28 and 11 character. And as we moved further down onto this high, the gray just completely disappeared. So last month, I think we had about 50 or 60 carats at about 100,000 tons treated. But it's just because we're on the, on the wrong area. And that's, that's why you've got to be very careful when you're mining these ultra low grade deposits. If you're in the wrong place, often you're it's not as if you don't have any grade, it's, it's often close to being barren. And at 50, 50 rand a ton, it's a very expensive mistake to make. So yeah, you've got to be careful. Just to look at some of the, the diamonds from this area of the orange of the conference is a 58 character from Carlton Spun. That's a 19 character D flawless polish from it. That's some thumb stones from Boater Spun. That's an 84 carat D. That's a 20 character there. All high value stones. And of course, we actually find quite a few bought 
uh, on, on all these deposits. Uh, and you always think that you won't find the boat gets destroyed. It's not, uh, they get very hard bought and, and, and we still find them. That's a 50 character, by the way. That's 108 uh, deep flawless. That, this, this stone sold for upwards of $50,000 a carat. Uh, yeah, some, some, some more stones. That's a 54. They sold upwards of, of uh, $40,000 a carat. There's some of the bigger ones, 154 character and 196 character. And then uh, John Ward showed us some, some nice pinks the other day from Cow, and, and obviously, or most likely, these are also from, from, uh, from Cow. This is a 22 character that we found last year uh, at Quartal Spun uh, and polished a 10 character pink. Just to summarize these, these deposits, uh, Arden River pre-conference, uh, four and a half to seven thousand dollars a carat at, at a very low grade. Uh, Reed River, 0.35 at about two thousand dollars a carat, and in the Val River, uh, anything from 0.3 to 1.5 CPST, uh, also at around two thousand dollars a carat. Just a few comments on processing. Uh, you have to mind these things at a large scale. Most of our operations uh, keep between 100 and 200 thousand tons per month. You have to do it, otherwise you don't make it uh, because you're chasing the big stones. We do infield screening, screen as close as possible to the pit to try and uh, keep your cost as low as possible. Uh, and then this is the processing. This is the spun plant. Those of you going to the, to the field trip, uh, we're, we're going to have a look at this. And, and here we have two sets of, of, of recoveries, two uh, Brunovestic uh, <coughs> extra machines. Uh, so you have a double pass. Uh, and the previous operator here, found probably 50% of his value of his last year found in the second second set of machines because they set up uh, looking at different parameters and, and all of them were these big D, D type stones. Okay, we're very serious about our rehabilitation because uh, if you don't rehabilitate properly, it's gonna be difficult for you to, to mine on a, in another area again because people won't allow you, they won't want you to be there. So this is just three photographs in sequence. Uh, from being mined Roy Kopi to being rehabilitated to a year later. And, and all of this is, is because we are using this minus six millimeter fraction as rehabilitation because the seedbed is preserved. Just looking at the business side of it, uh, this is from the operation I had on the Reed River, just showing the how your uh, monthly income fluctuates uh, when you're mining alluvial diamonds. Uh, it's not for the faint hearted. It, it's it's up and down all the time, uh, and if you get a couple of months, like, months like this where you we just make it and you don't make it in a big way, uh, believe me, uh, the the nights become very long. Average size also highly variable. Uh, average value obviously goes very closely related to the average size. Uh, you can't predict what it is. You actually only know what your average value and your average size once you finish mining. And then, of course, your grade as well, up and down all the time. We sell all our diamonds uh, to attend the process. Uh, COVID has, has taught us a few very expensive and, and serious lessons. Uh, we've decided at that time that we're going to uh, start our own tender house. And so we are in charge of our diamonds as far as possible down the, the route as possible. This the graph shows uh, on, a, on a tender per parcel, the difference between the first and the second price only. And there you can see quite significant differences. And often on each parcel, you would have uh, 15 to 20 to 30 bids. And this is only the difference between the first and the second. And historically 20, 25 years ago, uh, they weren't tenders and the guys were just selling out of the out of hand. Uh, and I think this is one of the big things that, that's made uh, the business more profitable in the past 20 years is that we've been allowed to, to sell on tender and getting a lot more competition uh, when, we, when we sell our diamonds. We've seen during COVID that uh, diamonds being sold in South Africa on tender uh, with being withdrawn and sold a month later overseas but up to 100% more overseas. And it's not always the case. Uh, COVID was an exception and, and the, the buyers weren't traveling. 
and that's a main reason. But in general, we do get very good prices in South Africa compared to the overseas tenders, and often even better prices because the, the buyers like to buy the what they call the virgin diamonds where they know nobody else has looked at it before. There's okay, just a bit of a summary. Okay, summary. summary. <laughs> yeah, I'm nearly finished. Uh, in my opinion, and I've looked at all the all the deposits that are, that I've identified in even the West Coast. I think we've got more than 100 years of resource left, uh, but the difficult deposits, the easy ones have been mined. Uh, these, the, what's left is low grade, or not only low grade, but ultra low grade. Uh, you got to watch your costs. You got to be involved all the time, uh, and you need to do your geological modeling and geophysics, and all these things become more and more crucial. Uh, as you have to be very selective in what you're mining. Uh, it remains a high risk uh, commodity to mine uh, and we need uh, the help of the uh, authorities to, to make the cost of compliance lower in order to get more, more people uh, into the alluvial diamond mining business. Had, uh, there's one, two more slides I want to show you right now. That's fine. Uh, I'm just saying That's the... Just the 20 minutes left, including okay, and okay. John and, John and um, Sanaz are still up to go. Okay. Uh, I just want to comment quickly on, on, on uh, just for interest sake, on, uh, on a deposit. I mean, I use, you probably saw on one of the slides, I said there was a the terrace at about 240 meters above the river, above the Orange River. Uh, this is it. It's it's called Vayuk. So you can see right in the distance that Saxon drift sitting right in the distance. Uh, between this and the next terrace of about 115, 110, 150 meters, there's, there's no other deposit. I mean, we have a 100 meter gap uh, that you can't explain. Uh, and this this Vayuk deposit, there's, there's a, a photograph of the gravels. It's got, it's, it's full of uh, Dogberg basalt. Uh, there's a lot of these probably Cornelians, uh, and I think uh, Jürgen Jacob, we had a look at it once and he said it's probably a, uh, related to some of the stuff, the oldest stuff on the West Coast. Uh, but the problem is, you know, where, where did the river find these glass? Uh, if we're saying that the Dwyka was, was a source of most of our boulders, which it is, of course, but uh, yeah, you're 100 meters higher up than your other deposits. Uh, and and uh, it, it's a bit of an enigma, and I haven't solved it yet. But I'm just putting it here for maybe for a few comments from uh, from the people listening. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Lyndon. Uh, I think we go straight to John and Sanazo, and then we take a questions after that. Okay, um, Lyndon's done an amazing job and covered, um, you know, the alluvial business as of sort of the Vaal and Orange in, in, a, in a fantastic way. So, you know, rather let's get the questions and discussion going. We, we don't really have much to add. We'd just be, you know, repeating the stuff, um, I, you know, except to say that if people are interested, um, so Nazad Lakuva did a really um, smart um summary um, report of, of this alluvial diamond section, uh, uh, alluvial diamond business, that report is available. We'll recirculate it to everyone. And it gives you, you know, very nice overview. And she identified, you know, some of the key challenges which um, Lyndon has, has talked to a little, you know, including the sort of one size fits all health and safety requirements, um, the, the hugely expensive compliance, taking four years to get a, a mineral right um, awarded and you know even longer for a water use license. But that's all sum summarized very nicely in Sonazo's report. But let's open it to the floor. Thank you guys. Any questions? I'm amazed to see nothing in the chat box yet. Uh, any questions to Lyndon? and company. Uh, you, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Rivaldo is uh, Elvis. Yes, thank you. Um, I suppose my, ooh, I noticed in the image for weekly production, 10 or 20 of the diamonds, obviously like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 carats, and then there'll be a single diamond that's 40 carats, which as you say, is the risk if you don't find it. 
Uh, I suppose my question is, once you found the prospective site, is there then a way to constrain where the larger diamonds are, or is it just luck when you run into the big one after processing hundreds of thousands of tons? Look, you like I tried to show, you have your trap sites. I mean, you, you, you by drilling and by modeling, you try and identify the, the, the best areas that, that you are most likely to find grade. Now, with your grade comes your, comes your big stones. Uh, you, your, if your stone count picks up, you know, in a good area, and if you're lucky, you'll find the big stone. But there's no way of, of predicting where the big stones will be now. Okay. Good there stuff. You go. Right. But maybe, I mean, there are a couple of questions in the chat box that we can get to. Maybe just talk a little bit about the technology, Lyndon, and your, your lower cutoff. I mean, you talk about those, you know, extremely high average values. Um, you know, which goes hand in hand with uh, with the sort of untraditional, although it's becoming traditional, four or six millimeter bottom cutoff, and and the impact that's had on you know not processing sand, saving water, you know all of those sort of things. Yeah, like I said, uh, our calculation because we we had a, we, we keep a record of every single stone that we found, and and many of them we actually measure as well x y and z. We we could figure out where our value is. And once we did that, we could say, okay, let, let's see if, if we cut it four mil or if we cut it six mil, uh, what's the most effective way of doing it? And like I said, uh, by cutting at six mil, we lost about 70, 60, 70 percent of our stones, but we only lost about five percent of our value. But that that fraction is, is a very huge percentage, like 30 to 35 percent of your plant fee. So now you're replacing that with a much coarser fraction. Uh, and your average size goes from one and a half to two carats, goes to four to five carats, average size. And obviously the value also increases significantly. Now that fraction, like I tried to show you, you know, the minus six millimeter fraction contains your seed bed. Uh, so if you, if you screen that out, uh, it makes your rehabilitation a lot more uh, efficient and effective. Uh, you don't, that's also the fraction that you used to put into your slimes then. So you're now desanding and you're taking the slums away. So your slums dam, instead of being 100 by 100 meters big, is now suddenly 30 by 50 meters, uh, which is a huge difference. And of course, now we, can, we, we also are recycling our, our puddle or our, our dense media, in our, which is just mud in our, in our pans. Uh, and we're using probably 25% of our water that we used to use. So it made a huge difference. Uh, other things that, that's changed uh, in the past 20 years is, is obviously the, the value of our diamonds have increased. It, it becomes scarcer. Uh, the rand dollar has, has helped us uh, in that uh, we sell in dollars. Uh, and the economies of scale, you know, like you said, we, we use big bulldozers, these big excavators. It's, it's big uh, operations that we do. Uh, and the economies of scale have also helped us to, to get to these bigger stones a lot quicker. And just to add to that, before we go to the chat box, and then just a comment, and it goes back to Herman's presentations last week. You know, statistically, um, you, you, you also use size frequency diagrams to ascertain and monitor your production. Um, you know, it, it's got to the point where you do that quite regularly. You can also use it to see if you have fingers in the till or you're losing stuff in the plant. So. I think the point you've made is that this whole business has become very scientific. And, and, and if you use those tools, it, you know, it's a matrix. You can't use one tool. You use all the tools available. You can make it work. You know, you may have to dip into your wife's housekeeping money once in a while, but generally, you know, if you do it properly, it works well. Yeah, I know, John, for sure. I mean, the, the first thing we did uh, 15 years ago was, was start to do, to do the modeling. I mean, by that time, uh, the easy deposits were gone and you had to be very selective on what you're mining. So once we, we got the modeling done and, and got more people uh, invested into doing modeling, uh, then the geophysics started, you know, the magnetics and even the drone, drone flying with the drone, getting the topography going. Uh, and I think there's probably going to be a couple of new things that, that will come out over time as well. And of course, the, the, the bulk X-ray uh, machines have also helped us, you know, with this... Uh, uh, banded ironstone, a lot of banded ironstone in, in the gravels downstream of the confluence. Uh, historically, you, you couldn't, there's no way of, of, of processing that material over, say, a grease table or whatever. There's just, there's just no way of doing it. Now, with the bulk x rays, it, it's just a lot easier to do. 
and it makes uh, the operations a lot easier. Uh, Lyndon, uh, interestingly, one of the chat box questions uh, in terms of uh, your idea around average rehab cost per hectare. Have you got any idea? Hans, I'll get you now. Yeah, no, look, our, our viewpoint is that, that, that we, we do rehab. We don't mind we do rehab. Uh, because to go and do rehab after you've mined is, is just too expensive on these deposits. So we make sure that our rehab catches up with us all the, all the time and, and it's just behind us. So uh, our cost per ton is probably roughly about 50 rand a ton and that includes rehab. But I, I can't give you a figure just for rehab because it's, it's part of our daily production. You know, a, a truck brings, uh, takes... Uh, Travel to the to the pans and brings tailings back and goes immediately into the hole. Uh, you, we we try to not do double handling and, and all those things. So it's 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 not a cost that I can say specifically because it's it's in, it's an integral part of our mining method. It's a concurrent uh, type of operation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hans, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for presentation. My question is regarding the processing method you follow, and specifically going from the mining pit to the plant to the sorthouse, and when you get the odd large stone, which, which you really chase for. Um, is the, the time period from the pit to the sorthouse and identifying large stones, is it specifically planned for you to be able to pinpoint back to where exactly this large stone comes from? Or is that delay too large to really pinpoint where that stone come from and thereby trying to model for, for future chasing the large stones? Look, where we can, we, 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 when we do our recovery, or we, we are sorting, uh, we immediately try and, and put it back and we actually give every stone uh, a coordinate to try and put it back in, in roughly in the area where, where it comes from. Uh, but being a, a low-grade and a, a cost-sensitive operation, you do sometimes have to mix quarries uh, just to make sure your plant gets enough gravel. Uh, so it, it is, we try to do it, but it, we're not always successful and we're not always as accurate as we would like to be. But what, so having said that, that, that's for us. I mean, I know most other guys don't do that. Uh, but I think uh, one of the reasons are that we've been successful is that we are very uh, conscientiously uh, record our data, every single thing that we, we do to try and record and, and try and plot it back on a map to say what, what we've done at what stage. But it, it's, it's being done, but it's probably not as accurate as we want to. But having said that, you, you know when you're in a nice feature uh, and generally when you're in a nice feature and there's a nice bedrock feature, you know, the stones come out. So you, you generally do have a good feeling for where what comes from. Right. Thank you, Lyndon. Uh, it was just to see whether it still remains a luck when you get the big stone, uh, because that still seems to be the scenario where it, it, it's good to have, but it, it, it's a luck scenario. It cannot be predicted, even though once you find it, you can say, yeah, that's obvious. It was found in this particular trap site. But forward predicting still seems to be um, lack of the draw. Yeah, look, how can you predict a, a 50 carat or 100 carat stone? I mean, it's still a pebble in the river. Yes, it's got a different density, but uh, so does the, the other diamonds as well. So generally we find that where your stone count picks up, your, your, your chances of finding the bigger stone is better. So statistically, uh, if you look at the population, you should get, a, say, a big stone. Every thousand stone should be a big stone. Or above, above a certain uh, carriage, whatever it is. But uh, to predict it uh, on, on a gravel basis, it, it's not it's not possible. It, 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 um, it remains a, a, a pebble that that uh, you know the, the chances of predicting that is, is just not possible. Yeah, it it does it does go back to the size frequency plots, though, Lynn. And I mean, if you do a size frequency plot for the Middle Orange River versus the Northwest versus you know the the Middle Orange between Hopetown and and Douglas, you know, you know that if you move this much dirt to one hundred thousand tons, you should get statistically you should get so many stones bigger than fifty or bigger than a hundred carats. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And then you've but, got to uh, move the dirt. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, no, absolutely. But but that graph is probably only accurate once you finish mining. Uh, you you'll you'll mine and you'll say yes, I, I'm I'm missing a, a hundred carats that I should have had, and suddenly one day you'll find two, and, and then it, then your your stats are correct again. You know, it's it's <laughs> yes, it, it it it's a tool, but it's it's also not that that accurate. No, well, that's why you also go back to your tailings. And anyway, Herman had a, a question, and it goes a little bit to this too about you know how many big diamonds out the Dwyker, how many out the gravel. Can uh, I'm reading it to you, Lyndon? Can you speculate on the percentage of pre Dwyker versus post Dwyker primary sources for alluvial alluvials? Look. For our area, and, and I've tried to show that, is that there's definitely different populations for the different river systems. You'll see the, the Rich River has a, has a different average value. And if you look at the photographs of the diamonds, they, they're different. The population is different from the Orange River pre-confluence. The population is different from the, the Orange River post-confluence. So if you have to ask me, I, I would say that the, the biggest impact of the Dwyka is providing classes in our area. And I don't doubt that there are diamonds in the Dwyker, but I don't think yeah, it, it contributes a lot of diamonds to our population. Uh, it's, in, in any case, if, if, if you look at the, what Pierre has shown, I mean, their population is quite a, quite a population of quite small diamonds. You know, there's not a lot of big stones kind of coming out of that area. If you say that the uh, Dwyker brought the, the, the pre crew uh, Kimberlites and, uh, and if you compare it to, to the population that they're mining in Northwest. Uh, and, and many of them, maybe we'll even screen out at six millimeters. Because I know in Northwest, you can't really screen out at six millimeters because you'll lose most of your diamonds. Okay, London, and the last one I see in the chat box is important in the sense that uh, we talked about compliance costs and environmental plans. London, do you have to clean your wastewater before a release or use it in? Uh, rehab areas. Look, our process contains no chemicals. Uh, the pan, but that we use as a concentration mechanism, is the, the medium in the pan is actually a mixture of mud at, at the density of about one point three eight. So there's no chemicals used in any of our processes. So we have a small tailing uh, uh, slime stem where this muddy residue goes into. It dries over time, and often we have a, a second or third dam, and the gravel, the, the water in the third dam is clean enough to uh, to reprocess and to use again in your process. And from the test and water samples that we've done, the, once we've treated the water and, and it comes out of our slime dam again, uh, it's actually cleaner than the, than the, the river water. That's the part I wanted to hear. It is cleaner than what we <laughs> out of the river. <laughs> to the next presentation, uh, which is, first of all, Dr. Tanya Marshall, who has a PhD from the University of Witwatersrand. Dr. Marshall founded Explorations Unlimited and has been actively involved in the alluvial diamond and gemstone exploration and mining industry locally as well as internationally. She is a fellow of the Geological Society of South Africa a member of the South African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy and a life member of the Geological Society of Africa and is registered with the South African Council for Natural Scientific Professions. In addition, she is the current president of the GSSA. She is the immediate and past chairperson of the SAM CODE Standards Committee and the chair of the Diamonds and Gemstones Working Group. She's also an adjunct visiting professor at the Department of Mining and Engineering at the University of Witwatersrand, and where she lectures in professional ethics as well as compliance and reporting in the minerals industry. Together with her, um, I see uh, they both here as presenters. John Ward uh, holds a doctorate in geology, PhD from KwaZulu Natal University, and has worked in about 26 countries, 20 of which were in Africa, mainly on alluvial and 
diamond projects ranging from green fields exploration through to large scale mine production operations. Apart from his current consulting, John has also worked for a major and two junior diamond companies and is a recipient of two medals um, uh, for his contribution to academ uh, academic and economic, uh, economic geology in Southern Africa. He is a life fellow of the Geological Society of South Africa, a life member of the Geological uh, 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 Society of Namibia, and also SASQUA respectively, and the SAMREC competent persons in primary and secondary diamond deposits. Uh, and I think Mike, is he also on the same one? Um, Mike uh, uh, has been presented yesterday, but also MSc degree in geophysics and sedimentology from the universities of Pretoria and a reading in U UK, Reading, uh, respectively, and a PhD degree from the University of Cape Town. He has 40 years of exploration experience, primarily in the diamond industry, having begun his career as an exploration geologist for the Geological Survey in South Africa prior to joining the peers, where he worked for 29 years. He managed various exploration programs for the beers in Africa, which led to a number of kimberlite discoveries and assumed responsible for all the beers programs in Africa, including general manager for the beers in the DRC. Since leaving the beers, Dr. David has worked on a number of diamond and base metal projects in Africa, including Botswana. Over to all the presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kat, for that introduction. I would like to initially acknowledge my co-authors, Mike DeWitt and John Ward, and also the many other geologists who've contributed photographs and data from both current and previous operations. The hard work and successes are all theirs. The mistakes and the misapplications, well, I managed to do that all by myself. Africa is by far the most productive continent when it comes to alluvial diamonds. And we're going to take a look at, at some of these today. We're not going to focus on the detail of all of them, rather look at an overview and then some principles of deposition and exploration that relates to alluvial deposits in general. So if we have a look at where alluvial diamond deposits form, we see them throughout the entire stratigraphic column. But we see them significantly more in the, in the Mesozoic and the, the Cenozoic. And of course, questions then arise whether we're looking at availability of source rocks, conditions for formation, or simply the preservation history. Well, those questions don't form part of what we're going to be talking about today. We also find our alluvials in a number of different depositional environments, right from adjacent to or even overlying primary deposits, all the way to the marine environment and pretty much everything in between. And we will look at some examples of all of these today. So, Firstly, if we have a look at the deposits which occur proximal to source, places such as Lesotho, Angola, Botswana, Tanzania, Ivory Coast, they all have alluvial trains leading from the pipe itself downstream varying distances. Now, one of the questions that we're always asked is how far down the river do the diamond values increase from industrial to gem quality? This work here was done by John Ward some years ago, looking at the diamond values within the first kilometer of the, the Let's Sink pipe in Lesotho. And we see here's the, the pipes in Lesotho, and here are where the, get, sorry, get this uh, laser pointer going. Here are the, the pipes, and here in a very short space, we start finding some proximal alluvial deposits. 
And we see even in this very short space, diamond values of all sizes increases immediately. We have a look at this diagram here. We can see the green, the value of the alluvial diamonds, as opposed to the, the primary diamonds that sit in the, uh, the lead sink uh, kimberlite itself. And even within a very short space of time, we start seeing upgrading of all sizes of alluvial diamonds. Some sort of a, a, a blip here, we're not quite sure what that's about. And it is generally this feature that makes alluvial deposits so attractive. The fact that we, there's somebody who has got their mic open, can you please? Okay, so it's it's this this feature that makes alluvial deposits so attractive, that you can increase the value relative to the primary source, even if it is reasonably nearby. So the exploration principle that we're looking at here is that you don't have to be far from a primary source to start looking for high value alluvial deposits. If we go across to the Ivory Coast, we find the, the Segula Kimberlites probably around uh, Lake Cretaceous. Diamonds have been known here since 1927. We've had mining by the early French and the Belgian companies in the mid 40s. Diamonds were mined by the state company and also West African Selection Trust and Harry Winston in the, in the 60s. Then we went through the late 70s where there was civil unrest. And it was only since 2014 when the embargo was lifted that production started again, but mostly in the in the alluvial space. Here we do see a bit of artisanal excavation directly on top of the, the Tubabuco dikes, but downstream from that, we find a number of both high level and low level terraces right even onto the, the floodplains. The diamonds are fairly small. We're looking at about 0.3 of a carat on average. The larger stone, alluvial stone found to date was 27 carats, mostly white colors, but also around 30% gem quality. So we're looking at less than $100 a carat. We move across to the DRC, to the Mbujimai area. Directly around the Mbujimai Kimberlites, we find a fair amount of alluvial material, which is just simply dumped into the, the caustic sinkholes with very little or no resorting. And then these things are reworked down again to the kilometer, to the terraces of the, the Sankuru River. So here you can see, this is where the kimberlites are and the, the alluvial deposits. And just a few kilometers downstream, we have the, the Sankuru River. It's interesting to note that this is what the, the diamonds look like as they come out of the alluvial material. And that is indistinguishable from the diamonds that come out of the Mbujimai pipes themselves. Just a few short kilometers away, we do see some amount of rounding and upgrading of the diamonds, even in this very short distance again. If we go up to Northeast Angola, we find the Cretaceous Age Colonda Formation, which is pretty much coeval with the emplacement of the, the Kimberlites. The depositional environment there is not conducive to significant erosion. So the, the highest diamond concentration in the Colonda would form around the, the pipes in halos. And closer to the, the pipes, it looks more like a immature volcaniclastic sediment. But further away, we start seeing some reworked fluvial features. Grades can be commercial throughout the Kalonda Basin, but it is really where these deposits have been reworked by younger streams that we get some really significant upgrading associated with the, the present river systems. The lesson here, understand the geomorphic evolution of the area, and that'll help you to understand where the higher grades 
all the potential higher volumes are likely to be. If we move on to Tanzania, here we see how the level of erosion of the Kimberlite combines with the nature of the drainage to influence the development of alluvial deposits. We've got limited erosion of the Modui pipes or, or Williamson mine, and that is evidenced by the presence of thick epiclastic deposits. The drainage in the area is particularly unimpressive, and there's almost no incision or down cutting, what we call passive drainage. And this will result in only limited development of gravels in the rivers. Diamonds have been mined commercially from the alluvial deposits directly on top of and also surrounding the epiclastic sediments. And although alluvial diamonds have been recovered from various locations downstream of the pipe, nothing commercial has been located yet. And given the geomorphology, it is highly unlikely that it will be. Right, so the, the second major depositional environment that we're going to look at today is the, the normal fluvial alluvial systems, both meandering, braided river systems, and all of their associated geological settings. So what do we have here? We've got the colluvial gravels, which typically are located on the outer flanks of the valleys, they can form from the deflation of pre-existing terrace deposits that make them higher grade in patches, but also the shallowness makes it easier for artisanal miners to exploit. Then we go down to the, the terraces. Now from the, the outer edges of the terraces in towards the, the, the current river flats, we can have any number of flights of terraces. And typically what we have here are basal gravel units, which are the more diamondiferous ones, overlain by finer grain fluvial units. In the terraces, both the overburden and the gravel can be semi-consolidated, can be lateritized, or calcreted depending upon the prevailing climates. Then we move up to the, the river flats, where we typically have variable overburden thicknesses, and consolidated gravels. These are typically the primary exploration target because you have higher volumes, potentially higher grades, and easier to mine either large volumes. Then we get to the, the present river systems, where we have two varieties, the, the mobile poorly developed placer, which has large volumes and low grades, and then we have the, the bedrock controlled rivers where you can form deep pools, scour channels. And in these, you can get really high concentrations of, of diamonds, high grade, but low volume. And in some places in the, the DRC and various other places in the tropics, these bedside, bedrock trap sites in current rivers can get recharged every year with the rains. So theoretically, you could sit at one site and mine the same deposit year after year. This is just a, a summary of the, the type of trap sites that we generally find in pretty much any kind of alluvial, fluvial alluvial deposit. We get the, the mobile trap site. We have the, the mobile trap sites where diamonds concentrate at specific places within the depositional environment. And that would be at the bar heads, at the platforms, and nothing much at the bar tail. So this end of the, the bar is the important one. In the bedrock controlled deposits, we'd find them in scours, ends of, of push bars and associated with bedrock highs. And the grades in the bedrock trap sites can be two or three orders of magnitude higher than elsewhere. Again, showing the importance of being able to identify and then select the trap site that you want to mine. Moving off to, to Angola, we've had a brief look at the, the Mesozoic Colonda formation. We also have the, the Cenozoic uh, alluvial deposits. 
Now, this slide is not to talk about a specific deposit, but I want to demonstrate an important feature about alluvial deposits. And people often get very hung up on, on the grade of an alluvial deposit. And Lula shows us very clearly that grade is not necessarily the most important parameter. So if you have a look here, the, the grade is not particularly inspiring, but look at the average stone size and the, the average value. With respect to, to diamonds, very different from other commodities where you may have only uh, grade and volume to concern ourselves about. Diamonds, we look at volume, grade, but also value. And this is what can make a deposit particularly uh, commercial. We look at the, the DRC. Uh, there are a number of different areas where alluvial diamonds are mined. So over 90% of the diamonds in the, the DRC come from recent river flats, modern rivers. And this trend is attributed to the, the fact that there is rapid erosion of the rivers through a soft cover. And so you have this vigorous recycling of diamonds. I compare this to South Africa, where it is fairly different. And Lyndon has shown us that many of the higher terraces are the ones that have the, the diamond grades. So the, the point again, to make sure that you know the geology or the geological and geomorphological history of your project so that you go and look in the right place for potentially commercial deposits. I want to have a look at this slide to look at the influence of geomorphology. Now, within your bedrock trap sites, you can get very high grades, very little clay, but you're also likely to have low tonnages. And that's not going to be very easy to, to be mined by mechanical means. If you have a hard bedrock, you're obviously going to have better trap sites than soft rock. Then if we have a look at the, the broad valleys, the, the meander belts, this is where we have sediment dominated trap sites. We've got high tonnages that lend themselves to mechanical mining, but the downside is that the, the grades are moderate to low, and there's also often an, ab an abundance of clay, which can complicate the processing. Here where we have very narrow valleys, we often have narrow terraces, higher water speed, which results in generally lower to moderate average grades. Where we have these splay deposits, again, where the, the river opens up, gravels a dump, these are generally high priority targets with, with larger volumes and moderate grades. So it's important to look at the, the geomorphology of your deposits to give you an idea to be able to, to rank them in terms of where do you go off first. Not only geomorphology, but also the sedimentology of the gravels. And here I'm looking specifically at the issue of class sorting. In the um, Chikapa region, we find two layers of gravel, a basal gravel, which as you can see has a reasonably high grade and it is a poorly sorted gravel. Whereas the, the upper gravels have a very low grade, but they're a much better sorted gravel. And the, the reason as many people has, have, have, have intimated is due to the formation of trap sites within the gravels. So for alluvial deposits, poor sorting, is actually good sorting. Now, before we leave the, the DRC, this is a picture to blow your mind as to how an artisanal community can affect your prospect. What we have here is the end of a, a rainy season. The guys had identified an exploration target. And just note this um, rock over here identified. In just a few short weeks after the river levels had subsided, 
that was the community of artisanals that had sprung up around it. You can just imagine what this could do to your resource estimation program. This is probably why few people even bother at this stage. In the Central African Republic, we've got diamonds in two main regions. Out in the, the west, we have the, the Kano Beberati area, and then the, um, the Bria area in the east central. There's been no obvious identified sources associated with this, but many of the alluvial deposits have been broadly related spatially to areas of the, the Mesozoic sandstone and conglomerate formations, as well as a Paleozoic glacial sequence, both of which have been touted as possible source rocks. However, neither diamonds nor kimberlites uh, um, indicator minerals have been recovered from either of these basement sequences. So the source remains uncertain at this stage. Diamonds are found in both bedrock as well as mobile placids. Obviously, the, the grades of the, the bedrock deposits are sufficiently high to allow for mining by river diversions. And this is what the, the diamonds look like. They are reasonably small, with 80% of the stones being less than, than half a carat. This is an interesting feature here, that there is 40% very high percentage of carbonados in the, the western areas and only 7% in the central areas. And this becomes more interesting when we go across the border to, to Cameroon, where again, we find a high percentage of carbonados, this time to the east of Cameroon, abutting onto the, the western areas in the Central African Republic. Looking at the, the, the Cameroon deposits, it's also a tout for the importance of a systematic evaluation of alluvial deposits. We go back to 2006, the quaternary alluvial deposits were mined quite successfully. That was a very simple situation. You had um, a meter and a half of overburden and a gravel unit below. Then somebody noticed that the bedrock there is conglomerate and suggested that these conglomerates might be the source of the alluvials and represent a significant reservoir of all the diamonds. All in all, a very plausible suggestion. So in 2010, the company CNK, which was listed on the Korea Stock Exchange in Seoul, declared a diamond reserve of 736 million carats without taking a single sample to back it up. They simply measured X by Y by Z and multiplied that by some magical grade number. In 2015, after they had done extensive sampling and found not a single diamond in the basement samples, CNK was delisted from the exchange the project was abandoned in 2016. The directors all went to jail, but politics being politics, they were all free again after six months, while the widows and orphans who had invested in the project lost their shirts. It's interesting to note that the Korea Stock Exchange does not require any compliance with international reporting codes such as SAMREC or JORC or CIM, had they done so, the scam could not have taken place. Moving along then to Somabula in Zimbabwe, here we have a, a, a two meter thick basal diamectite representing a Permian till. The diamonds, as you can see, are, are reasonably good diamond, diamond value. Uh, but the grades are sub-economic, and particularly when you look at the fact that you have an overburden thickness of up to 40 meters. What makes this deposit especially interesting is the associated heavy mineral assemblage, which includes a host of other gemstones and also precious metals. Then out near the Swaziland-Mozambique border, some 30 kilometers from the Dokoweo pipe, 
there has been a wood uh, that's been identified as the source to the alluvials. We have the Halani deposit. Here we're looking at basal units of the Stormberg group, which represents a braided stream environment. Halani was mild by, mined by Transhex in the late 70s, early 80s to a depth of around 170 meters and a long strike for some 1.2 kilometers. Out in Mozambique along the, the Save River, about 200 kilometers downstream of both the Marangi and the Maroa diamond fields, uh, we've got some braided rivers sitting up on top here and meandering river deposits on the uh, bottom terrace. This is what the, the gravels look like. These are extremely diluted deposits and patchy grades and very small, reasonably small diamond sizes expected. Again, in the importance of understanding the source and the geomorphic history of an area when you generate exploration targets. Moving to West, Western Africa, in Mali, 29 Kimberlites are known in the southwest of the country. Eight are reportedly diamondiferous, but not commercially so. But alluvial diamonds are recovered as a byproduct of alluvial gold deposits in the Kenyeba district. But just look at the size of these stones. 15% of the stones are greater than, than 15 carats in size, with some 50 carat stones known, the largest of which is 98 carats. Very interesting stuff happening here. In Sierra Leone, the alluvial deposits exist primarily in the rivers in the eastern half of the country, and they're pretty much sourced from the high-grade dikes around Koidu and Tongo. The grades in these deposits can be phenomenal, with the, the highest grade known from an alluvial deposit at over 8,000 carats per ton. Sierra Leone also boasts some very large diamonds. The star is, I think, still the, the largest alluvial diamond and the, the third largest diamond ever recovered. In Western Liberia, we find young Cenozoic deposits in the, the Mono River and various other rivers and creeks. The Diamonds are derived from nearby Proterozoic and Mesozoic Kimberlite pipes and dikes. And this is, is Steve Haggerty out in Liberia, who recently identified this particular um, plant, the Pandanus candelabrum, as, a, as an indicator. These things grow preferentially on Kimberlite soils. In the, the northeast of, of Liberia, we get some small spotted diamonds in the graphite schists, in the pre-Cambrian granite greenstone terrain. These diamonds are mined there in situ, but they're also eroded out into the, the younger present rivers. In Guinea, these two deposits highlight the effect that volume and also average diamond size can have on the economics of an alluvial deposit. Out at Mandela, we've got gravels preserved in bedrock trap sites. We're looking at reasonably high grade, but relatively low volumes. Across at Aridor, we've got a very broad sluggish system on a soft substrate. We've got lower grades, but much higher tonnages. Now, what this has meant is that combined with the, the larger stones that we find here at, at Aridor, Mandela never made it past feasibility stage. But the Aridor mine was in commercial production from 1934 to 2008. Again, grade is not the, the most important parameter here. The deposit at Aquatia in Ghana is an interesting one. John will talk more about megaplaces later, but this is the, 
Only fluvial megaplasts are known, having produced over 100 million carrots. It's in terms of the, the number of carrots, definitely not value. The diamonds have been recovered from a number of different terraces. Again, we get the, the high um, colluvial type material and then a flight of terraces and then the, the present river itself. At the, the main operation, diamond size is small, being at 30 carats, 30 stones per carat. And downstream, it just gets even worse. We're looking at mostly industrial stones and cuttables, gem quality stones above one carat are extremely rare. The thoughts of the source here, we're looking at the Beremian volcano sedimentary sequence. We've got two coarse tough units within the gray wackies there, and they are known to contain sub-economic diamond concentrations and has been um, touted as potentially one of the primary sources of these diamonds. Aquatia is also a lesson in how politics and greed can totally destroy a good deposit. It was discovered by Central African Selection Trust in 1919 and was mined by them until the early 70s, a joint venture or a partial nationalization took place and the Ghana Consolidated Diamond Company developed and they mined commercially producing some two and a half million carats a year. Then followed a lethal combination of total nationalization and gross mismanagement. And so by 2006, we just had a few legal and illegal diggers trying to eat out an existence. The whole deposit was put out to tender, but no one was willing to take on the historical debt which was held by the state. And the state wanted the incoming party to pay for all of that. In 2011, a state-owned company, Great Consolidated Diamonds Ghana Limited, was developed. And this was going to refurbish facilities, expand the resource base, start mining, do outstanding rehabilitation, and all of this was going to be done using over $100 million promised by a Chinese corporation. The money's never materialized. And in 2019, uh, Great Consolidated Diamonds Ghana Limited disintegrated. Since then, various other international companies have looked at it. Okay, so if we look then at the, the third depositional environment, this is the sink. In its very simplest form, the diamonds drain off the craton from primary sources or pre-existing alluvial deposits. They go through the, the fluvial alluvial system into the inter or intracratonic setting to form terminal places. And here is where they can be reworked by various marine processes. The Witz Basin, represents the oldest known such alluvial diamond repository. And over the years, we've had a few hundred carats being recovered from the conglomerates of the, the upper bits. Probably the, the best known examples are these which have come from the, the Modabi gold mine, which back in the day was known as the, the Modabi gold and diamond mine. We've also got quite a few diamonds coming out of the Clarksdorp area, particularly where they've been eroded and reworked into the younger alluvials. And there are even, I know of at least five small diamonds that have come out of the, the cook shaft on the West Rand. It's suspected that such diamonds were much more widely spread throughout the Bits Basin but they're definitely not recovered today due to the, the, the crushing that takes place. When we look at the, the size and color of the, of the diamonds, they mostly green, almost black as a result of the, the radiation. 
If we go back to the Ivory Coast, we find diamonds in the conglomerate, the basal formation of the Barimian sequence, which are ancient, ancient beach places. And again, these have been reworked out of there into the, the current younger alluvials. Once again, we're looking at small diamonds, green colored with uranium pigmentation spots. The sources are known, but some have suggested that it could be graphitic or actinolite schists in the basement greenstone complexes. And back in Ghana, looking at the, the Bonza area, we've got diamonds recovered from the, the basal conglomerates along the Ashanti belt. And again, diamonds are eroded out of these deposits and into the, the present river systems. Once again, the diamonds are small, low quality, same green black colors, potentially the same kind of source. In the Taudeni Basin in North Africa, this now covers parts of Mauritania, Mali, and Southern Algiers. Throughout the entire basin, we find large numbers of small diamonds and also G10 garnets at various localities. The current working model is that the diamonds were originally deposited in the, the basal Taudeni sediments. And uh, then the, the diamonds were weathered and accumulated then on the deflation surfaces before being, being covered by the Sahara Sand Sea. That brings us then to, to Marangi in Zimbabwe. And what we're looking at uh, geologically are the sediments at the, the base of the Mkondo uh, Basin. It's the, the uh, Zimbabwe crat on the Mkondo Basin. And the diamonds occur at the, the base of an alternating siliciclastic and carbonate sequence. Now, on the, the edge of the basin, we got these thick cobble conglomerates with incredible grades of two to 8,000 carats per 100 ton. This unit then thins basinward until it's only a thin grit layer with much lower grades, lower grades, 250 carats a 100 ton. But one of the defining features of the Marangi deposits are these very large, rounded, low quality diamonds. But make no mistake, there are a goodly number of gem quality diamonds in the mix as well. And this has been interpreted as a proximal terminal placer on the edge of the Zimbabwean craton, where you've had repeated and long lived tidal reworking in a shallow depression. The the last one that we'll have a look at is the Namibian terminal placer, where diamonds have been deposited as beach deposits of various ages. And here we can see some examples, but John and Ian are going to talk more about these in the, the next two presentations. The major difference between this and Marangi, which both have produced over 100 million carats, <coughs> excuse me. Marangi has some 10% gem quality and Namibia has over 95%, potentially related to the distance of travel from their primary sources, but more likely related to the energy of the Atlantic Ocean. Highlighting yet again the importance of understanding the geomorphology as well as the environmental context in which that deposit is situated. There are many other alluvial deposits worldwide. We see some in South America, Arctic Siberia, India, New South Wales, and Kalimantan, all of which is a story for another day. And as my voice is giving out, <clears throat> I'd like to say thank you very much for your time and if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, I am on my way to look for a ticket to get to Mali right now, but uh, be that as it may, any questions?
just um, just just by way of an update, jo John Ward or Tanya, what's what's actually going on at um, Marangi today? Is there is there much activity or is it um, not much? Uh, John, I mean George, John, and various other people might have additional comments, but the last time I had a, a look at it, there was there was interest from various international companies. But I think the major problems with trying to write a, an, an acceptable contract between contractors and the, the government, things have, have slowed down quite dramatically. And I don't know what is happening currently. A couple of years ago, Al Rosa were uh, working with them down at uh, Chimani Mani. Um, and certainly on the Al Rosa website, they talk about being involved in exploration in Zimbabwe, but don't give any details. So I don't know what's uh, what's happening at the moment. That was all pre-COVID. Uh, yeah, well, and if you look at the at the KP figures, I mean, the production has tailed off dramatically. And of course, you know that the average value is is orders of magnitude different to what we're going to hear of on the west coast. I, I guess in in, in the sort of peak days of mining, it was something like $35 to $50 a carat, you know, average. I mean, Tanya showed us some substantial numbers there, but on the whole, it wasn't a great product. Yeah, the Zimbabwe KP numbers are, you know, it's the wrong word, but contaminated by um, Maroa, of course. Um, so it raises the average value quite significantly. So I suspect Maroa's value is uh, quite a bit lower than the average, maybe closer to 20 or 30 than the 50 that you're talking about. If you do the numbers. Yeah, Marangi is definitely down there, yeah. Well, basically they cleaned out all the, um, all the, um, the modern uh, alluvials. That's pretty much gone now. And they were into the hard rock conglomerate, which was still running at anywhere between 20 and 80 carats a ton. Um, that was in area A, which was the discovery block that Tombada had, and uh, that, that was being run by ZCDC with uh, drilling blast. Um, what was interesting, the work, bit of work I did in 2014, that the base of contact is quite full today, and uh, there were throws of, you know, up to about 15 meters on it, so you couldn't even look at a, you know, planing across the unconformity to try and try and make it work. But the, um, <clears throat> but again, so what they were doing is, um, Bill, you'd be interested. They were bringing in some of the kimberlite from Chikara and Wengezi and uh, treating that to see what was coming out of that. We treated some of the alluvials that came from the direction of Chikara. It was very low grade, though. But um, Al Rosa were, were looking at, um, in, the, in the, uh, the last two years, they've been actually down in the low felt. Uh, they're just systematically going through the old records, including the Rio Tinto ones. And... Uh, and that uh, the 19 hectare body. So they set up a major they set up a major uh, center in Harare. And, and and Tanya, I mean, it's it's a fascinating presentation, but it does also go back to the fact that this is an amazing continent when it comes to diamond resources. Um, you know, so obviously, you know, the first thing you need to to have resources is obviously sources. But, um, you know, and I guess too, geomorphology and these big river systems and minor river systems play, play a significant role in creating all these secondary deposits as well. I mean, I mean you and John and Mike DeWitt and, you know, Lyndon have seen large parts of the continent. I mean, so much goes back to geomorphology. Is that correct? Oh, ab absolutely, John. You definitely need a source somewhere, whether it be a primary source or a secondary collector, uh, something that's got to bring the diamonds in and get them into the system. And how they are concentrated is, well, that's what geomorphology is. So you do need to understand how the country area has um, evolved geomorphologically and also have a good understanding of the sedimentology of, of your deposit. Otherwise you can find yourself looking in the, in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
Yeah, so begs the question, where did all the Canadian diamonds go? I mean, as we see now, there are numerous kimberlites, maybe not as many as in Africa, but presumably the glaciers swept them away and buried them somewhere. Uh, there's a, a very interesting um, diagram. I'm just going to see if I can share it again. Um, but when you look at the, the, the wave energy throughout the, the various oceans, you'll see that wave energy along the Southern African West Coast is extremely high. But wave energy out around Canada is extremely low. So even if the alluvial diamonds have gotten into the, the system and gone out into the, uh, the oceans, you don't have the energy to, to concentrate it and form these magnificent deposits. Also looking at the, the various um, uh, glacial trails, I have read a couple of articles which indicates that, yes, diamonds are found in them. They've, they've not found diamonds in sufficient quantities to make any of these glacial trails commercial, uh, but then they just seem to, to disappear into these very low energy deposits, which do not concentrate anything. Yeah, it's a lack of concentration. Hmm? Yes. We have the same thing in, in Australia with all the, uh, the, the, the diamonds up in the, the Northern Territory. They also go into the, the Gulf and various other areas, but there's nothing there to concentrate the, the diamonds to make a large commercial deposit. Yeah, good point. And I see there's a question about diamonds in Zambia. I mean, again, you know, there have been um, reports and occurrences, but I don't think there's anything that really is of significance in Zambia, Tanya. No, not, not that I know of. Um, we, we all know of the, the odd diamonds that have been found, but there, there is nothing written on it. There's been no research on it. Um, again, no, no concentration anywhere. I'm sorry, I'm jumping in here. Angola, Angela's got a question about Angolan average prices. Herman, do you want to comment? You, you did that very eloquently um, last week and are the expert on Angolan prices. Uh, yeah, I just unmute myself. Um, yeah, I did see that uh, question. Actually, the Angolan average price is from uh, Kimberley Process Records is the same as the global price and it's around about uh, the global average price. It's around about $100, uh, carats per ton, $100, $100 per carat. But it's actually very misleading at looking at the average price of Angolan diamonds because their alluvial diamond production is much higher quality. Um, there, is, there are larger stone sizes involved. So the alluvial diamond averages around 500, 450 to $500 a carat. And then the balance of Angolan production is of course from Katoka uh, where the average price point is around 85 to $90 a carat. Yeah, I think Katilka is producing about 7 million carats a year, just over 7 million carats a year. Um, I don't have my file open now, so I'm not sure what Angola is, but I think it's around 8, a million carat, 8 million or thereabouts. Yeah, uh, right. yeah Bill, so it's 20% alluvial and 80% Katoka. And, and, and I guess it's the same sort of situation as, as South Africa. I mean, I guess, um, you know, Phoenicia, Cullinan, and the Kimberlites far outweigh the, you know, the relatively small abundance of alluvial product of exceptional value. I can, uh, if I can share my screen quickly, I can just throw up that, um, that plot again. I've just uh, pulled it up. Go for so it. If, if you guys can see that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there you have, the, you know, on the left is Angola production. Uh, in green are the, the primary producers, and in the wide format, the wide format over here, that's Katoka. So that's their declared uh, prices. The alluvials are in, in light pale blue, and you can see the range of alluvial diamonds. And then there's this exceptional producer, Lulo, which was also mentioned by Tanya. 
And then this is the Southern African context on the right hand side based on, on Kimberley production numbers, uh, Kimberley process certification numbers. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the average price point of Namibian um, alluvial production, there's the Kimberley process number. It's very close to $500 a carat. And the, um, the range for Angolan alluvials is basically exact, you know, it's very similar. Um, and then the blend of the alluvials in Angola with Katoka brings the average for Angola up to that point over there, which is roughly 80% 80, 80 Katoka, 20% alluvials. And these numbers are very similar to what we see in Southern Africa, as John has just pointed out. Um, the Southern Africa average is right there, but the alluvials in Southern Africa go up in light blue uh, all the way through exactly the same range as what we see in Angola. Yeah, fascinating, the power of water and attrition. Yeah. You mustn't show those diagrams to the Competition Commission, commission they'll, they'll start accusing us of price fixing. <laughs> Dr. Ian Corbett, BA Geology Honours, uh, MSc, PhD, Advanced Management. Ian has an extensive research and field experience in major diamond, gold, and platinum placer provinces of the world. He worked as a consulting geologist, placer and intellectual capital manager for the Beers Exploration and Operations Division prior to establishing an international consultancy in knowledge management. Now retired, he has a continuing interest in the West Coast sedimentology. Over to Ian. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um... A lot of friends in the audience I see, so nice to be in touch with people again. Um, my talk this afternoon is not going to really touch on the geology of the West Coast very much, um, but uh, some of the people and, and uh, some of the experiences that, that people have had over the um, many years of development of the West Coast offshore operations, and it's a sort of lead in to perhaps John, but specifically into um, Urban's talk later. Um, my journey with De Beers personally started um, back in 1982 when I met a guy called Mike DeVitt at the University of Reading, where we were both doing an MSc in Applied Sedimentology. And uh, one of our more memorable moments is probably on the banks of the, the Severn River, trying to get a core out of a freezing um, mud in 1983. And um, through Mike, uh, Barry Hawthorne offered me a, a position um, working in arrangement. And uh, that saw me arrive um, in 1983, October 83, um, to start working in a place called Bogenfels, which uh, some of you might be familiar with. When I, um, when I arrived in Aranyamunt, I was uh, picked up from the airport by a woman called Ali Manning, and um, Ali became my wife in 1985, and uh, she was the first lady to live out in Bogenfels since 1954. And... Um, that was made possible by Ronnie Hazel, who I'm not sure if he's in the audience today, but Ronnie was, um, was instrumental in, in making it possible for Ali to join me. And as you can see, um, Bogenfels is quite a remote and rather desolate place. And I rather underestimated the impact that would have on my um, newly married wife. And, um, she then started to look for things to do and one of the things that she um, came up with was to become an author and uh, Ali wrote a book um, called Diamond Beaches looking at the history of Aranyament and uh, also was our diamond sorter working on the prospecting plant um, ably helped by our, our little black cat. 
coming to the more serious part of the talk now, um, many of you will be familiar with the fact that Zacharias Luala is accredited with having found the first diamonds on the West Coast in 1908. And um, the talk today is really, is really the product of that, uh, that man's discovery. And uh, as, as was noted by um, early visitors to the coast, it's a desolate place. And one of the most remarkable stories that, that can really be told is how the, the, the overall mining of those deposits actually evolved because it was an, a remarkable journey in itself, almost as remarkable as the journey of the diamonds that John and Urban will be talking about later. The actual discovery came quite late really in, in terms of looking at other rushes around the world. There'd been many major gold rushes in, in the Americas, um, prior to that time. And there'd even been quite a lot of visitors to the West Coast, um, going right back to the early explorers who came through in the late 1480s. Um, we had guano um, rushes to the coast in the um, 1843 to 1845. And it's well documented that many of those people actually went on shore and uh, a, a company called De Pass Spence & Co then in 1863 actually opened a copper mine um, right uh, next door to Pomona where the biggest discovery was waiting in a valley called the Idatal, but that was only discovered in 1908. And the rush on the west coast actually went through until the marine beaches were discovered initially by Jack Carstens in the Mequiland in 1925. And then in 1928, the discoveries in, in Namibia at the Orange Mouth um, led to the development of, of the deposits that John will be talking about later. So there were people all around, but remarkably, given that many of the diamonds lay on the surface of the, of the desert and the initial mining activity was to crawl across it on one's hands and knees and actually pick up diamonds, and I've been able to do that in my working life. Um, picked up a number of stones in, in, in the Pomona area. And um, August Stauch, it's claimed, went south with Professor Scheib riding on horseback from Coleman's Cop. It was supposedly Scheib's first ever venture out on a horse. And it is, it's, it's legend in, or myth in um, Aranumant that Stauch was able to carry on prospecting with Scheib in the moonlight in the desert because there were so many diamonds lying on the surface of a remarkable valley called the Eidertal, which is next door to another remarkable valley called the Hexen Castle. And, uh, not quite as remarkable perhaps as the Merangi um, deposits in some respects, but one sample in the Hexen Kessel, 20 meters long and a few, uh, one meter wide and less than five centimeters um, deep produced nearly 2000 diamonds. And even the Germans were totally surprised by that. The area has seen many extraordinary geologists over the hundred years or so that it's um, been a, 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 an operating area for diamond um, mining. And Klinghart was probably one of the most remarkable of those people. And, and many people attribute the initial success to Klinghart's ability to survive in this arid land. He had a remarkable knack of finding water. He um, worked a lot with um, Bushmen and um, through him, many of the early people were able to survive and, um, and prospect in areas which were really desolate and off the map for most. Early on, there were some remarkable recoveries by August Stauch. And it actually, this, this particular diamond is one of many, 112 carats. Um, 
there were many diamonds in the Ida Tal that were between 40 to 60 carats that were recovered. And um, that fact led Stauch to believe that somewhere close by was a primary source. And he in fact used most of the fortune that he made through his work in Namibia to try and discover the primary source and never did. And, and in the process, lost a fortune. And these diamonds were relatively unknown until a metal trunk was discovered in a shed that was being cleared in a rangiment by some engineers looking for some extra space way back in the 80s, possibly 90s, I don't remember exactly when. And in that trunk were the original notebooks from the German prospectors who prospected the trenches cut across the valleys in, in the Spachabit. And uh, the, the remarkable thing of those notebooks was that they recorded all of the large stone sizes and it was really quite incredible and, and interesting to see how many stones of plus 60 carats were recovered from those areas where the average stone size was was much closer to 0 0.2 0 0.3 stones to the carat one of the things that was amazing when i arrived in that particular part of the world bogenfels and later lived in pomona and then up in luderitz was to see the technology that advanced through those areas in such a short time. A rail system was put in from south to north and, and uh, in no time at all, man was replaced by large machines. And one of the most audacious areas that, that a bucket excavator could possibly have worked is on the margins of the Namib Sansi where overburden was stripped from areas to the north of Colmanskop and Luderitz itself. And some of those machines are still standing in the desert today. Um, absolutely incredible tenacity and engineering capability that brought these technologies to Namibia in, 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 in a time, 1913, I mean, it, it, it used to just blow one's mind to see what these people achieved under the most difficult of circumstances. At the same time, there were a number of really amazing geologists that worked in the area. Eric Kaiser was one of them. He was actually a paleontologist mainly, and um, he was commissioned to bring a volume together, um, became two volumes. In fact, it's a beautiful piece of work that um, includes maps going from almost uh, Shamice Bay all the way through to um, north of Luderitz. And he worked with a number of different geologists, including Beats, to compile a, a, a paleontological record of the deposits. Unfortunately, at the time, they were not allowed to discuss the economics. And so, although it's touched on in places in those volumes, there's very little in terms of actual detail. And, and it's a great loss that, that that never took place. But the technology advance continued and, and Elizabeth Bay in the 1930s, just to the south of Luderitz became an absolute showcase for the most advanced mining technologies of its time. And um, it was, it was a very short lived operation, unfortunately, um, given the, the um, recession and, and the impact that it had on those areas. But it, it showed again, what could be achieved in very different circumstances. But the real thing that was going on in the background to all of this was the search for the ultimate source. And I know that John will be talking about some aspects of this, so I'm not going to talk very much about it. But one of the things that, that happened in those early stages in 1910, in fact, was a geologist by the name of Ernst Reuning spent some time down on the Orange River and actually put trenches in. And he was recalled back to Luderitz by the management team before he was able to assess what those trenches might have shown. And it's, it's widely believed that 
had it had Roining been able to actually complete that piece of work, he would have been able to um, put two and two together and 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 uh, identify the Orange River for its major role that it's played in developing the, the Namibian placer deposits. Another missed opportunity was a um, Fred Cornell, who was killed in a motorbike accident in the early um, early 1900s, I think somewhere around 1916 um, in London, and it's widely believed that he was looking for, for financing to have a more in-depth look at the Orange River, but that never took place because he was, um, he was killed before he could take it forward. One man who did manage to meet his destiny was a chap called Jack Carstens. Um, his book, A Fortune Through My Fingers, was republished uh, re, um, a few years ago. And uh, it's a remarkable story, really. Uh, it's a good read. And um, Carstens didn't have a lot of time for geologists. He was very friendly with Hans Morensky and he really liked the man. But in terms of um, acknowledging that Morensky had come up with the, the oyster line theory and that he'd been ahead of the game, um, Carstens never took that seriously at all. Um, he was an out and out uh, prospector and um, not one to mince his words when it, when it came to um, other people's attempts to um, to go out and find diamonds. Um, he didn't have a lot of time for um, Fred Cornell either, but he managed to find one of the world's great alluvial deposits, marine deposits in the form of the Clancy deposits. Um, the, um, the discovery and arrangement was uh, was obviously a major breakthrough and um, initially a lot of the work was done by people with um, mule drawn um, cocoa pens and over a period of time there was quite rapid expansion again and a number of different types of technology came into play particularly with the use of bucket wheel excavators and um, those those advances took place um, through through the 1940s 1950s as you'd see in Ali's book on Di um, diamond beaches and in um, Garby Schneider's book uh, on treasures of the Sperkerbeet but at the same time as that development was happening, an interesting event occurred when the Ernest Oppenheimer Bridge was put in in 1962. The piling for that bridge never reached the bedrock. And um, of course, hindsight's perfect science, but, but it's, it's easy to say now that that was probably the first weak signal that a wacky idea like the possibility of diamonds being on the continental shelf could have been a, a, a good idea. And um, those, they, those piles went down, I think they went down over 80 meters into the bed of the river. Um, so it started to, to suggest that there might be extensions in the offshore, but it was only when a guy called Sammy Collins came to the coast, um, contracted to put a diesel pipeline in for what was called CDM then, now NAMDEB, where the fleet of, of vehicles had expanded to the point that the need for diesel fuel was enormous. And Collins was a Texan with, a, with an appetite for adventure and um, was definitely not scared of wild ideas. And he's reputed to have stood on the beach um, with some of the people, including a guy called Charles Stocken, and said to the people, well, if there are diamonds on the beaches, has anyone looked out there pointing out into the Atlantic Ocean? And that was the start of the journey that would see the transition from onshore to offshore um, exploration and the whole development of De Beers Marine 
um, and the deep water mining. The vessel that started it all was quite a humble vessel. It was just a small um, tug called the Emerson K. It was introduced in 1961. And um, the initial discovery of diamonds up in uh, Sham Ice and then in Hottentots Bay led to the very rapid expansion of the Collins Empire. Um, through an organization called the Marine Diamond Corporation. And Collins um, started uh, up in Namibia in 1961 when he was awarded licenses there. And then in 1962, he was also awarded extensive licenses for something called the Southern Diamond Corporation uh, offshore of Namekoland. Collins was larger than life. There are many stories. There's a lovely book by Roger Williams on, on Sammy Collins giving the history. And um, yeah, it's some people, it's always interesting because you get these different, different perspectives on people. Some people have stories about a, a gunslinging wild Texan. Um, and there are some remarkable pictures of Sammy Collins purportedly standing on barges halfway out of the water. Um, but at the same time, he was a man who who's, was not afraid of a challenge and he was actively involved. And a diver himself, he, um, he went and, and uh, really got into the whole thing and started to look at these deposits. Um, and it was, again, a, ca a case of rapid innovation. And uh, they chose to use mining barges that were um, built in Cape Town. And uh, the first one came in in 1962 called Barge 77. And um, they had a, a very simple approach to, to mining using a steel digging head. Um, the vessels were accompanied by a tug so that they could um, take, use the tug to um, move the anchors. And uh, the, the whole plant was on board. It was a completely integrated unit. And it was the first of the offshore diamond mining ventures. By 1963, there were three production vessels in Shamice Bay. And uh, ultimately, a number of them ran aground, sadly, with, with the result that um, some lives were lost. It was a dangerous occupation. But um, the last barge to be built was a vessel called the Pomona, an absolutely enormous unit. And that one um, came into service in 1967. It's estimated that a, more than a million carats was produced from the shallow water area in Sham between 1963 and 1971. And in 1971, um, the view was that those deposits had been depleted. But it was also a very interesting time in terms of the geological work that was being done. And perhaps um, one of the best examples of this is a paper that was published by um, Murray and Roy Joint um, and a few other people in 1970. And um, this paper came about through a, a lot of work that was done um, both by a contracted company called the o Ocean Science and Engineering Company, and also um, AAC Anglo-American Corporation in 1964 established their own oceanographic research unit. And uh, it, it consisted of a number of different people. I could only find photographs of a few of them, unfortunately. Um, Dick Foster was one of them who, who led De Beers Marine for many years. And then Tony Hockney was another. Tony had a, a real gift for um, doing wave modeling exercises and uh, was fantastic at being able to um, interpret the topographic effects on um, wave refraction and, and where to go and look for diamonds. One of the nicest models that came out at that time was a, was a, a piece of work because of the importance of gullies um, as trap sites, fixed trap sites on the seabed. One of the best pieces of work that I've ever seen done was, was published by Murray in, the, in this paper um, with his other co-workers. And uh, that summarized the development of 
um, shore platforms on the Namibian coast and it really was a beautiful piece of work and there were a number of different styles of gully were identified and you can imagine that the detailed information and the knowledge and expertise that evolved through these folk diving um, repeatedly in these deposits and mining them by hand with, with pumps was quite remarkable. Um, and that carried on into, into um, fairly recent times. And even now there are still diving operations that are active. Um, it was, a, it was, it's been estimated that Namibian production from diving operations in the near shore was somewhere around 70,000 to 100,000 carats a year, just to give you a, a feel for the scale of those operations. One of the things that, that became evident early in, in the development of the um, Namibian onshore beaches was that trap sites are really important and the nugget effect is very crucial to understand as well. And some of the best work that was done in terms of being able to deal with the difficulties of estimating the mineral resource um, was done by Tina Zusterfeld with um, Veinant Kleinkel. And you can see here, for those of you uh, living in the Overberg, uh, a more youthful version of Ronnie Hazel as well in this particular photograph, which was taken in 1989. Um, one of the things that one needs to understand, and I guess the guys will be discussing this a bit later too, is that marine diamond deposits are, are relatively low grade. They certainly don't come anywhere near the Marangi deposits that, uh, in, that were being discussed earlier in terms of um, the types of grades that, that are experienced. And uh, we're dealing with parts per billion. So sampling is really important and how you go about it. And that was always a controversial topic with people like Jack Carstens, who, whose backgrounds were very much get out there and do it and, and follow your nose and, and, and your, your, um, and your gut. Um, when, you've run, when you're running a really big operation where a vessel can cost well over a billion um, rand or Namibian dollars, you're, you're dealing with, with incredible quantities of money that need to be invested carefully and, and uh, risk has to be managed. And between Tinas and, and Vaynant, the work that they did was quite remarkable in being able to, to help to improve that process of uh, resource estimation and uh, ultimately um, the transformation into reserves. Initially on the onshore side, one meter trenches were used extensively, but those were found to be inadequate. And so 10 meter trenches were used um, ultimately to do a lot of the evaluation of the onshore deposits. And, and that was really um, driven by the need to try and intersect um, the trap sites so that you could get an idea of, uh, of the overall grade distribution in an area. But it became clear as those developments went on and the mining progressed that Namibian uh, raised beaches are quite remarkable in terms of their, um, their, their placer grades. And the, as uh, Tania was saying earlier, the quality of the diamonds is also remarkable. And so, so it was that people started to um, think about how could they extend the mining onshore to be able to reach offshore and go into the shallow water and see if those deposits really did carry on. And so the early, the early skew prism wall was invented and uh, in those days, it was, um, it was a, a very um, potentially dangerous op operation. And uh, the, yeah, the storms that hit the Namibian coast are one of the key factors in developing those diamond deposits, but they also make it extremely difficult to build sand walls and keep the keep the ocean back as Canute found. And one of the people that overcame that initial challenge was a guy called Dr. Harry Swart, a coastal engineer working for the CSIR, who really kind of laid the foundation for developing the science behind the seawall. And um, through him, 
and his team in the CSR working with the mining department in Aranyament, they were able to start to move the seawall out. And so it was that, that the seawall started to be extended as overburden was stripped. Um, the dumping of the sand and, and um, overburden onto the coastline and the use of um, quite sophisticated pumping systems allowed the Atlantic Ocean to be held back. And so the sea, the sea wall started to move out. And through that, they were able to start to access the wave cut platforms below sea level, initially pushing out to minus 20 meters below sea level. But um, when my last visit to, to um, the mining area one in, in Aranyament, uh, many moons ago now, they were actually at minus 31 meters below sea level. And it's, a, it's quite an, uh, an experience to stand in the open air under the sunshine and experience the fact that you've got the roaring Atlantic um, crashing into a seawall and that you're 30 meters underwater effectively. It's, it's, a, it's quite something to get one's head around it. And uh, the scale of the stripping operations were, were one of the things that allowed that initial development of the seawall, which began to push out hundreds of meters into the Atlantic. Um, bucket wheel excavators were introduced in the mid 70s and uh, the, the, the size of the system was increased in 1987 and then um, dredges were used as well and, it, and what's quite exciting is to see that that, that technology is now being taken forward um, by the southern coastal mining team in Namdeb and they're still getting out into, into the Atlantic. And you know, the possibility is that they may even one day go beyond 30 meters below sea level, which I find absolutely amazing. And there's some great papers by um, Stephen um, Kirkpatrick and uh, Achakul Mukendwa and a couple of others that, that I can recommend you get hold of if you're interested in having a look at that. It's quite remarkable to see the, the um, bedrock trap sites that are being uncovered. But in the 19, late 1960s, a chap called Hoyt discovered that there were some remarkable channels preserved on the continental shelf off the Orange River mouth. And he started to uh, a, a real thought that perhaps the Orange River had extended way out onto the continental shelf. And so this was the stirring of a notion and it raised doubts as to whether, or questions as to whether there might be diamonds out on the continental shelf in depths beyond where Sammy Collins could reach. And so the initial jump to deep water mining started. And um, it was in the 70s that, that the initial work was done really to go out and discover whether there was anything out there or whether that was just science fiction. And in 1994, the production offshore was about 400,000 carats a year. And today, I believe it's now over a million, but I'm sure that Urban will be talking to that in his talk. Pioneering exploration into deep water took place in, in, in the 60s. They started to push out. Um, and extended from 35 meters way out to 200 meters water depth with surveying and coring with vessels called the Rock Eater and the Ontgina. And then initially the, the, um, the excitement started when initial samples started to produce positive results. There were many negative results as well, um, which created a lot of difficulties for people like Tinas and Vaynant to get their heads around when it came to estimating the true mineral resource that's out on the shelf. But um, the, the real work then started and the delineation of the deposit and the development of the resource. And when the scale of, of the discovery was became evident, then De Beers Marine was formed in 1983. And it was through 
an engineer called DJ Van Yarsfeld, who who really threw the gauntlet down and and said, right, 1986, I believe, he said, you you either turn this operation into a production operation or we or we stop it. You can't just keep going on exploring and developing the mineral resource. We now have to make that transition into mining. And uh, and so in 1987, the Louis Murray was um, brought into operation and a number of different types of crawler unit were tested on the Louis Murray after initially trying a, a system called the traversing digging head, which, which proved to not be efficient. But as knowledge started to evolve and, and it became abundantly clear that the seabed was anything but sandy and smooth, and in fact was extremely rugged with vast quantities of head sized cobbles and boulders down on it, together with very large slabs, um, some of them in excess of 10 or 15 meters in diameter. It started to be abundantly clear that more than one type of um, mining system was going to be needed. And in 1991, the Coral Sea was purchased and um, converted from an oil exploration drill ship into a large diameter drill ship for suitable for mining. The initial test work was, was remarkable. Um, one of the big challenges proved to be actually slowing down the material that was brought up from the seabed. You can imagine when you've got cobbles the size of someone's head traveling at 15 meters per second, when it arrives on surface, slowing it down and keeping it under control is quite an interesting challenge. But the engineers tackled that and so, the real work started and um, tailoring those systems to be able to deal with these very tough conditions, which are never shown by Vibracores. Vibracores always show you nice little pebbles and it looks very easy. But when you look at side scan sonar, as you can see in this um, slide with the gray image in the background, these are big slabs of, of um, Eocene and Cretaceous sandstones lying down on the seabed. And uh, mining systems have to be able to negotiate those because those ultimately are trap sites. And um, they're very interesting places to be able to go and mine. So moving from the crawler to the drill ship, it became um, very important to be able to really determine what the conditions on the seabed were and, and what type of uh, system was going to be required in order to be able to most efficiently extract the diamonds from the coarse gravels that lie on the surface. Some of the gravels are less than a meter thick, others uh, can be up to several meters thick and depends where you are in the deposit. And so one of the challenges that my team was faced with in the late 90s was, was developing resources, but also being able to transform those resources into reserves whilst managing the risk associated with that so that the investment in ships could be um, managed appropriately, but also we could start to estimate what type of production was going to be possible. And um, we were always challenged by the fact that we needed to be within 15% of our predictions, both on a mine, both on a monthly basis, but also on an annual basis. Um, so it was very difficult to get uh, resources into the proved category. So most of the resources we were dealing with were in the probable category. And, it, and I always felt that, that the acid test was how close you could stay to the mine plan. And mine planning became more complicated as the fleet grew. Um, all of the all of the vessels were using um, chains. None of the vessels were um, using dynamic positioning, which meant that you had vast arrays of chains with anchors down on the seabed, and you had to be able to plan so that you could get the right vessel into the right area of the deposit, and and it had to be safe. And um, and so this started a process of developing quite complex linear programs to be able to support that type of work. 
And at the same time, because you, you're, you're um, separated from, from the drill bit by as much as 130 metres of, of the Atlantic Ocean, um, it became really important to look for visualisation technologies that would allow um, very close to real time monitoring of the of the actual mining equipment and there have been major advances in these areas um, over the years since since I was involved. But from a geology point of view, the early 90s was was a very challenging time because uh, we were being challenged by the mining department to be able to predict closer and closer to reality. And, um, and so we started to need to improve the way that we could do that. And uh, one, of the main, one of the main pieces of kit that we, we acquired in, in the 90s was uh, a towfish called uh, a Focus 400. And that allowed us to start to really close down our line spacing and using a surface towed um, piece of equipment, we were able to get down to line spacings of as little as 12 and a half meters. So we were one of the world's highest resolution survey teams um, working in, in the ocean environment. And one of the big challenges was to be able to move away from the initial paper records and be able to go to digital um, data and to be able to look at data visualization. And again, there have been some remarkable changes in, in how that's done. But one of my challenges was, was to get everybody calibrated, including myself, as to what we were really dealing with. And so um, in 1996, we we um, contracted Hans Fricker from the Max Planck Institute with his team to come out and um, put their Jago submersible onto the MV Zealous, our, our survey ship. And we took it out to sea and we started to do submersible dives out onto the continental shelf. Um, some of those dives went down the Cape Canyon as well, ultimately down to about 400 meters below sea level, which was a remarkable experience. But one of the neat things with the, with the Jago was that the Jago is quite small and, um, and it would fit into the sampling holes that were being drilled by the Coral Sea as much as a couple of meters or so into the seabed. So some of the geologists were able to go down and look in three dimensions at the, at the drill holes that they were putting through the deposit into the foot wall below. And, and it was a very exciting time. Um, major advances in terms of being able to understand the nature of the deposits. And, and one of the beauties of De Beers Marine was that the positioning um, for tracking the Jago was remarkably good. So we could, we could work out to within less than two meters where we were. And in one of the dives that was done by Rob Smart, the, the AGM at the time of De Beers Marine, in 126 meters of water, we, we um, found uh, uh, the Jago was actually moving around and, and on, on the surface, you could see it moving from side to side. And, and uh, actually it was, the swell coming through was actually running on the seabed in 126 meters of water. And it actually picked up the Jago and rammed it into um, a, a rocky outcrop. And it was, uh, it was stuck there for a while. And I think that was one of Rob's um, most uh, memorable experiences in, in terms of his West Coast days. For us, it was all about improving the mineral resource. The Douglas Bay was the, the main vessel that was being used for sampling. Um, but but uh, as we got more um, detailed knowledge of the resource through mining and the reserve particularly, then it became clear that we needed to improve the technology and the Coral Sea was converted into a, a, a a sampling vessel and uh, it, it, it could switch between sampling and mining and uh, the drill bit that was being used was was um, 
10 meters, uh, 10 square meters. So um, those, those started to make quite big differences in terms of the confidence in the evaluation. One of the most exciting um, projects that we undertook was to replace the Zealous. The Zealous was a 72 meter vessel. It had a crew of 56 and we replaced it with a three meter AUV. Um, and uh, it was a really neat project and it, it was really made possible by the belief of, of Brian Ainsley and Paul Dixon Savage in the, in the team that was put together. The team was led by Paul Nicholson, who I believe is, is probably retiring this year, I think. With, um, he was the lead in the geophysics department in um, De Beers Marine working for me. And we partnered with a company initially called Maridan, but renamed to Martin, um, led by a guy called Jens Pind. And it was a it was a marriage made in heaven because we had the practical skills from from the zealous of um, very, very high resolution work. And uh, Jens and his team had remarkable capability in terms of developing the AUV. And that took line spacing down to um, two and a half meters. But it also quadrupled the resolution of the data more, and, and that's been surpassed now as well. And so, as you can see by the graph here, the, the efficiency of the data acquisition just went up and up. And um, I've been looking at some of this data recently, and it's just fantastic, absolutely brilliant. So the story from a knowledge management point of view has been an interesting one. Um, one of the, I published a paper um, a few years ago, now 2014, um, looking at performance through learning. And uh, one of the things that one had noticed over the years was that there's about a 30 year cycle of knowledge and um, and development on the West Coast that, that has taken place over the years. And, um, and, and the seawall is a very good example of that. Another good example is developing in terms of the offshore at the moment with the development of initial development in the mid 80s um, of, the, of the mining fleet. Um, and some remarkable work was done in terms of technology development by um, led by Kevin Richardson and a number of other engineers and it's been absolutely brilliant to see how they've gone and it'll be very exciting to see how they go into the future so um, enjoy the rest of the talks on the west coast it's been a love affair of mine for many years and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the talk thanks very much thanks Ian that was fantastic so so Ellie's written two books when's yours coming along ah uh, no that's uh, that's that's possibly never going to happen. I should say, actually, I, I didn't show the slide, but there, there are several books that I've used in compiling this. Um, maybe I'll just show those quickly, John, if you don't mind. Um, no, go for it, please. And you can also send us, uh, you know, even images of the covers and we'll put it on the, you know, mail it to everyone. Yeah, It'd be fantastic. Yeah, I'll do that with pleasure. Um, Okay, take note, students. There's your reading material for the rest of the week. <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, it's, it, it's been interesting. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of people, sadly, that are no longer with us, and um, yeah, very hard to find pictures of all of the people that have really contributed to this talk and and the work that's been done, which which is a very sad reflection. But it's been a lovely thing to be able to go back. Started with Olga Levinson, then, then Ali with Diamond Beaches, um, which came out initially as a, as a black and white paper, um, as a soft cover. And then fortunately, Namdev commissioned her to do an up, update on that. Uh, and so I think that book might might still be available in, in the spa in arrangement, but I'm not sure. And then, of course, Garby Schneider's book, Treasures of the Diamond Coast, is a fantastic text with a remarkable amount of very useful detail. Um, Diamond People was a book that was put together by De Beers many moons ago. Glamour of Prospecting, Fred Cornell, Fortune Through My Fingers, Jack Carstens, King of Sea oh, Diamonds, wonderful. Roger Williams. Uh, Mike DeVitt features with Prospecting in Africa because there's a very neat paper by Daryl Hallam that 
that uh, really was a benchmark paper. And then um, this book, Le Performance Through Learning, is uh, where that last image was was initially published, although that's a bit out of date now. Yeah, interesting. I, I also found another copy of by the, the Bay of Diamonds by Van Diamante um, about um, the, Alex, the early days of the Alex Core deposit, which is also fascinating. I Ooh, sent that would copy be interesting. To, copy read. to Urban the other day. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll I'd be very one. interested to see that. Actually, yeah, yeah. that would be very interesting because there's not there's not a heck of a lot that's available on Alex Core. There were some really nice things um, published by Pete Cresser back yeah. in the mid '80s, but not not a lot's come out. Ian, if I may enclosure ask, uh, you never crossed uh, swords with the uh, environmentalists. <laughs> There have been lots of environmentalists, actually. One of, one of the neat things, I mean, I, I can't speak for today because I, I'm you know, no longer involved in those operations, but I know that there's a huge amount of work done both by NAMDEB and through De Beers Marine Namibia on, on the environmental side. And, and actually, the offshore recovery is quite quick. It's just a few years. And, and uh, one of the neat things with the Jago was that uh, several hundred hours of dives were done with that submersible, which sadly has recently been retired. And um, a lot of that footage was interpreted by a team in um, UWC, and uh, it's one of the best records of, of pelagic fish in the oceans. Um, so, yeah, there's been a lot done, actually, no, I mean, you have to give credit to yourselves and the beers. I mean, the work done, particularly with the Jago and on the seabed and the recovery and the, the repopulation was amazing. And um, I guess, you know, you guys were leaders in that respect. Yeah, I think a lot of it came down to um, Patty Wickens and, and a lady, I can't remember Leslie's name now, um, surname, but uh, they, they, they put together the most fantastic program. And um, yeah, that laid the foundation really for a lot of the work that's been ongoing, I'm sure. Yeah. But thanks, Ian, yeah. that was fantastic. So, and, and really think you need to give a, a bit of attention to writing up your you know, rather unique and very special um, experiences on the West Coast. No, thanks, John. You, you've, done, uh, you've done some of the hard work now for, you know, for <laughs> the presentation, so don't stop there. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm busy at the moment putting a training program together, so uh, maybe that's going to, maybe that will evolve, we'll see. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the to the graveyard session on a winter's day. Um, what I what I hope to to share today with you is a compilation from Mike and I, Mike DeWitt and myself, and it's really based on lots and lots of, of history and work done back twenty plus years ago, and and sort of evolved into what we like to believe is a is an understanding of the West Coast marine places of, of Southern Africa. And there, there are really two, two aspects to it. There's an older one, which is down in the Macroland, which we've over the years studiously ignored because of uh, not really uh, solving it too well, not to say that we've done it yet, but uh, we've kept on it until John first I got on my neck and said, listen, you will do something on it this time. So uh, you're going to get a rendition of it. It'll have a few people up and up in arms and kicking, I'm sure. And the second one is the more conventional uh, Spurgebiet Megaplasser. They're both megaplasters in their own right. And uh, so what I'll do is I'll just run through a couple of definitions. Tanya's already covered a bit for me, which is great, Tanya, thank you. Look, have a quick look at the source to sink model. And then we'll tackle the Namakoland Placer first. It's the older one. It certainly has its origins back in the Cretaceous and just been kick into shape during this during the uh, Cenozoic and then we'll move on to the to the Spurgebiet Plaza which is at least twice as big as the uh, as the uh, Namaqua land one. As I mentioned <clears throat> there are lots of people that have contributed to this over the years. The geos on both sides of the river down in Clain Seaway and uh, and in Ronyman side 
And um, <clears throat> we were certainly encouraged to apply a lot more scientific rigor by the late Brian Black, who joined us in the, in the early 90s and stayed on until about 2008. So <clears throat> with that, I'll move on if I can. Thanks, Tanya. And basically, you know, the, the megaplaster definition came about from a paper that Brian sort of coerced Mike and I to join him on 2005, where we decided, and I guess it was almost Vinkat in a way, because we'd been working on the West Coast for so long, and it's such a fantastic placer, that we, we set a target, which was quite a big bar. I know Mike has shaken his head at me a few times, saying that a megaplaster is an alluvial diamond deposit that has at least 50 million carats in it, preferably having produced 50 million carats to show that it has it there. As Lyndon said, you only know once you mine it and um, <clears throat> at 95% GM quality. So, you know, things like uh, Aquatia, Morangi, who've done the 100 million ticket, don't make it because they're sitting down there in the less than $20 a carat realm. They're certainly not GM, GM pluses. So that's really, and there, there are two of them. And if you look down there in the bottom left, you'll see the Namakulan placer, somewhat restricted. It sits down from the Olifants River, in fact, actually from Bambus Bay, and uh, a little bit further south. And it goes up to, to just south of, to, to just, sorry, just north of, of Port Jolly, Port Nolith. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty much restricted in terms of the north-south distribution. And, uh, and they both passes are restricted in east-west limit, basically because of the, uh, the, the, the littoral setting. In contrast, the Spurkebeet Mega Plaza, which comes about 20 k's, kicks in about 20 k's south of the Orange River, around about Pocock Bay, it tails up in good form to about Hottentot Bay, which Ian mentioned, a Pomona mined up there in the offshore. Goes there past Meob and Conception Bay. And we've even found the indicator class right up the skeleton coast, nearly a thousand kilometers along the Namibian coast. So it's a different beast. That's Perkebeet Mega Plaza. As I said, it's it's done its hundred million plus, but it's done it at today's terms anyway, around about five hundred dollars a carat. And uh, the size ranges from that two forty six that Ian showed. That's the biggest stone on the north bank, the right bank of the Orange River. Two hundred eleven and a half carat is the biggest on the south bank on the Alex Core side. And both those stones are characteristic of the Kimberley Pool as were many of the big stones that came out and down around the mouth of the Orange River. But these tailed up right up into the skeleton coast, where obviously <clears throat> the, the question of the dry kick comes into being again, or whether these really are the tail of these Furkebeet Mega Plaza. Thanks, Tanya. So what's really is just a quick definition of a plaza. It's really the mechanical concentration, it's the physical processes, very little chemical processes involved, chemical processes of a manual concentration of heavy minerals in sedimentological processes. You see it in, in, in all sorts, Be beaches in particular, aeolian settings and river settings, river being the most common, of course, around the world. And if we have a look at the diamonds, we tend to, we tend to just lump our so-called alluvials as alluvials, but in actual fact, in reality, they really are placer deposits. And because of that, they, there's a little hierarchy of placer deposits that, that we'll discuss shortly. The SG of a diamond is not particularly heavy when you think about it compared to tin and cassiterite and gold and those sorts of things, certainly gold anyway. And you're know, sitting down there 3.5, 3.52. But it's the wettability of, of diamond or the, the lack of wettability of diamond that's, that's intrigued a lot of people to think that that might contribute to its placer forming ability. Next slide, please, Daniel. And so we've had this from Tanya. Basically, she explained very clearly why you want to be in alluvials in terms of an upgrade in your quality. I think there's little doubt that Let Seng showed us a good example. Angola are the excellent examples. And even though it takes a long time, Tanya down the Sankuru River, but we actually dredged 110 kilometers 
downstream from Buji Mai two years ago into COVID. And uh, the improvement was amazing, but it wasn't, it went from say $7 a carrot to $12 a carrot. But it was still an improvement nonetheless. Okay, next slide, thank you. Cover that. All right, so as I said, you know, the, the pluses can really be looked at in terms of in terms of a source to sink type approach, particularly if you look at it in, in, in the African setting. We know that our, most of our good primary sources are associated with, with the African cratons and so and the margins thereof. And um, <clears throat> and so we recognize craton, we recognize places that are developed on the craton. And because cratons tend to be somewhat buoyant, they tend to bob up. Although they have some few topography, they tend to bob up. And so diamonds do tend to leak out of them if they're given the opportunity through river, rivers and the like. And we have proximal reach passes in on the craton. As you pop up the craton and you leak off the side of a craton, you go through the origin, which tend to be fringed with orogenic belts, sometimes somewhat mountainous, but mostly subdued because of the erosion in Africa. The passes are termed transient. In other words, they're in process of moving from those proximal, more stable areas down to a sink, which is invariably the, the ocean, the surrounding ocean. That's the, the lowest zero sea level or whatever a surveyor would like to put on it. And that thing brings us to the coastal plain, the littoral tract, where we we call the call the places terminal because that's basically the end point that they've reached. And so if we have a look at the proximal reach places, we have retained places and transient places on, on a craton. The retained places referring to those that are held up or locked up on a craton itself. And through the transient, uh, uh, through, through the mid-reach and uh, uh, between the craton and the and the, uh, the source and the sink. We have transient places, tend to be the rivers mostly. And when you get down to the distal, distal reach places, which are usually on the coastal plain, down in the subdued topographies of coastal plains and zero sea level, then we talk, talk about the terminal places. So let's have a quick look at some of the examples of those. Let's start with the proximal reach places. And, you know, obviously the most proximal that you're going to get is stuffing material back into a, kim into a kimberlite pipe. And there's some excellent examples that have been taken through with Herman Glitter last week and Bill raising it. And uh, Herman, those are the uh, basal, the coarse module deposits at Katoka in the late 90s, huh, by the way. So that's what the basal breccia looked like on the edge. And then towards the center of Kamutri, that's what it looked like, pretty fine grain, just like Williamson and Madui. But of course, you can't really build up a mega plaster in that. Well, you can, you can, you can certainly rework and, and put shovel a lot of your your, your kimberlite stones back into the hole, but you're not going to be able to upgrade it to 95% gem quality. Thanks, Tanya. So the other way that we that we retain places on the on the craton is that they're often platform carbonates. They cap a craton. And we certainly have a good example in the Transvaal, the Transvaal in, in, in South Africa where the carbonates out there in the Lichtenberg Bakerville area, where Mike did a lot of his work, they form sinkholes. And those sinkholes um, trap material that's going over. And Mike's given a very good paper on the Lichtenberg area, and this being linked to the, to, to the Dwyker. And, uh, and I think it's really excellent. We've got a whole series of ages of, of sinkhole development here, and they just lock the stones on, the, on, the, on that craton. You just can't get them out of those holes. And the gentleman standing in, the, in a filled hole on the right there used one of Mike's surveys back from his, his geological survey days. And he actually found a virgin hole. And the guys got out 80 CPHT, which confirmed Alex de Toy's 1930s estimation of the, uh, of the grades in some of these holes, some of the older parts of the sinkholes on, this, on, these, uh, on these platform carbonates. Thanks, Tanya. So, so, oh, sorry, and obviously a sinkhole is not likely to really, although we had lots of carrots, 12 million odd carrots coming out of that part of the world, we certainly didn't get, get, uh, get to, to mega plaster status out of that. But the, the formation or the intracratonic uh, basins do have the volume to do it. And Tanya 
elegantly pointed out the Kalonda formation up in Angola, Quango across the border in DRC. And uh, the, certainly this, is, this has the volume up to, to be able to head towards mega placer status, but not always the, the quality of stones. It has the size in stones, but there often isn't the same upgrade in the Kalonda, at least in the, in the areas that I've seen. It tends to be close to, to proximal sources, right close to them, so you get a bigger spread of your population, in spite of the upgrade that happens within five, 10 kilometers of primary source. Thanks. In connection, it's just a model. I mean, Tanya's taken us through that as well. This is just a summary that we saw up in Angola back there. So, so again, it's your, your local sources hidden under that, that cover, and it's the streams that open that up and bring it into the modern rivers that make it even more exciting. And that's the big difference, just to reinforce what Tanya mentioned, you know, in, in London. And our, our higher terraces, our older terraces in South Africa are the richer ones because they were closer to the action back around about the uplift at the end of the Cretaceous. And that's really where Angola and, and DRC seem to be sitting today. They are busy gathering the stones out of the primary sources, out of the close secondary deposits, the Kalonda Formation, Kranga Formation, and shoving them into the, into the modern rivers, which are taking them down, down towards the, the Atlantic Ocean. And it's interesting, we, we found diamonds on the Kasai River, a thousand kilometers down from the, from the, uh, the Chikapa Triangle, but they were like sugar. And that's what you'd expect. And that's what we saw in, this, in, in the Spurka Beat as well. The first pulse that comes down, your finer grain, and later, of course, the grain material comes through. But we'll discuss that later. Thanks, Daniel. Right, so let's, <clears throat> let's just recap on that then. So basically, we've got ourselves a source, it's on the craton, we've got proximal places up there. They tend to park off, sometimes they escape. And when they do, it's down by river systems to, to a sink, which is usually your terminal places on a coastal plain. Okay, thanks then. So that transient placer is also an interesting one because it doesn't really develop much in terms of volumes. If you think of Mike's numbers that he's got, Lyndon's numbers that they've got out of the, out of the river terraces down the, down the Orange and the Val and Elgrin's work all the way down through to about Prisca and then as Lyndon says, they tend to disappear. That's because there's an acceleration down the slope to the sea. So these transient places tend to be quite thin and they don't build up again big volumes. So you're not easily gonna make a mega placer in a transient situation. So these are the ones on the Reet River and the Val. Yeah, Lyndon gave us good examples of the stones that came out of that today. Thank you. Right, and then, <clears throat> and then we move ourselves down onto the next round. Thanks, Daniel. Oops. And that is, what then are the main points that would allow us to develop a diamond mega placer? And obviously we use the West Coast as, as, the, as the geological background to build the model with Brian back in the mid 2000s. And there are really some salient points which you need to, need to consider. You need to have that, that source area it has to be pretty fertile. It's great if it's been hit through geological time because the chances then that you can accumulate diamonds in that subdued topography that makes up our African cratons. So the long history, for example, on the carp file, it's a good one. We go from, from the Kuruman ages, 17 odd, 100, through Cullinan, around about 1200, to the, uh, to the Martins Drift, 1100, and well, that's part of the 1200, I guess, into, into Zim. And, uh, and then the, the Venetia Age and uh, Colossus, Kimberlites in, in Zim, by, uh, uh, River Ranch and those ones. It add up around about the 500, just, just prior to the Dwyker coming in at 300. We've obviously then got that gap and we get ourselves into the, into the group twos and the group ones at group twos at around about 110 to 120 odd. And Goldus, it's around about 130 to 108 thereabouts. And um, 
And then, of course, the, the last pulse in the late Cretaceous at 85. So there's, there's a really good, good example of, you know, of, of pulses, of Kimberlite intrusions or activity. And then you don't really want to keep on bouncing your craton up too much and stripping off after each pulse. You want to have some way of accumulating it, either in intracratonic basins or even keeping the Kimberlites preserved, like Cullinan, Venetia, the older ones, as well as the younger ones. And then you'd like to, to upgrade and, and, and prepare that, that, that diamond pile that's accumulating on that craton. So the craton, the source area gets, you know, gets, has its own little manifestations to build up a diamond pile that you want to then be able to sh shuffle through and off its buoyant platform down to a sink. And obviously, the logical way that we remove it, apart from ice, which tends to not concentrate, but rather just remove and disperse, as we heard earlier. So the better way to do it is to take it off through a river system, a fluvial system. And this is what we certainly see in Africa. Most of our, our places are active places. They don't have to be mega places to make money. Most of our active places are in the river systems. And a lot of them are actually in the, in the, within the drainage basins that are going from the source towards some form of terminal placer. So you want your drainage basin to have a high percentage of its cover on, that, on the craton, preferably on, on the diamondiferous part of your craton, because obviously they're big chunks of craton that are not, don't have kimberlites or primary sources. And you want to have some form of that drainage basin. After you've sort of had a chance to build up a bit of a diamond pile, a stash as it were on your craton, you want, you want that drainage basin to be activated, to be uplifted so that it gets some energy to then strip that craton, to take those stones off the craton and move them down towards an endpoint which would be your terminal placer. And preferably that incision tract is fairly steep, fairly narrow. So you, you don't build up, you don't hook up your stones on the way to the terminal placer. You want to get as much down as possible. And in doing that, particularly if you're dealing with bedrock and size systems, as you mostly are in Africa now, even in Angola and, and DRC, they've cut through the cover, through the uh, Cenozoic and, and, and Kalonda Cretaceous cover, they're sitting in mostly Archean bedrock or on the marginals in the, the Maumee quartzites or those sort of Bembe quartzites on the margin of the cratons. You want them to be in hard rock so that they beat the heck out of your poor quality diamonds. And Lyndon, I think that answers some of the questions when you see what happens to the, to the lower orange and you had a whole lot of Nama quartzites in both in the Macroland and the Spurgebiet in the last 150 kilometers of this river. You're just adding a ball mill at the end of a river when it's supposed to be heading towards a quiet time of its life. And it doesn't quite happen when you've got a, got a hard uh, Cambrian quartzite to, to be thrown into your system. So you want, you want some sort of ball milling that'll then upgrade the quality of your diamonds, get rid of the poorer quality diamonds and leave you with a good plus 90%, plus 95% gem quality stones by the time you even get to your terminal placer. And those that do survive into the terminal placer that are a bit weak, and you want that terminal placer to have a high enough energy to, to not only fractionate the sediment, but also to knock out the rest of your lower quality stones. And you want some way to segregate that sed sediment. You really have to, to separate the sediment when it gets to the river mouth. You don't want it to end up in a big ugly delta like you see up in the Arctic Circle and those sort of places where there's just lumps of sediment parking off in the Arctic. In those, uh, in those areas up there, you actually want some, some action on your coast. And you want to be able to separate that system, the, the, those sediments. You want to take out the gravels, you want to take out the sand and the muds, preferably in those three very crude sedimentary fractions, and park your gravels close to the coast where they're easily accessible. They can trap your heavy minerals, preferably your diamonds. And you want to be able to take the sand fraction away in a longshore drift and the mud can go off over the continental edge, over the slope, and turbidites and such like. You, want, you basically need to separate those things out. In other words, do your overburden stripping for you by nature. So that, those are the sort of main points that you, that you need to think about. And in doing that, in sitting on a terminal placer, 
you don't really want to have a subsiding basin all the time because all that's going to do is accumulate all the all your goodies with the muck on top of it and you'll never be able to access them properly so you want to have a relatively buoyant stable shelf at the sea the eustatic sea level changes that we've seen over the last oh, since the Cretaceous anyway, and, and even well, back through geological time. So whatever time you're dealing with, whatever part of the geological record you're dealing with, there's an opportunity for the eustatic changes in sea level to rake that shelf and move it and, and, and upgrade your, your sediment. So those are the sort of key ele elements that you need to then make it a, a diamond placid. So the easiest place to make a, a, a mega placid is down in the terminal placer because you've given all the goody, all your good work, good stones should have made it to the end. And, and if they're not, then they get beaten in, in, in the terminal placer until they are good. And that's the difference between the Morangi stones and, 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 and the they, they went into a very nice terminal placer, but the energy was, was not that good that, that it knocked out the stones. And also your source makes a difference. Here you, you have, it looks like you have sources that have a higher quality of, 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 of poorer stones on, in there. But anyway, coming back to, to this situation, so this is, this is what we would consider to be a diamond mega placer. As I say, the, the bar is quite high. 50 million carats is a lot of carats. 95% gem quality is even a higher bar. And that we might have to revise at some stage because it might be asking a bit much for most of the rest of the world that does have 50 million carat deposits lying, lying in there within their boundaries. Right, so let's now take a squiz at what, we, what the West Coast really looks like then. Thanks, Tanya. And <clears throat> we'll just come back to this one. And there it is, there's our Namakoland Megaplasa, mostly Cretaceous origin, Mesozoic origin, kicked into shape in the Cenozoic, and our Spurkebeet Placid. We'll kick off with, the, with a quick look at some of the differences, key differences between the two. Thanks, Tanya. One, one thing is they both come from the same source. They're both coming out of the Carvalho Craton. I don't think there's too much doubt there. There might be a little bit of the Zimbabwe Craton thrown in as well through the Dwyker. There might be a little bit of something else with the Nama, but that seems to have mostly come out of, out of the Dumara. So really you're dealing with a carb vol type source. So what then are the class that go down into those, into those places? What are they really like? Because as Lyndon said, the dam is just a pebble, eh? and it is just a pebble. It's part of your class assemblage that goes down. And it moves from your source areas where you have your bigger stones down to your, down to your terminal places, your stone size tends to decrease unless you do something to that source and you, you change its, its energy opportunity. And <clears throat> so it's quite interesting, I think, to have a look at the Namakoland Plaza compared to the Spurkebeet one in terms of the sources that they've tapped and the opportunities that they've had presented to them in terms of the diamond input into their class assemblages. Right, next one. Okay, so just, just having a look at some of the differences, not, it's not, it's not uh, exhaustive at all. First year, there's an age difference. So you know what it's like if you're older, it doesn't always go as well as if you're younger, but that can also be vice versa. So Namakalan Plus is a bit older. It was put in place in the Cretaceous, but it was certainly upgraded during the Cenozoic. Whereas the Spurkeby Plus wasn't around wasn't, there wasn't even an origin in that direction that we can see anyway. And it really only developed in the Cenozoic, probably from about 45 in the year seen onwards. Okay. The Macron Plaza, as I mentioned, is pretty short, pretty tight, laterally restricted along the coast in a north-south direction, whereas the Spurkeby Plaza is really quite a monster. It goes up the coast about a thousand kilometers, if you believe in class assemblage studies. The Spurkeby Placer, also, both Placers are classic in the sense that they have resistate siliceous class in them. They also have diamonds, which are the other resistate mineral, and they have zircons. But the Namakoran Placer is a super mature one, and that is dominated by quartz, diamond, and zircon. That's, <clears throat> that's quite, 
quite interesting. Just about anywhere where you look there, you'll see that it's it's a quartz rich plaza. It doesn't have a heck of a lot of other exotics as it were. Whereas in this Verka beat, if you have a look at that little pile over there, that's from the Eocene shoreline at Ice and Kessel Klippenbucker at 170 meters. And there's quite a mix of class types in there. We can track all those class types back into the catchment of the Orange River, right up to Luchtenberg, the Drakensberg, the Uppington area. It's really been quite, quite good fun. And JJ certainly done it. Jürgen Jacob, that is, has certainly done a fantastic job in that in his PhD. So th there's a mixed assemblage in, in that Svirkabit Plaza. There's a lot more action going on there, or at least a lot more additional action. Whereas in the, in the Namakulay, if there was action in that Plaza, it certainly wasn't to the same degree, and it's been upgraded to a super mature one. There's a funny bird seed gravel, Ian will know it well, and those who worked in Namakulay, that's got a, a bit of a signature of the interior in it as well. But it's a very small, it's a grit size fraction, it's not in your pebbles. Okay. In, in terms of the actual size of the megaplaster itself, the Macolan, certainly back 20 odd years ago when we put it together, had only done 42 million carats total that we could find. But, you know, give, give it as due, there's leftover stuff. It's, uh, people have worked since then, the last 20, 25 years. So we'll give it 50 million carats and we'll pop it into the megaplaster stable, just. Okay, the average stone size in, in the Macland is also a lot smaller than it is in the Spurkerbeet, but the population is much better sorted. Very interesting. So you've got small diamonds, well sorted, parked off down the Macland, whereas the Spurkerbeet has a much bigger SFD, or size diamond size frequency distribution, than its smaller cousin further south. And I think that that in itself, we'll discuss them in, in the history. And it's got twice as many carrots, plus a heck of a lot more to come. I mean, Ian alluded to the advantages and the, uh, the advances in the, in the offshore, and there's certainly a lot more, a couple of hundreds sitting out there on the, on the continental shelf. Thank you. Ah, sorry, just before you go, Tanya, just, sorry, just go there. I'll just go there. One of the big changes that's come about in the last few years is, is, is a resurrection of, of of bits, the geologist bits who worked for Anglo in, in the, in the Spurgebiet and were sent to Angola in the 1930s. And a good geo out of, out of uh, Namibia, Roger Swart, has been working in Southern Angola for a long time now, and Namibia for a long time. And he's recognized that there's a, there's a, a late Cretaceous, well dated late Cretaceous shoreline in Angola. And he's been able to extend all the way down the West Coast at about 570 meters. And that's the red line that's shown on this, on this image over here. That red line is a 570 meters. It's a, it's a late Cretaceous shoreline, which, is, which has some quite interesting implications for us and for a better understanding of what's happening along this coast. Next slide, then. So this late Cretaceous shoreline is between 75 and 65 million years, well dated in Angola. We don't have any remnants of Cretaceous onshore in the, along our coast, in either the, except for Vanderfeld 4, which is a bit older than this, 85 million, Santonian in age, in the, in the Spurkebeet itself. So we don't have, have a, like a, a hardcore golden spike to pin it on, but we do have a, a, a geomorphological signature. It comes all the way down the coast. And that's what Roger's shown in this image over here, all the way down, and then opposite the Orange River, you can see there's the Kudu Delta. You can see the, the continental shelf bulges out there. And that's part of the a late Cretaceous outfall from the Paleo Orange. It's topped over by this, late, by this 75, 65 to 75 million year old shoreline. Whereas further south, when you come opposite the Canoes Fluctor in, in in the Macoland, on the Clip Bay, there's another delta there, but it's a sand dominated one. And it's a lower Cretaceous, recognized by Sukho earlier workers. And what's interesting about that, that one, it's, it's got a date of around about 120 to 100. The tighter dates show about 115 to 95. So there's a little bit of, but what is interesting is that that delta in the south is also obviously therefore much older than the late Cretaceous shoreline. So 
what could have made that, late, that early Cretaceous Honda Clip mature sand dominate delta? And that looks like the Karoo River has been postulated by Mike and, and, and worked on by him. I know there's a lot of disbelief in certain quarters, and we certainly have heard that in, in the various talks, and that's fair enough, not a problem. But one has to account for that delta, sand delta in the offshore. Lots of fossil wood, which was thought to be a forest. But if you worked up in some of the big rivers in Africa, then they debouch into the coast and they drain tropical forest or subtropical forest areas. They dump a lot of wood into the, into the inshore area. So I think that's something to worth revisiting that Ian Stevenson and Marion Bamford worked on all those years ago. Might be worthwhile having a look at that again. But essentially what's, what's important is that there's an early Cretaceous offshore. It matches what would be the Karoo River outfall. Why, do, why, why, why are we that confident on that? Well, it's interesting because the late Cretaceous shoreline would then go over the top of that. And by then, the Karoo River had been switched off anyway because the outfall was up at the Kudu Delta. So you've got to just think about this. The Karoo came out, made the Honda Clip Sandy Delta, let's call it that, and then it switched off. But before it switched off, It didn't have a chance to enjoy the Kimberley Pulse or the, or the Group 1 late Cretaceous 85, 90 million year old pulse because the diamonds that had been dated out in Immaculate by, Phillips, by Dave Phillips and Jeff Harris back in 2008, they published a paper in that, are all pre Kimberley age. The Group 2s, the Intra Karoos, there's the classic pre 500s, and there's the older. Cullen and type ages in that lot. But they are pre Kimberley. And that's what's critical, I think, to understand that. So the outfall is then going to be largely stripping the Karoo, giving us a sandy delta, probably getting rid of a lot of the upper Karoo sands and the basalts, because between Finch and Kimberley, we actually get rid of the basalts. Finch is a group two at 118 million. Kimberley's 85, 87, or thereabouts, call it 90, round it off. No Drakensberg basalts in there. They are in coffee and they're there in Jaggers, but they're not in Kimberley Pool. And so that basalt, is, that Karoo cover has gone to the west, obviously. And, and therefore, the, 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 the sources for the Karoo River might have included a lot of the group two Kimberlites that have been eroded. These are the first foot age, the, the Helam age. Jim Davis is going to talk to us later this week. And at Lace and such like Finch, those stones, those group twos are mostly not big stone producers either. They produce good quality small stones. Well, Finch is a bit of an ex exception there, but the other, there's a lot of good, good quality group two stones coming down. And if you've got a sand sized delta, then you're not going to be bringing down a heck of a lot of coarse gravel in that. Doesn't appear to be much coarse gravel down in the Nuakulad, except around the Ulifants, and that might have been something that's tapping the Dwyker escarpment near Luris Fontaine. So we've got we've got a fine diamond population coming down that gets cut off, gets starved after that Karoo River gets captured or switched. Whatever happens to it, it goes north. Those sediments that were coming from the interior, South Africa, then go end up going into the Kudu Delta further north. And you end up in the Macalad with a starved situation in terms of an input and a, and a late Cretaceous shoreline that is today sitting at 570 meters and is younger than the Karoo than the Kudu Delta. Thank you. We want to get our head around. So th there's the red, the red line. So what, what do we see down on the on the uh, on the Namakalan coastal plain? Well, for a long time, there was a belief that the clay channels, Koinyas and these. These are fairly rich clay channels. We're talking about several thousand CPHT and ones that have been mined by Transex in recent, more recent years and, and the De Vere's activities in Koinus and Swatinkis. And these are all believed to be Cretaceous. But the work that Sue de Villiers and Anne Cadman did on the pollen there showed that, yeah, they, were, they are Cretaceous forams and, and fossils in there. But the palinomorphs are actually a legacy in an age. So that's an interesting one. So these clay channels that are up to quite buried, some 70, 100 meters deep and such like. Diamondiferous, 
has been well proven in a number of places, Mitchell's Bay, New Somnus, Salt Linkies, well-established clay channel, rich placid, are therefore not Cretaceous actually. They're actually post Eocene in age. And that makes a lot of sense because you've now got a starved situation, Cretaceous shoreline up there, 40 odd, you know, roughly uh, 20 odd million years of exposure to wash, to get rid of that Cretaceous or rework that Cretaceous material, put it into the Eocene high at 170 meters, which is the base of the escarpment, a lot of the base of the escarpment in the Macroland, and it runs up into the Spurkebeet. And then we have the Oligocene regression, which is a long regression, somewhere from 42, 45 million years, about a 9 million year old regression, 9 million year long regression. And therefore you expose that continental, that coastal plain to subaerial processes, which are largely going to be fluvial, of course. And in the Macroland, these exploited the, the bedrock structures that were seen in the, the macrometamorphic gnosis. And up at Elizabeth Bay, we see early Miocene fills and drainages that were going out to minus 110 meters offshore. So it looks like we can match the, the, the northern Spurkebeet with the, the central, the Macroland area on these buried old channels that in the south are dated with pollen to at least Oligocene in age. I think that's quite an interesting one. And then, <clears throat> so I think that, that to me, Adds to the adds to the cutoff puzzle over here. So you're reworking quartz rich, diamond rich, zircon rich deposits again and again. Thanks. So here's, a, here's a, an example, probably one of the last ones that that that, that have just been mined and, and and are still exposed. This is down Mitchell's Bayway. Here's the clay channel at the bottom. You can see the see the the channel shape very very clearly. It's clay fill. Um, Lake Pino Bonacorsi, it was his team in the late 1960s that discovered Coinas. And as he said, when he came into camp one night, the paraffin lamps was still on 10 o'clock at night. He thought that's very odd. There's a guy who's living in a little wooden hut in. He tried to work out what the heck was going on. And they were still counting the diamonds from one of those Coinas 68, 69 channel samples or Swatinki's file, Swatinki 7 channel. 3000 CPHT, very high grade, and just almost pure. Quartz and diamond. And obviously, if you look in the finds, we found the zircon. These are then on left and they're covered, they've been blanketed by the, by the late Cenozoic marine eustatic changes. Here's the 90 meter Miocene, here's the 50 meter marine that's gone over the top, 30 meter. The 50 and the 30 meter are distinguished by the Onyx, the Onyx um, these are white muscle zone fossils. In this particular photograph, that's, a, that's the thick shelled. Stonex Rogers eye, which is a characteristic of the 30 meter marine. Stonex Horton eye is the zone fossil down the 50 meter marine. So it's a nice thick sandy package over a lot of these clay channels and it's only in certain parts that you can access them and get down to them. Thank you. Right. Okay, so you don't read all the buff that I've got in the top there. I just put it there because I had to put it down somewhere. As I said, John was on my neck about putting out something on the macro land. The basic principle in the Macroland is you have a Karoo River coming down in the early Cretaceous, makes a nice sandy delta out there, brings down a, a finer population of 95% gemstones by the time it's been through the mill a few times. You then cut that source of diamonds off before Kimberley could contribute to this part of the West Coast. And that's the key. You don't see big octaves, yellow cape octaves down, parking off down here. You might get the odd one that comes out of Blyco, that sort of thing. But you don't see the main pulse. The main pulse is well sorted, small diamonds, average 0.25 carats a stone or thereabouts. But what you do see, two places on the 570 escarpment, one on the N7 on the way to Cape Town, which is mined by the late Eugene O'Clock, sitting above, sitting above the classic escarpment, 200 meter escarpment, around about 500 odd meters. And there was another place that, again, the late Pino Bono Corsi told me in, in the, up in the Buffles, they were puzzled as to why they found diamonds in a sample at 500 odd meters. And there's no answer to that. And we believe we now got the answer at 570 meter, Lake Cretaceous shoreline. So those are two examples I think we need to think about. And then after that, it's just cut the supply off and that Cretaceous population gets reworked in the Eocene, gets dispersed again in the Oligocene, 
runs into the Miocene, the 90 meter, runs into the 50, runs into the, into the, uh, into the 30 meter, and then into the RETs, the recent emergent terraces from six, eight meters downwards to the Holocene eye at five, at one and a half meters, 5,000 years ago. And therefore, the observation that Helen made in 1959 in that paper is actually quite interesting, quite valid, of course, when he pointed out that the diamond sizes tapered off northwards from nearly all the Namakoland rivers. Quite odd that. But I think it's explainable or explicable by looking at it, redistributing across the coastal plain and then popping into the, into the current longshore drift, which has been going for a long, long time. We know that at least since the, since the Eocene, the longshore drift has been to the north under a southerly wind regime. And in fact, the Kudu Delta, Roger Swart's work, he's updated the Kudu uh, interpretation of the Aeolianites there, and he believes that those are north of directed uh, uh, um, sand spits, but still nonetheless implying a, a long-lived southerly wind regime along this west coast. So that's, a, that's an Amakoland mega placer and with a foot on my neck, and I'm sure there are lots of people that'll be jumping up and down and saying, oh, I didn't give the Norma enough attention, I didn't give the Dweiker enough attention. Well, they must put it into perspective as well, I think, as to what's sitting out there in terms of the field evidence at the moment, and the dating evidence is quite crucial on that. So let's move to the Spurkebeet, to the Mega Plaza. So we cut off Namaqualand, we still have our 570, and now we're going to move down below the 570 mark. We're going to move into the Kudu and if, Jeff, and if you look to the west of this, where the, where the, the Macroland Placer is and the Spurkeby Placer, you can see from that different shade blue that you've got a broad continental shelf here, much broader than anything along the east coast of Southern Africa. And that broad shelf is important because that is also part of the repository of stones that end up on the shelf in these eustatic sea level changes. Thank you. Right, so let's have a look at the red line in the Spurgebiet. Didn't really have to do too much because there weren't any diamonds coming down at that time for it to worry about. Because the Kudu Delta is a muddy delta. It doesn't have virtually any core, any core stuff in it at all. I don't know because I logged some of those holes in, in 1986 and 1988 when I, when, when I was working for the server. And it's a mud dominated package. Bit of sand in it, those sand spits, bit of aeolianite, maybe back barrier thereabouts, but by and large, a fine grain sequence. And the age of that, late Cretaceous. It's younger than the Hondaclip Bay Crew River outfall, and it's a fine grained, doesn't seem to have any indication of coarse gravels or coarse material on it. And the 570 meter goes across the coastal plain, and I think it's very interesting because you can track that all the way up and the only bumps that are sitting to the west of, of the of the um, of the of, of the uh, 570 are, are the Klingon Mountains, which themselves are around about 40, 45 foot million years, much younger. Okay, All right, thanks. So, what proxy proof do we have of how big that Kudu Delta? How big was the, the system feeding into that Kudu Delta? Well, it's interesting that the lower reaches of the Orange River today from the Richtersfeld, in other words, from roughly the escarpment across the coastal plain, has a meander, meander belt, a roughly 10 kilometer wavelength on it. Now that's a, that's a damn big meander wavelength. And you don't just get those formed in bedrock like you see there. Those are branded into bedrock through uplift and downward incision of a river system that pre-existed the uplift. To have wavelengths about that, that big, you need to have a catchment of approximately a million square kilometers. It's a big catchment. That means that river was tapping deep back into the interior of South Africa at the time of the Kudu Delta. It wasn't bringing coarse material down at this part. It was a proper meandering system going into a nice big delta. Thanks. Next shot. So if we have a look at the current catchment in blue of the Val Orange and the fish, which is part of the, the drainage system, coming out of the Aronjumut, it sits at just 850 odd 
thousand square kilometers. So it's just under the million square kilometers that's needed to, to match those, those meander wavelengths. So quite interesting that. The other interesting thing about it is that if you look carefully, all those little dots that are there, the colored ones, greeny colored ones, are all kimberlites, parakimberlites, such like. The yellow dots in the interior is the passive deposit that Pierre de Jacher spoke to us about earlier today. That's the Karoo shoreline sitting at 1360 meters today. And the Spurgebiet sitting down at zero to 170 meters up at the ESE. And the pink line that you see through there is actually the Carvel Craton. 36% of the drainage area of the Val Loring system sits on the Carvel Craton. Now, the second best after that in the world is the Lena system on the Elden Craton in, in Russia. Congo, which, which is our mighty second mightiest river and all the rest, only sits on 10% of Craton. So this Vol Orange system has got quite a head start on all the other drainages, draining cratons in the world. And it, those cratons, and that part of the craton, as you can see, has an awful lot of kimberlites on it. And they range in age from 85 right the way through to 1700 in that particular catchment. Plus, you have access to Dwyker. You have access to the, to the Dwyker and Eka deposits in the northwest uh, uh, um, uh, Northwest, the Northwest Province uh, um, Bloom of Triangle uh, uh, alluvials. You have access to the Luchtenberg as well in there. And we found class of Luchtenberg in this Val orange drainage catchment right down at the coast. And that's why Lyndon class assemblage he showed us at the end of his talk today is very interesting because there are only a few places where those couple of stones come from, as Jürgen Jacob pointed out. Right, thanks. On. So, if we take a bit of a cartoon view of it, and we have a look at look at that. Following that 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 high standard, five seventy, there was an apogenic uplift of the subcontinent, and that's why Southern Africa stands much higher than most of the other places in Africa. It really does stand high. And because it, it was now about a kilometer to a kilometer and a half difference over much of the Carval back down to the Atlantic Ocean, the pre existing Orange River that was feeding the Kudu Delta just got branded into the bedrock, cut through the Karoo, went into the underlying older units, whether they be Fenter's Door, whether they be orogenic belts on the edge around the margin, the Kais, the Macrometamorphic. The Richtersfeld just sliced through it. And in doing so, it locked a single outlet from the Craton to the West Coast. So we had a source, of lots of Kimberlites in it, including now the Kimberley, Kimberley contingent. And I, and I say Kimberley contingent, I, I mean that because it's the group one Kimberlites of that late Cretaceous age. And there are a lot of big stones in there. We, we, that we know. And the Cape Yellows, the octaves are very characteristic of that, particularly of the Kimberley pool. So we have a source which has got varying gem quality in it, but you then send it on a couple of thousand kilometer journey down to the coast and you incise that river and you beat, it, beat that system through there. You've got a fluvial conveyor taking it down to the coast. It hits the Atlantic coast. It runs into a marine conveyor which is sitting on a buoyant shelf. So it doesn't really go too much when you're up and down on the, on the, on the way, on, on the, on the eustatic sea level changes. And as Ian pointed out, Rob Smart's little, little pressure point up against that, uh, that rock outcrop at 126 meters is, is no fun, eh? I'm sure, because the lads, I think we're stuck, I think Ian, for about 15 odd minutes there. And, but that was at 126 meters. So we've got an aggressive, very energetic coast that can push a wave base much deeper than normal orbitals or used to. Gets into the marine system and because of the longshore drift and the wind, it moves it one way and it does your segregation for you and moves it up the coast. And because of the aridity that's developed and increased since, since about the year scene when Antarctica got, got established, it's been able to suck the sand onshore into the Nam Sand Sea. 
We'll have a look at that because it's not just an arm of Sansi that you can see the pretty red pictures of sauces flying as tourist brochures before we could travel to COVID, now we can travel again. Those, those pretty sands, sand dunes sit on top of a sandstone pile that's four times thicker than the current sand sea. So it's been doing it for a long time. So you're looking here at a very interesting sedimentary conveyor system, thousands of kilometers, 2000 k's down to the coast, thousand odd k's up the coast. It's quite, so, quite remarkable in terms of a global scale sedimentary moving system. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt, but time is running out. Oh, oh okay, right, okay, good, 10 minutes. Okay, so so two, two of the class that we can really recognize well in the Vile Orange system that show us that Kimberley were contributing are the three stones from the bottom. This comes from Neutgedacht, and these are the Kimberley pool stones. And the three abraded stones up top come from Pierre de Jacques' plaster that he discussed this morning. Those are, that's classic abrasion from the from the Northwest Transvaal or the, or the, the Northwest Province Plaza. Thank you. Right, and, they, and the significance of the entrenchment is that, that the Orange River gets into a single slot and just moves sediment down to the coast through a real ball mill activity. So you're definitely upgrading the quality of your stones from Prisca downstream. Thank you. Right, we, we discussed this very briefly. Basically, you get through your trap sites, Tanya covered this, and that's just all part of the upgrading and, and concentration, high grade, but low volume. So you're not making any mega passes along the route. Thank you. Most of the stones are then coming through the Richtersfeld onto the coastal plain, and it's the younging of the terraces that give, a, give the age away, because it's the class assemblage that Jürgen Jacob and more recently Albertina Nakasholi's worked on, Linking it back to the heavy mineral assemblies that tied into the into the unroofing of the interior of South Africa. So the Drakensberg basalt, the Lichtenberg agates, end up, which are sitting at the top of the stratigraphy in the interior of South Africa, end up in our oldest marine deposits on the coast, and they're marked as well by the stones. So as it, as the Orange River cuts down, the terrace is young, and there is a pulse, a certain pulse that coincides with the Namakoland clay channels, and that's the Eocene Oligocene regression prior to the aggradation of the, of the Orange River terraces in the early Miocene and middle Miocene, dated by the fossils there. Thank you. Right, here are some of the thick sequences, the fluvial sequences as they hit the coastal plain, we get the aggradation with the base level changes, and we get the richest deposits at the very, at the bottom of the, of the Orange River and the preserved in scars, where we get up to several tens of CPHT, stone size is also quite up. And these, and this is what Ian alluded to with that the, um, the piling of the Ernest Oppenheimer Bridge. There was a, a hole out to the west and it was all going west at the bottom of this pile. Thank you. And tying in the heavy mineral sands with the class assemblage, very, very clearly the, the uh, signature from the interior. And as I mentioned earlier, nothing like the stamp of the Kimberley pool with a yellow, Cape yellow octus. They, the biggest stone, 246 was one of those, so was the 211. And most of the big stones that the divers have taken out Alex core tend to be octus. And the same for the uh, Aronium one side as well. Thank you. Right, so here's the model then. Looking at it very briefly, you, you come down, you hit the Atlantic Ocean, you get segregation, sand transport going up the coast, your gravel's parking off close to the outfall of the Orange River itself, and that outfall would have moved across this broad shelf. As with the regressions, you would have moved that coarse gravel. And the last 100 meters, 100 kilometers of this river, you're pumping a lot of normal quartzite into here. And that's just an abrasive tool that gets onto your bedrock platforms and just cuts gullies, whether you be offshore or, or onshore in the highest sea level stands. The sand gets taken offshore into the norm of sand sea, and the, and the muds go off the contourites, turbidites on the continental slope. Thank you. Right, and, the, and this wind is really a long-lived feature. This is a view into the west as the sun setting, it's a southerly blowing, and it really is very powerful. Ian did a lot of work on the Aeolian transport corridors that effectively feed up into the Nam of Sansi, been doing it for a long time, at least 40 million years, 
fully 200 million years with the, with the Aeolian arts that fell shoe in the Spurge beat. Thank you. Just an example of where the sand ends up, Falfus Bay, the big Pelican Point spit, and uh, all the way up the coast is just energy transporting sand in particular northwards as well as the gravel. So the gravels and the diamonds tail out northwards. Thank you. Right. So when it hits the coast, though, there's no delta because there's an energetic coastline. So we have a wave dominated delta. And the Orange River flood, for example, 1988, pushed out quite a few hundred meters into the sea, only lasted a few months, taken away by the, by the longshore shore drift under the southerly wind. And because of that, you have a series of beach beaches that are developed up the coast away from the outfall of the Orange River. In the accommodation space at the mouth of the Orange, you've got barrier complexes, low grade, not quite as, they tend to stack on each other, so not quite as high grade as we are able to rework them against a bedrock cliff, but certainly big stones down, the, down close to your mouth, which is what you'd expect. As you move up north, the bulk of your, of your placer, your onshore placer now, is, is, a, is a linear beach, what we refer to as a linear beach, backed up against a cliff, and you're then just really concentrating diamonds and a jigging action at, on these beaches. And eventually you run out of sediment about 100 k's up the coast and you start to, to form beaches between headlands, bedrock headlands, and we call those pocket beaches, and the beaches get smaller as you go up, and so do the diamonds. So there's a size decrease along, along the coast, both onshore and offshore, because we've obviously got submerged beaches from the, from the, the low stands. And Megan Rins from Aronument has just finished a good thesis on, the, on one, of the, uh, one of these levels, a minus 75 meter stand. Uh, thanks. So just a brief look at, one of the comparative look up the, up the skeleton coast where we've got gravel beaches. And here's, a, here's the model for it. Basically, you've got your classic intertidal beach deposits. It's going down to your subtidal deposits that are on, on your, sitting on your wave cut platform. Your beach hooks up, washes over into, into a wash over uh, lagoon, or if you've got accommodation space, if not, it banks up against a cliff and you get some superb concentrations along or well, you did get superb concentrations along the, the, um, the cliff line with 50, 60, 70 kilometers north of Aronument because your, your coarse gravel start to run out and you start to really accumulate your diamonds from about uh, running about half 0.6 carats a stone. Okay. Uh, just some examples, looking at the modern environment on the left-hand photographs to the right-hand side, looking at an intertidal beach face on, on the left there, the top shot, and there's some uh, um, ply Pleistocene view of the 30 meter complex over there with your intertidal zone. Again, big beach faces, what the, 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 the coarser your, gravel, your sediment in a beach, the steeper it is, and you can see the big, long, steep shore, uh, uh, beach faces on, on the right hand side over there. Thank you. So those beaches act as jigs, really. So they, they're moving with all the tides, they're jigging all the time. So you, your core stones get flipped up to the top of the, the crest of the beach and your, and your bigger stones also get moved to the bottom. And your concentrations, the, 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 um, this is all the work that Spags did for his PhD. And you can see over there that there's the, the average diamond size shown in the black and your, and your grade shown in the... Uh, in the, in, the, in the whites. And you can see in the, in the intertidal zone, big grade, not such big stones, but down in the intertidal at the beach toe itself and on the wave cut platform, you've got big stones and a moderate sort of grade. Thank you. Right, and then the wave cut platforms, Tanya showed a beautiful photograph of this. This is just to show the intensity of the work once they get down below, as Ian says, when the Atlantic is beating against your sea wall and then you're 20 meters below, 25, 30 meters below you, you want to get on, you want to clean it out as quickly as possible. And it's the gullies, the gully pattern that was mentioned in that lovely paper with a minus 20 meter beach, uh, a cliff line shown there, and the gullies that were identified, it was then been, that work has been followed on in more recent years by Joanna Jacob and, uh, and Lynette Kirkpatrick and, and the like. And they've done some really good work in terms of 
understanding the gullies and these exposed mined out wave cut platforms to be able to predict, next slide please, to be able to predict what is happening in the, in the, in the close inshore. So they're using geophysics, mag, they're using stats on the distribution of the gullies to try and get a pattern to be able to predict into beyond the seawall, as Ian said, as they push, in a, in a push that beach, beach accretion story out even further. So it's just some of the good work that's been done. But the, the final bit, the final cleanup is still by vacuum cleaner. There, there it is. There's a nice 1.81 mackerel sitting in a, in a conglomerate up at Chamice and uh, cleaning out the bedrock after you've stripped everything off. Thank you. All right, and as you go up the coast, as I mentioned, you get to pocket beaches, you start to run out of, out of um, coarse sediment, you're getting more into the sandy side of it. And this is the good work that Ian did back for his thesis in the 80s. And that is the Aeolian transport corridors where you get long spiral bays, the sand comes on shore, that predominant southerly wind just beats it into bark and dunes, shapes it up in 25 meter high bark and dunes, move northwards at, at considerable speeds of 30 meters a year. The smaller ones move it up to 400 meters a year. So it's a, as he says, desolate windy environment on that coast, but it's able to absorb your overburdened sand this way. Thank you. And then you have the famous deflation passes. This is an intermediate phase where there's just no accumulation of sand. The, the winter rainfall is such that it, it's able to, to get limited runoff, gives you little sumps in the, in the bedrock, destroys your older beaches, concentrates your diamonds and your resistates down in, in deflation hollows, and there's, the wind just beats the heck out of it again and you get a, a very nice donation pattern, as Ian showed, of diamond size decreasing out of these holes to the north. So these were the rich a million carrots that came out of the Ida Toll here. There's the Ida Toll just north of the deflation plus a sign there, and Hicks and Kessel to the, to the right of it over here. Thank you. And then we get up into the big Aeolian places themselves. This is a big pocket beach with Elizabeth Bay that Ian showed us in the 1930s, lots of innovation down here. And, uh, it was uh, recently recently sold off, and uh, there's the Aeolian places formed out of out of shore out of the shorelines here as well, moving because by by now you 250 to 70 k's up the coast and you you're in uh, grit and small pebble very small pebble size material. Thank you. And it was actually on the Aeolian placer as he had mentioned, it was a railway worker cleaning the railway line of these mega ripples. They were migrating active bed form going across the railway lines that uh, Zacharias Lewala recognized the small stones that were concentrated on the top. And Ian said he's done it himself. Marinsky did it in 1909, that famous paper of his. And what's amazing is when you look down at the, at the grits here, they actually go up to small pebble. They go up to six to eight millimeter fraction. And you've got the same class assemblage. You've got your agates from the interior. You, got, you don't have any buff down in this area, but you've certainly got your, your agates to give you an indication and jaspers of where things have come from. That's an equivalent of some of the diamonds in, over there. Right, thank you. Right, so then it, it terminates in what John Rogers back in 1977 called the displaced delta of the Orange River. It's the main norm of Sansi. And this norm of Sansi has got all the fancy dune types in the world that the world has seen. It's only 34,000 square kilometers Sansi, but it comes up from, starts <clears throat> just, uh, just south of Luderitz comes on shore there through those Aeolian transport corridors, gets into the feeder across the Koichab, comes past Ottentod Bay and spans out into the, to the sand sea. But underlying that, there's four times more sand that sits there, been coming on shore since at least the ESC. So it's a long lived process this has happened. So we've got time on our side on, on this one as well, 40 odd million years to develop these, these diamond passes and, and segregate your sediment out in a very neat, highly energetic environment. Next slide. So if we have a look up the coast then, on that energetic environment and the longshore drift, so you get coarse stones down at the mouth of the orange, there are a couple of 30, 40 characters linden that bark past you and uh, made it down to, the, to Dick Parker's place at Unas. And then uh, up the coast, so we got the, 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 the average stone size in the diamonds decreasing very nicely. What's interesting is when you get to Luderitz, just have a look inland there. There's a point one, and in the offshore, it's about a point three. 
And that reflects, the point one reflects the Eocene input. The early Eocene was much finer grained, less high grade deposits. Offshore, as we add, as we cut in and drag more stones out of the interior of South Africa, so the, the stone size went up until eventually if it, the grade goes down with time. And there's a pulse. And that pulse is somewhere in the Eocene to early Miocene that gives us the most gravels out on the continental shelf. Right, thank you. Right, so that really is it then, folks. That's the that's a view of the two mega places that we're aware of. And um, and uh, sorry for taking up a bit of time there. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you so much, John. This was so interesting. And uh, yeah, uh, time uh, is never standing still. So uh, any questions? <coughs> Are you passing? Are you passing around the glasses of wine, sir? I'm still opening the bottle, but we'll do now. <laughs> <laughs> you need it after today's long sessions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well done to everyone. The sterling efforts and for all of those that are still on online, fantastic. Thanks, John. That was excellent. Okay, who's going to kick off the questions? London, are you still there? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Uh, John, yeah, I, I always wondered what, uh, I mean, that Namakwa uh, population always bothered me that there, there is no big stones in it, or it, it, yeah. it's quite smaller than the, than the, uh, the Spergebiet one. Uh, and a uh, very good explanation. And, and I agree, I think there's, what, you, what you're saying is makes a lot of sense. Just tell me, where do you, what do you think the source is of the diamonds of the Namakwa land? Do you think it's, it's, it's possibly mainly the Dwaika higher up? Uh, what's your what's your thoughts? No, I really think it's a, it's the it's the, the group twos in the intra Karoos, You know, if you have a look at Dokawaya sitting out there in Swaziland, three hundred odd million. You got Shawanga two forty. We don't have a hell of a lot of intra Karoo eh, left in our country. If you think about it, so where do those stones go? And also the group twos. The group twos. Are, you know, you know, if you think of stars you know, those those ducks, eh, they were feeding some pups. Those pups are gone. Eh? Yeah, and they, and they were good stones. They were really top quality stones. So I think I think I don't think the Dwyker. I'm I'm a bit like you. The Dwyker is a contributor. I don't think yeah. there's any, I don't think there's any doubt that it's a contributor along the way, and it's going to be a, a ramshackle one, you know, unless yes. you put something over it and clean it up like it's done in in Bushy in Piers Place there, you know, in the northwest. You still clean it up a little bit there, but but when you clean that up, you can clean up to half a CPHT. But down there in the Macaland, ish, you've got lots of small stones. They're well sorted. You're coming down a big, a, 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 a fluvial system that was steeper grain than the, than the Kudu Delta because it was giving you a sand delta. So it yeah. was enough, good enough for that, you know. And we saw that on the Kasai, actually. That Kasai River in the Congo really sorted out the grits and the small pebbles into, into pulses of sediment that looked very similar to the bird seed gravel that the guys... You know, we spoke about that many decades ago. We never really resolved it, but I think it's a lot of it is the, is the Karoo. It's the stripping of the Karoo. And as Bill said last week as well, he said, there's a hell of a Karoo cover that we had to get rid of. And you showed that in your cross-section. You had to get rid of that Karoo cover. And we yeah. know that we got rid of it between Finch and Kimberley. So on those, you know, that it's an 85 to 100, 120, whatever it is, you know, you've got to get rid of it there. And the bulk of that goes down goes down down that side and only only a bit later to the to the uh, to the kudu delta so i think it's a group isn't it? and the, and the, and the intra karoos that we're really looking at there and although although the ages show these cullen and type age is pre karoo you know the venetia ages are there so there's obviously you know there's definitely a, a dwyker input but whether it's i don't think it's the main the main supply to a well-sorted small population Okay, yeah, I mean, you. just to come in there, I don't think anyone's ever said that the Dwyko was that, you know, the sole contributor, probably quite the contrary. Um, and, and, and I think just one other, you know, caution we, we need to just um, bear in mind, and, and I've certainly had the discussion with Mike and others, um, you know, a lot of those early diamond ages were on small diamonds and typically composites. And, and I'm not saying that's bad, but what, and be interested to hear Andy's view, Andy Moore, if he's still on, what we really need to be doing, and of course that 
you know, that, that becomes a difficulty because of the, the cost of the bigger diamonds. We need, we need individual inclusions from bigger diamonds um, to, you know, also relook at some of these, um, these, these bits of data. And, and we see it already in the dating of diamonds with, the, with the, the modern techniques where you can, you know, drill a hole in a single inclusion and, and date them rather than compositing them. You know, we're now starting to see that, you know, diamond ages are showing a far greater spread than we originally thought. So, you know, there's, it, it all goes back to the technology, the technology is evolving as well. And, and I agree, I agree with John, sorry, just to finish that, you know, the, the Dwyker was a, a disaggregator and a transporter. It wasn't, wasn't necessarily a, a, you know, a concentrator. I don't think that's been said at all. Except in some of those, yes, because they might have described in Luchtenberg, of course. Yeah. John, Lin Linden showed that cross-section of the Karoo, which I assume was east-west, right? Yeah. So I guess the, would have, the expectation would be that the, um, that the escarpment would be moving backwards. Now, I've seen a paper that Jock and others did I'm not sure if Andy was involved in it as well, where they measured the, um, the position of the escarpment at, at different periods. Now, if you, we, I think we, um, the basalt must have been much more ex extensive than it is now. So where would you have, you know, would, would the Orange River um, catchment have extended into the free state on the basalts. Yep. Given that any thought. Yeah, yeah, well, it certainly did, because at the time of the uplift, the first, the first siliceous class that come down of Drakensberg agates, Lichtenberg, Chalcedonies, and those red cornelians, which, and chrysoprase, which only comes from that part of the whole catchment. We've been over the whole catchment. So they are the first stones that hit the coast. Huh? So that, that, that uh, Kudu Delta, mm -hmm drainage was well established right back into the into the hinterland. Coming to the escarpment, though, one of the things that, that we've been working on for a while, and it's one of the papers I owe Mike here, is, is, is on the pre karoo surface. And what we found in actual fact in, in the Makoland, and just now in May on a trip that I did with, with mm -hmm. Roger Rapp up in Central Norman, the escarpment is actually which is, is a pre karoo feature. It's clearly defined in the, in the coca field. That was well understood by Homer Martin and Carl Schalk back in the 1950s already. But to the central Narmab and the southern Narmab, it was always a little bit uncertain. And we've now confirmed that, um, and, and in fact, there's Dwyker on the coastal plain of Port Nollet, inland from Port Nollet. So that escarpment is actually a pre karoo exhumed feature, Bill. Yeah, so you, you, you see a, a similar thing on the eastern side as well with the, um, um, you know, the the so-called Drakensberg, the northern Drakensberg around um, uh, Zanin and those areas. I mean, that part of the escarpment must be, that's a pre crew feature. I agree, Bill. No, no, it's much more extensive than we realise. It. Yeah. It probably serves this paper that we presented at Roy Miller's symposium in 2014 is the one that I still haven't written up. And, uh, and that really, it goes right across into Zim, but you're quite right. It's much yeah. more inclusive than, than we give credit for. And so there's been- Then, then, you're, the, then you're filling the interior with um, not only lava, but Stormberg and all the other, all the other sedimentary sequences. And, you know, most of the, most of the Transvaal as it then was, is, is pre karoo landscape. Certainly, everything north, virtually north of the Val River. Yep, absolutely. Three to four down north. Yeah. Can I quickly interrupt? I saw a hand from Katani. Paul and John. I think I John, think yeah. one about the um, you know the the drainage pattern that existed at that time <coughs> because you, you you're going through basalts that would have, would have been, you know, probably quite weathered. Um, and if it's quite fast stripping, then, you know, those drainages would have ingrained pretty quickly. 
and then really got moving. Yep, it's soft cover. You, you, I agree with you, but it's certainly not the it's not the Drakensberg we know today, which is a, a you know a rugged massif, as it were. Yeah, but then the um, then then the only thing that I you know the only concern I have is that then you know that that is fine sediment you're creating out, out of the basalts and not sandy sediment. Now, if you if you have a look at if the basalt is thinning westwards away from the main outfall centers as as it may well have been to lap on Laponte Spitzberger and you know Finch thinking more of Finch area actually then then you very quickly get into the Aeolian sandstones underneath it and um, and yeah. which is effectively yeah. Clarence your Clarence and the red beds and then and then into the upper Beaufort. And and that's although all, all those seds are in, in the group twos, Kimberlites, but they're not in the group ones. I, oh, the, the, some of the Beaufort is in the group ones, but but not the basalt. Uh, until you go towards coffee, um, you know, cold fillet, coffee, um, jagger side, then you then you, then that's when you start to peel back the, the basalt um, escarpment, I think. Because cold fillet's got, got lots of basalt in it. It looks like there's is about a k, uh, about five hundred. Sorry, about five hundred meters come off Col Fillet. If I look at the uh, uh, um, Clarence sandstone in there and the basalt, and I mean Finch, Finch had a lot of basalt in it as well, John. Yep, absolutely, because Group Two, huh? and that's why the Group Ones. That's why Col Fillet is interesting, John, because that then kicks off the Col Fillet Coffee Jaggers pushback. Yeah. And that's where, that's where us, some of us he's uh, work they did on the diamonds is probably well worth revisiting actually. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we need some more um, bigger diamonds from from the west coast, the Macquarie as well. And um, uh, we gave Dave two from 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 the northwest, man. One seven point nine character with two CPX inclusions in it, and something mm -hmm. went wrong. We couldn't get anything out of that. And there was another one that cost me bloody five hundred dollars. They let me buy it, and uh, and we got a two two forty age out of that one, uh, Bill. But I mean, uh, uh, John. But I, I need to get Dave to to confirm that. Well, well, that came from John Ng. I mean, that's spot on. Yeah, that's spot on. Yeah, uh, John. Uh, I'm going to just chip in here. Can I share that yeah, paper please. that uh, that that uh, Dave Phillips did publish? Yeah. yeah. Um, because it it totally backs up your your group two um, story. The point about the work that Dave Phillips did is he worked exclusively on planar pyroxene inclusions because it gives you a real date or very yeah. close to a real date for the, for, for the diamond or the eruption age of the diamond. And he used argon argon, which not many people use in this space. So he's a, he's a specialist in that. And then if you look at his results, uh, which are uh, a bit further down, let me just uh, uh, scroll through there. Lots of data. It's a unique study. And this is for Namakulan diamonds. Okay, this is not for Orange River, uh, not for um, yeah. um, the Spargebiet uh, Plaza. This is for the Namakulan um, uh, diamonds. There you can see all these ages that he's getting in two different styles of determining the ages. They don't overlap with young Kimberlites. They overlap with the orangeites, which we're calling the group twos, and then slightly uh, slightly older. And there's just a sniff of Dwyka ages. Um, in this in this style of dating, it totally overlaps with uh, with the group twos. And the fact that you get slightly older ages is consistent with the way that dating technique actually works. You get slightly, you get excess argon occasionally. Uh, and so your story is completely supported by this uh, this piece of work. Oh, well, thanks very much, Evan. That's appreciated. And and I mean, John, just to take that a step further, where did that Southern River, um, you know, go through through um, through Namaquiland and through the pans that we still see? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, that Porcelos pan. From Mike's Suck River, what's a brand fly? From Vake's yeah. fly, all those funny little stones that he picked up, they've been redistributed, John, but they, yeah. they are the legacy of that Karoo River. And, uh, 
And, you know, the trouble is the guys look at Bosfo's pan because they might have seen fossils in it. They say, oh, shit, it's bloody, you know, it's got nothing to do with the Karoo River. No, that, that current deposit hasn't, but the stones have. And if you take the gap, there's a gap between Cummings crew and Van Reinsdorp, you know, and the Cape Fulbell. There's a gap, there's a gap that, where the Dwyker actually makes the, makes the escarpment, you know, Louis Fontaine. Mm. That's, that's pretty much opposite the canoe's flux. And, when you, and if you look at Horton's, there's a, I've got to find the, the, the reference for Mike, but Horton referred to an Eocene fossil, marine fossil, found to the north of Van Reinsdorp. We tried to find it back in the day, but we never did. But Richard Hall found some very interesting quartz, um, well-rounded gravels, sitting in the middle of the bloody canoe's flux that he could never explain. I think the 570 meter Lake Cretaceous explains it. So, so that, that's something else I think we need to, to target a bit more, you know, John, and have a look at that and, um, and, and see, see what it is. Because in parts of Angola, you can just see that shoreline only on a lag of gravel. Huh? And then you get to the, the datable deposits. I mean, you're lucky there's still the datable deposits. Yeah. So if, if ever Hulpitz gets, gets going again and gets mined out, you know, in the Cow River Valley, I mean, someone needs to go and get some diamonds out of that source as well. Yep. No, uh, Gulf is a little bit sandy, a little bit sand covered there, but yeah, Gulf is bustling. That's just redistributing this. I think it's because a lot of those stones, if I remember rightly, the late Derek Robinson looked at those, and they were brown stones. They were old stones, so there was definitely an, you know, an older contribution, you know, probably from the Dwyker because the Dwyker is pretty much exposed there, John. You know, yeah. it's that main pulse. It's that pulse of clean small stones. I mean, Cornus has some of the best sorted, I think, diamonds in Africa. Sitting in that 0.21 um, SFD, you know, if you go speak to Paddy Lawless and those guys, you know, they, those are very steep SFDs that came out of Konya. So. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it goes back to, I guess, effectively the whole, you know, Namaquiland West Coast um, population. If you, you know, if you work all the way down the coast from Alex Bay. Yep. Oh, you run out of the, you run out of the, the signature 20k south, the orange river signature 20k south. And then you're back into the Macaulay population. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking south, southern stuff. Yeah. I'm south, southern south. Oh, okay. okay, and and I, and I think, um, and we've we've talked about it, and Bulls raised it several times. I mean, someone needs to. We need need some smart young students and all this GIS technology, and do a, um, you know, a very detailed geomorphological study. You know, across across probably from the Orange River mouth to I don't know what it's going to be the, the Mbalusi or the other side of the country. You know, and do slices down the down down sort of to the south and to the north. Um, you know, for for a, a detailed geomorphological study, looking at all these you know new sets of data that now exist, and and also fit in fit in the Kimberlites and how they. You know how those Kimberlite models relate, because you know, no, no disrespect to Barry Hawthorne and everyone else and John Gurney that did the, you know, the Kimberlite model and then counted all the Kimberlites and worked out the volume of diamonds that went down to the west coast. That you know, it's time to redo that study. I agree with you there, John, because it's definitely nowhere near the 1.5. Eh? Yeah. No. Yeah, but I think we could also look at different time slices. You know, which Kimberlite. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that would be good, Bill. John says the group, the, the group ones weren't there in the early stages. Um, interestingly, Joan Eng would have still been covered. It must have been covered by basalt. Yeah, 240. Yeah, it would have been would have yeah. been covered by the Karoo basalt. Yeah. yeah. But your Karoo basalt's a thin and what's on, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's all relative. Relative, yeah, but, but still covered, Bill. I agree, yeah. yes, yeah. 